Sand. A house raised on sand will always be in danger of collapse. The evidence is mounting, though most of the later construction is of high quality, that the edifice of our past, built by historians and archaeologists, stands on defective and dangerously unsound foundations. An extinction-level cataclysm occurred on our planet between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. This event was global in its consequences, and it affected mankind profoundly because the scientific evidence that proves it happened has only emerged since 2007, and because its implications have not yet been taken into account at all by historians and archaeologists, we're obliged to contemplate the possibility that everything we've been taught about the origins of civilization could be wrong. In particular, it must be considered as a reasonable hypothesis that worldwide myths of a golden age brought to an end by flood and fire are true, and that an entire episode of the human story was rubbed out in those 1,200 cataclysmic years between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, an episode not of unsophisticated hunter-gatherers, but of advanced civilization. Did that civilization, if it existed at all, leave any traces that we might still be able to identify today despite the passage of so much time? And if so, does its loss have any real significance for us? This book is an attempt to answer those questions. Part 1. Anomalies Chapter 1. There is so much mystery here. Gobekli Tepe is the oldest work of monumental architecture so far found anywhere in the world, or at any rate, the oldest accepted as such by archaeologists. And it's massive. Awesome, magnificent, numinous and overpowering are amongst the adjectives that dismally fail to do it justice. For the last couple of hours I've been wandering round the site with its excavator, Professor Klaus Schmidt, and my mind is frankly boggled. How does it feel, I ask him? to be the man who discovered the temple that's rewriting history. A rubicund German archaeologist with a barrel chest and a grizzled beard, Schmidt is wearing faded jeans, a blue denim shirt with a streak of mud on the sleeve, and scuffed sandals on his bare, dirty feet. It's September 2013, three months before his 60th birthday, and although neither of us know it yet, he'll be dead in less than a year. As he ponders my question... He wipes a bead of sweat from the glistening dome of his forehead. It's not yet mid-morning, but the sun is high here in Turkey's southeastern Anatolia region. The sky is cloudless, and the ridge of the Taurus Mountains on which we stand is baking hot. There's no breeze, not even a hint or a breath of air, nor is there any shade to be had. In 2014, a roof will be erected to cover and protect the site, but in 2013, only its foundations are in place. So we're standing exposed on a makeshift wooden walkway. Down below us, in a series of semi-subterranean, more or less circular walled enclosures, are the dozens of giant T-shaped megalithic pillars that Schmidt and his team from the German Archaeological Institute have brought to light here. Before they began their work, the place had the appearance of a rounded hill. In fact, Gobekli Tepe means Hill of the Navel, sometimes also translated as Potbelly Hill, but the excavations have removed most of that original profile. Of course, we cannot say that Gobekli Tepe is a temple exactly, Schmidt answers eventually, obviously choosing his words with care. Let us call it a hill sanctuary, and I do not claim that it is rewriting history. Rather, I would say that it is adding an important chapter to existing history. We thought that the transition from hunter-gatherers to farmers was a slow, step-by-step -step process, but now we realize that it was a period when exciting monuments that we didn't expect were made. And not just monuments, I prompt. At the beginning, the local people were hunter-gatherers and there was no sign of agriculture. No, Schmidt concedes, none. He gestures expansively at the circles of pillars. But the people who came to Gobekli Tepe and who did all this work invented agriculture. So we see a connection between what happened here and the later emergence of Neolithic societies dependent on farming. 
My ears prick up at that word invented. I want to be sure I'm getting this right. So, I emphasize, you go so far as to say that the people who made Gobekli Tepe actually invented agriculture? Yes, yes. Could you elaborate on that? Because in this region we have the early domesticates, both animals and plants. It's done in this region, so they are the same people. And as far as you're concerned, this is the first, the oldest agriculture in the world? The first in the world, yes. I sense that Schmidt is becoming impatient at the way I'm probing this point, but I have my reasons. The areas of Gobekli Tepe that have been excavated so far are close to 12,000 years old, which makes them, according to orthodox chronology, more than 6,000 years older than any other megalithic sites anywhere. Sites like Gigantia and Manaidra in Malta, Stonehenge and Avery in England, or the Pyramids of Giza in Egypt. Yet those sites all belong to that phase of the evolution of human civilization that archaeologists call the Neolithic, the New Stone Age, when agriculture and the organization of society along structured hierarchical lines were already well advanced, permitting the emergence of skilled specialists who had no need to produce their own food because they could be supported from the surpluses generated by farmers. Gobekli Tepe, by contrast, belongs to the very end of the Upper Paleolithic, the late Old Stone Age, when our ancestors are supposed to have been nomadic hunter-gatherers, living in small, mobile bands and incapable of tasks requiring long-term planning, complex division of labor, and high-level management skills. Schmidt and I are standing at a point on the walkway that overlooks both Enclosure C and Enclosure D, where I've learned from my background research of an intriguing image carved on one of the pillars. I intend to ask the archaeologist's permission to climb down into Enclosure D so that I can take a closer look at this image, but I want to get his views about the origins of agriculture and its relationship to megalithic architecture completely clear first. Enclosure C, the largest of the four main pits so far excavated, is dominated by two huge central pillars, both of which are broken. In their original state, they would have each been more than six meters, that's about 20 feet high, and weighed around 20 tons. Inset into the wall around them stand a dozen other pillars. They're slightly smaller, but still prodigious. The same goes for Enclosure D. Again, a ring of smaller pillars surrounding two towering central pillars, in this case, both intact. Their T-shaped tops, angled slightly down to the front, have no features, but are nonetheless eerily reminiscent of giant human heads, an impression that is reinforced by the faint outlines of arms crooked at the elbow, running down the flanks of the pillars and terminating in carefully carved human hands with long fingers. All this, I say, the megaliths, the iconography, the general conception and layout of the site, to be honest, it looks to be as big a project as a place like Stonehenge in England, yet Stonehenge is much younger so how does what you found at Gobekli Tepe fit in with your notion of a hunter-gatherer society? It's much more organized than we expected, Schmidt allows. What we can see here are hunter-gatherers who obviously had a division of labor because the work on the megaliths is specialist work, not for everybody. They were also able to transport these heavy stones and erect them, which means they must have had some engineering know-how. And again, we didn't expect that for hunter-gatherers. It's the first architecture, really and its architecture on a monumental scale. So if I understand you correctly, Professor Schmidt, you're saying that we're standing at the place where both monumental architecture and agriculture were invented. Yes, that's right. And yet you don't see anything really revolutionary in this? You see it as a process which you can fit comfortably into the existing frame of history? Yes, into existing history. But this process is much more exciting than we expected especially since what we have here at Gobekli Tepe belongs more to the world of the hunter-gatherers than to the farming societies. It's towards the end of the hunter-gatherers, but not yet the beginning of the Neolithic. It's a time of transition then, a cusp moment, and maybe more than that. What I'm getting from our conversation and from what you've showed me of the site this morning is the notion that Gobekli Tepe was a kind of prehistoric think tank or a center of innovation, perhaps under the control of some sort of resident elite. Are you okay with that? Yes, yes. It was a place where people came together. People were gathering here, and it was undoubtedly a platform for the distribution of knowledge and innovation. 
including knowledge of large-scale stoneworking and knowledge of agriculture. Would you dare to describe those who controlled the site and disseminated these ideas as a sort of priesthood? Whoever they were, they certainly were not practicing simple shamanism. They were a bit more like an institution, so yes, they were on the road to becoming a priesthood. And since Gobekli Tepe was in unbroken use for well over a thousand years, would this be one continuous culture with its own institutions, with the same ideas and the same priesthood, who continued to manage the site throughout the whole period? Yes, but the strange thing is that there was a clear collapse in the effort that was made as the centuries went by. The truly monumental structures are in the older layers. In the younger layers, they get smaller, and there's a significant decline in quality. So the oldest is the best. Yes, the oldest is the best. And you don't find that puzzling? Klaus Schmidt looks almost apologetic. Well, we hope that eventually we will discover even older layers, and that there we will see the small beginnings that we expect but haven't yet found. Then we have this monumental phase, and later a decline again. It occurs to me that hope is the operative word in what Professor Schmidt has just said. We are used to things starting out small and simple and then progressing, evolving, to become ever more complex and sophisticated. So this is naturally what we expect to find on archaeological sites. It upsets our carefully structured ideas of how civilization should behave, how they should mature and develop, when we're confronted by a case like Gobekli Tepe that starts out perfect at the beginning and then slowly devolves until it is just a pale shadow of its former self. Nor is it so much the process of devolution that we object to. We know that civilizations can decay. Just look at the Roman Empire, or the British Empire for that matter. No, the problem at Gobekli Tepe is the pristine, sudden appearance like Athena springing full-grown and fully armed from the brow of Zeus, of what appears to be an already seasoned civilization so accomplished that it invents both agriculture and monumental architecture at the apparent moment of its birth. Archaeology can no more explain that than it can explain why the earliest monuments, art, sculptures, hieroglyphs, mathematics, medicine, astronomy and architecture of ancient Egypt are perfect at the beginning, without any traces of evolution from simple to sophisticated. And we might well ask of Gobekli Tepe, as my friend John Anthony West asks of ancient Egypt, how does a complex civilization spring full-blown into being? Look at a 1905 automobile and compare it to a modern one. There's no mistaking the process of development, but in Egypt there are no parallels. Everything is right there at the start. The answer to the mystery is is, of course, obvious, but because it is repellent to the prevailing caste of modern thinking, it's seldom considered. Egyptian civilization was not a development. It was a legacy. Could this be the case also at Gobekli Tepe? Klaus Schmidt has no time for ideas of a lost civilization that was the progenitor of all later known civilizations. So when I press him, he reiterates his point that most of Gobekli Tepe remains unexcavated. As I said, he growls, somewhat testily, I expect when we get to the earlier levels we will find evidence of evolution. He could be right. One of the stunning things about Gobekli Tepe, which had already been the subject of 18 years of continuous excavation when Klaus Schmidt showed me round the site in 2013, is that so much of it still remains under the ground. But how much? It's hard to say, Schmidt tells me. We've done a geophysical survey, ground-penetrating radar, and from this we can see that at least 16 further large enclosures remain to be excavated. Large enclosures, I ask? I point at the towering megaliths of Enclosure D. Like this one? Yes, like this one. And 16 is the minimum. In some areas, our geophysical mapping didn't give us complete results, and we can't really see inside. But we expect there are many more than 16. Maybe in reality it will turn out to be double that number, maybe even as many as 50. 50? Yes, 50 of the big enclosures, each enclosure with 14 or more pillars. But you know, it's not our target to excavate everything. Just a little part, because excavation is destruction. We want to keep most of the site untouched. 
It dilates the imagination to reflect on the scale of the enterprise undertaken at Gobekli Tepe by the ancients. Not only are the circles of megalithic pillars already excavated here at least 6,000 years older than any other known megalithic sites anywhere in the world, but also, I now realize, Gobekli Tepe is huge, occupying an area that might eventually prove to be as much as 30 times larger than the fullest extent of a big site like Stonehenge, for example. We are confronted, in other words, by vast, inexplicable antiquity immense scale and unknown purpose, and all of it seeming to unfold out of nowhere, with no obvious background or preparation, shrouded utterly in mystery. Enclosures of the Giants I'm used to archaeologists making the sign of the evil eye and turning their backs on me when I show up at their excavations, but Professor Schmidt is refreshingly different. Although he knows very well who I am, he permits me and my wife, the photographer Santa Faya, to climb down into Enclosure D and explore it. All four of the main enclosures so far excavated at Gobekli Tepe are strictly off limits to the public and under the eye of watchful guards, but there's an image on one of the pillars in Enclosure D that I need to take a much closer look at than the walkway affords. Indeed, I can't even see it from the walkway, so Schmidt's generosity of spirit is welcome. We enter the enclosure along a plank, which leads to an as-yet unexcavated two-metre-high partition of rubble and earth separating the two main central pillars, one to the east and the other to the west. Quarried from the very hard crystalline limestone of the region, and polished to a flawlessly smooth finish, these colossal pillars glow mellow gold in the sun. I know from Professor Schmidt that they are about 5.5 metres, that's 18 feet tall, and that each of them weighs more than 15 tons. Scrambling down onto the floor of the enclosure, I note that they stand on stone plinths, each about 20 centimeters or 8 inches high, that have been carved directly out of the living bedrock. In a row along the front edge of the plinth under the eastern pillar, squatting back on their tails with no wings evident, seven seemingly flightless birds have been sculpted in high relief. With their stylized anthropomorphic appearance enhanced by their angled T-shaped heads, the central pillars loom over me like twin giants. Though they're not my primary target, I seize the opportunity to examine them closely. Their front edges, representing their chests and bellies, are quite slim, only about 20 centimeters wide, while their flanks measure a bit over a meter, about four feet from front to back. Both figures, as I'd noticed from the walkway, have arms carved in low relief at their sides, crooked at the elbows and terminating in hands with long, thin fingers. These fingers wrap round the fronts of the pillars, almost meeting over their bellies. Above the hands, covering their chests, are hints of an open-fronted garment. Just below the hands, both figures also wear a broad belt, again carved in low relief, decorated with a distinctive buckle. In both cases, what appears to be part of an animal skin, thought by Schmidt to represent the hind legs and tail of a fox pelt, is shown hanging suspended from the buckle so that it covers the genital region. Both figures also wear necklaces. In the case of the eastern figure, the necklace is decorated with a crescent and disc motif, and in the case of the western figure, with a bull's head. In addition, both pillars stand on their pedestals in exactly the same peculiar way, not securely fixed, but resting precariously in slots just ten centimetres, about four inches deep. Klaus Schmidt and his team have stabilised them with wooden props, and I can only imagine that they must also have been held upright in a similar way in antiquity, unless perhaps there was a frame over the enclosure into which the heads of the figures were somehow fixed. Since the builders of Gobekli Tepe were clearly masters of fashioning, moving and positioning large megaliths, it's mysterious that they chose not to cut deeper slots in which the pillars could have been securely mounted. There must have been some purpose to this, but I can't fathom it. So much for the similarities between the two central pillars, but there are also differences. For example, the eastern figure has an almost life-sized depiction of a fox carved in high relief on its right flank so that it appears to be leaping forward from the crook of its elbow. And whereas the belt of the western pillar is undecorated, other than by its buckle, 
The belt of the eastern pillar bears a number of intriguing adornments, including a series of glyphs like the Roman letter C and others like the Roman letter H. As I study them, I reflect that we cannot possibly know what these symbols meant to the people of Gobekli Tepe, from whom we are separated by a vast span of more than 11,000 years. It is far-fetched to imagine that they had any kind of writing, let alone writing in the alphabet we use today. Nonetheless, there's something strangely modern and purposive about the way these pictograms are used and displayed, and it seems to me that they are more than merely decorative. Nothing else like them exists anywhere in the world of Upper Paleolithic art, and the same is true of the animal and bird figures. At this early period, such a combination of megaliths and sophisticated sculptures is utterly unique and unprecedented. I move on to examine the dozen pillars disposed around the edges of enclosure D, which forms more of an ellipse than a strict circle, measuring approximately 20 metres, 65 feet, from west to east, and just over 14 metres, 46 feet, from north to south. The surrounding pillars are generally about half the height of the central pair, and for the most part are not freestanding, but rather are embedded into the enclosure wall. Most, though not all, are T-shaped, and most are richly decorated with images of birds, insects and animals, as though the cargo of Noah's Ark has been turned to stone. Foxes, gazelles, wild boars, numerous species of birds, including several cranes with serpents at their feet, many more serpents, both individually and in groups, a spider, a wild ass, wild cattle, a lion with its tail curving forward over its spine, and many more. Making the most of our laissez-passer, I take my time, but eventually on the northwestern side of the enclosure, I come to the pillar I particularly want to see. For ease of reference, Schmidt and his colleagues have numbered all the pillars at Gobekli Tepe, and this is pillar number 43. I know from my prior research that it has a large depiction of a scorpion carved in relief on its base, some have suggested it might be an image of the zodiacal constellation that we call Scorpio today. However, to my great disappointment, the figure is no longer visible. The archaeologists have covered it with rubble to protect it from damage, Schmidt claims. I tell him of my interest in a possible astronomical connection, but he scoffs at this. There are no astronomical figures here. The zodiac constellations were not recognized until Babylonian times, 9,000 years after Gobekli Tepe, and he refuses, point blank, to allow me to clear the heaped-up rubble away. I'm about to get into an argument with him. There is, in fact, excellent evidence that the zodiac was codified long before Gobekli Tepe. When I notice a group of other figures higher up the same pillar that haven't been covered with rubble, these include a prominent depiction of a vulture, with its wing outstretched in the manner of a human arm, and with a solid disc poised over that arm-like wing, as though being upheld or cradled by it. Another human characteristic of the vulture, quite dissimilar to any examples of this bird that I have ever seen in nature, is that it is portrayed with its knees bent forward and with strangely elongated flat feet a bit like some of the cartoon representations of the penguin character in the old Batman comics. It is, in other words, a therianthrope, from the Greek therion, meaning wild beast, and anthropos, meaning man, a hybrid creature, part human and part vulture. Above it are more of the H-shaped pictograms, arranged in a row between a series of upright and inverted V-shapes. Again, there's a sense of some message, some communication here, that's impossible to interpret. Finally, at the top of the pillar, are depictions of what appear to be three large handbags, rectangular containers at any rate with curved handles. Separating them, positioned over the front of the handles in each case, are three figures. At the left, a bird with long, human-like legs that mark it out almost certainly as another therianthrope, a quadruped with its tail arched forward over its body, and a salamander. There is something hauntingly familiar about the whole ensemble, and I feel certain that I've seen it or something very like it somewhere before. The only problem is I can't remember where or what. I ask Santa to take detailed photographs of the pillar, and when she's done, 
Schmidt suggests that we accompany him to a different part of the site, a few hundred metres to the northwest, on the other side of the ridge, where he and his team have an active excavation underway. It's just one of the dozens of buried enclosures with large pillars that they've identified with ground-penetrating radar, and the first of these that they're investigating. Paradigms As we walk, I ask the professor how and when he became involved with Gobekli Tepe. Ironically, given his firm views on the evolution of architecture, it turns out that he got his big break because other archaeologists also had firm views on the same subject. In 1964, a joint team from the University of Chicago and the University of Istanbul visited the area with a specific brief to search out and discover Stone Age sites. However, when they saw the top of a large T-shaped pillar sticking out of the ground and the remains of other broken limestone pillars that had been ploughed up by local farmers lying nearby, they dismissed Gobekli Tepe as irrelevant to their interests and moved on elsewhere. The reason? The American and Turkish team had judged the workmanship on the pillars to be too fine, too advanced, too sophisticated to have been produced by Stone Age hunter-gatherers. In their opinion, Despite the presence of worked flints lying alongside the limestone fragments, Gobekli Tepe was nothing more than an abandoned medieval cemetery and therefore of no prehistoric interest whatsoever. Their loss was to be Schmidt's gain. At the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s, he had been involved in another project in Turkey, the excavation of an early Neolithic site called Nevali Chori, which was soon to be flooded by the waters of the Ataturk Dam. There, he and a team of archaeologists from the University of Heidelberg discovered, and rescued from the advancing floodwaters, a number of finely worked T-shaped limestone pillars that were conclusively dated to between 8,000 and 9,000 years of age. Some had arms and hands, carved in relief along their sides. So, says Schmidt, we recognized that this region had something about it that was different from other sites known from this period. Nivalichori was our first hint of the existence of large-scale limestone sculptures during the transition from hunter-gatherer societies to early village farming communities. A little later, in 1994, Schmidt came across the report of the Turkish-American survey done 30 years earlier and stumbled upon a single paragraph that mentioned the presence of worked flints alongside fragments of limestone pillars lying on the surface at Gobekli Tepe. I was a young archaeologist, he explains. I was looking for my own project, and I immediately realized that there could be something of significance here, perhaps even another site as important as Navali Chori, which your predecessors had missed because flints and architectural pillars are not normally associated in the minds of archaeologists. I'm hoping he'll get my hint that he too might be missing something at Gobekli Tepe because of the established paradigm, but he seems oblivious and replies, yes, exactly. I glance ahead. For the past few moments, as we've been walking and talking, we've approached a scene of intense activity. I hadn't been aware of it from the four main enclosures, because it had been concealed from us by the summit of the ridge. But now we've hiked north over the ridge line and are making our way down the other side into the new excavation, nominated as Enclosure H, that Schmidt has opened at Gobekli Tepe. Here, five or six German archaeologists are busily at work, some scraping away layers of soil with trowels or pouring buckets of earth and stones through sieves, others directing the efforts of a team of 30 Turkish laborers. The focus is on a large rectangular cavity, perhaps half the size of a football pitch. It's internally subdivided by knee-high walls of earth into a dozen or so smaller segments. From the floor of these... At several points, hulking limestone pillars protrude. Most are T-shaped, but my eye is drawn to one that has a smooth curved top, marred only by a small broken segment, and upon which is carved a particularly fine figure of a male lion. Like the lions in enclosure D, its long tail sweeps forward over its spine, but the workmanship of this piece is of a higher order than anything I've seen so far today. That's a very substantial pillar, I say to Schmidt. Can we take a look at it? He agrees, and we pick our way through the excavations until we're just a couple of metres from the lion pillar. 
It's leaning at an angle against a remnant of the rubble of cobble-sized stones and earth that had clearly filled the entire enclosure before the archaeologists began work here. Right at the edge of this segment of the dig, the head of another pillar can be seen, while in the middle of the segment a deeper trench has been cut to expose what I guess is the top third of the lion pillar. And this trench, too, is lined by the same rubble of cobbles and earth. I ask Schmidt about the rubble. All those cobbles, I say. How did they get there? They don't look like the result of natural sedimentation. They're not, he replies. He's looking, I think, a little smug. They were put there deliberately. Deliberately? Yes, by the makers of Gobekli Tepe. After the megaliths were put in place and used for a period of unknown duration, every one of the enclosures was deliberately and rapidly buried. For example, enclosure C is the oldest we've found so far. It appears that it was closed, filled in from top to bottom, so that all the pillars were completely covered before D, the next enclosure in the sequence, was made. This practice of deliberate infilling has been a great advantage to archaeology because it effectively sealed each of the enclosures and prevented the intrusion of later organic material, thus allowing us to be absolutely certain about the dating. I'm thinking rapidly as Schmidt talks. The point he makes about dating is interesting for at least three reasons. First, the implication is that at megalithic sites around the world where this sealing process didn't happen, the dates archaeologists have arrived at could be falsely young as a result of the intrusion of later organic materials, which, by the way, is the only kind of material that is subject to carbon dating because, of course, you can't carbon date in organic materials like stone. Theoretically, this could mean that famous megalithic sites that were not deliberately buried by their builders, the temples of Malta, for example, or the Taulas of Menorca, or the stone circles of Avebury and Stonehenge in England, could turn out to be much older than we're presently taught. Secondly, if the bulk of the dates at Gobekli Tepe are derived from organic materials in the fill, a fact that I'm later able to confirm from Schmidt's published papers, then this tells us only about the age of the fill. The megalithic pillars themselves must be at least that old, but they could be older since they stood in place before being buried for a period of unknown duration. Thirdly, and perhaps most important, why was the site infilled? What could possibly be the motive for going to all this trouble to create a series of spectacular megalithic circles, only to end up deliberately burying them so thoroughly and so efficiently that more than 10,000 years would pass before they were found again? The first thought that comes to my mind is time capsule that Gobekli Tepe was created to transmit a message of some kind to the future and buried so that its message could be kept intact and hidden for millennia. It's a thought that will return to haunt me many times as I continue my investigation, but another full year will pass before it comes to fruition, as we'll see in later chapters. Meanwhile, when I put the question to Klaus Schmidt, he offers a completely different explanation for the deliberate burial of the circles of pillars. In my opinion, this was their program, he says. They made the enclosures to be buried. Made to be buried? I'm intrigued. I'm waiting for him to say, as a time capsule. But instead he replies, like, for example, the megalithic cemeteries in Western Europe. Huge constructions, and then a mound on top. But then they're for burial of bodies. Is there any evidence of burial of bodies here? We don't have burials yet. We have some fragments of human bones mixed in with animal bones within the filling material, but no burials at the moment. We expect we'll find some soon. So you believe Gobekli Tepe was a necropolis? It still has to be proved, but that's my hypothesis, yes. And those fragments of human bones you found mixed with animal bones in the infill, what do you make of those? Sacrifice? Cannibalism? I don't think so, Schmidt replies. My guess is that those bones are evidence of some special treatment of the human body after death, perhaps deliberate excarnation. Such rites were practiced at a number of other known sites in the region that are of about the same age. For me, the presence of human bones in the filling material strengthens the hypothesis that we will find primary burials somewhere at Gobekli Tepe, burials that were opened after some time for a continuation of very specific rituals performed with the dead. What then, I ask, 
was the function of the pillars. The T-shaped pillars are certainly anthropomorphic, Smith replies, yet often with animals depicted on them, perhaps telling us stories connected with the T-shaped beings. We can't be sure, of course, but I think they represent divine beings. And even when they're not T-shaped, I point to the lion pillar, like this one, it too has an animal depicted upon it. Schmidt shrugs. We cannot know for sure. Perhaps we will never know. There is so much mystery here. We could excavate for fifty years and still not find all the answers. We're just at the beginning. But even so, you do have some answers, I point out. You clearly have some ideas. This lion pillar, for example, are you at least able to say how old it is? Honestly, we don't know, Schmidt replies. When we excavate beneath it, we will hopefully find some organic material that we can carbon date. But until we do, we can't be sure. But what's your impression from the style? Schmidt shrugs again before conceding, a little begrudgingly. It looks similar to some of the pillars in Enclosure C. Which are the oldest, I say. Yes, so something of that age. And that would be what exactly? Exactly 9,600 B.C. calibrated is the earliest date we have. Radiocarbon years and calendar years drift further and further apart as time goes by because the amount of the radioactive isotope carbon-14 in the atmosphere and in all living, organic things varies from epoch to epoch. Fortunately, scientists have found ways, too complicated to go into at this point, to correct for such fluctuations. The process is called calibration, so when Schmidt says 9,600 B.C. calibrated, he's giving me calendar years. What 9,600 B.C. calibrated means in 2013 when I'm talking to him is therefore 9,600 years plus the 2,013 years that have elapsed since the time of Christ, in other words, 11,613 years ago. I'm writing this sentence in December 2014, and you might not read it until 2016, by which time that oldest date that Schmidt is referring to will work out at 11,616 years before the present. You get the idea. In other words, put simply, and in round numbers, the oldest parts of Gobekli Tepe to have been excavated so far are a little over 11,600 years old. And despite all the cautions and qualifications he has expressed, what Schmidt is telling me is that in his informed opinion, on stylistic grounds, the lion pillar we are looking at is likely to be at least as old as anything hitherto excavated at Gobekli Tepe. Indeed, although he hasn't said so much, there's very little evidence one way or the other. The possibility has to be considered that it might even be older. After all, he's already admitted that the best work at Gobekli Tepe is the oldest. It's troubling, therefore. Despite the hope he's expressed that further excavation will reveal the small beginnings that we expect but haven't yet found, that this first piece of further excavation has in fact uncovered no such small beginnings. On the contrary, what it has brought to light is a massive, superbly executed megalithic pillar, with a lion rampant carved upon it in exquisite high relief, that appears, at least on stylistic grounds, to be extremely old. Perhaps, rather than Schmidt's hoped-for small beginnings, further excavations will only uncover more of the same. We know the end, the professor tells me firmly. The youngest layers at Gobekli Tepe date to 8200 BC. That's when the site is abandoned forever, but we don't know the beginning yet. Except that date of 9600 BC, 11,600 years ago, that you have from Enclosure C, that's the beginning, at least as far as you've been able to establish it up to now. The beginning of the monumental phase, yes. There's a glint in the professor's eye. And you know, 9600 BC is an important date. It isn't just a number. It's the end of the Ice Age. It's a global phenomenon. So since this goes in parallel... The date Schmidt is putting such emphasis on rings a sudden bell in my mind relating to other research I've been doing, and I feel compelled to interrupt. 9,600 BC, that's not just the end of the Ice Age. It's the end of the younger dry-ass cold spell that starts in, what, 10,800 BC? 
and ends in 9620 BC, Schmidt continues, according to the ice cores from Greenland. So how likely is it to be an accident that the monumental phase at Gobekli Tepe starts in 9600 BC, when the climate of the whole world has taken a sudden turn for the better, and there's an explosion in nature and in possibilities? I can only agree. It doesn't seem likely that it's an accident at all. On the contrary, I feel certain there must be a connection. We'll explore that connection, and the mysterious cataclysmic period that geologists call the Younger Dryas, and what those Greenland ice cores tell us, in part two. Meanwhile, back in 2013, I closed my interview with Klaus Schmidt with some praise, and in December 2014, as I sit at my desk, going through the transcript of the recording I made at Gobekli Tepe, and knowing that Klaus died of a massive, unexpected heart attack on 20 July 2014, I'm glad I did so. You're a very humble man, I say. But the fact is, you've discovered a site that has caused all of us to rethink our ideas of the past. This is a remarkable thing, and I believe that your name, as well as the name of Gobekli Tepe, will go down in history. The Bringers of Civilization After leaving Gobekli Tepe in mid-September 2013, I make an extensive journey through the length and breadth of Turkey before I finally return home. The lion pillar sticks in my mind. But what particularly haunts me is the scene on pillar number 43 in Enclosure D, the scene showing the vulture with its bent, human-like knees and its wing that so much resembles an arm, holding up a solid disc. I download Santa's photographs onto my computer and call up that scene. It has many remarkable elements as well as the disc. Both wings of the vulture are shown, I now realize, the other stretched out behind its body. To the right of the vulture is a serpent. It has a large triangular head, as do all serpents depicted at Gobekli Tepe, and its body is coiled into a curve, with its tail extending down towards an H-shaped pictogram. The serpent is nestled close to another large bird, not a vulture, but something more like an ibis with a long, sickle-shaped beak. Between it and the vulture is yet another bird, again with a hooked beak, but smaller, with the look of a chick. I turn my attention to the disc. I don't know what to make of it, but the obvious guess from its shape is that it's meant to represent the sun. There's something else that interests me more, however, if I can just put my finger on what it is. Something evocative, something hauntingly familiar about the imagery of this ancient pillar from Gobekli Tepe. Santa has shot hundreds of frames of it, from every possible angle, and obsessively I keep going through them, hoping for some clue. The vulture, the disc, and in the next register above the vulture that weird row of bags with their curved handles. Bags. Handbags. Suddenly I get it. I go to the shelf in my library where I keep reference copies of my own books and pull out fingerprints of the gods and start leafing through the photo sections. The first section deals with South America and what I'm looking for isn't there, but the second section is devoted to Mexico and on the fifth page I find it. It's image number 33 with the caption Man in Serpent Sculpture from the Olmec site of La Venta. It's Santa's photograph, taken way back in 1992 or 1993, of an impressive relief, carved on a slab of solid granite measuring about 1.2 meters, 4 feet wide, and 1.5 meters, 5 feet high. The relief features what is believed to be the earliest representation of the Central American deity whom the Maya, a later civilization than the Olmecs, would call Kukulkan or Gukumats and who was known by the even later Aztecs as Quetzalcoatl. All three names mean feathered serpent, sometimes translated as plumed serpent. And it is such a serpent, decorated with a prominent feathered crest on its head, that we see here. Its powerful body coils sinuously around the outer edge of the relief, cradling the figure of a man, who is depicted in a seated position, as though he's reaching for pedals with his feet. In his right hand, he's holding what I described at the time as a small, bucket-shaped object. I return to Santa's images from Enclosure D at Gobekli Tepe, and am immediately able to confirm what I suspected. The three bags on the pillar closely resemble the bucket-shaped object from La Venta in Mexico. The same curved handle is there in both cases, and the profile of the bags and of the bucket 
slightly wider at the bottom than at the top, is also very similar. If that were all there was to it, this would surely be a coincidence. The man in serpent relief from La Venta is thought by archaeologists to date to the period between the 10th and the 6th centuries BC, about 9,000 years younger than the imagery from Gobekli Tepe. So how could there possibly be a connection? That's when I remember a second curious image I reproduced in Fingerprints of the Gods. I check the index for the name Oannes, turn to chapter 11, and find another figure of a man carrying a bag or bucket. I hadn't noticed the resemblance between it and man in serpent before, but it's obvious to me now. Although not absolutely identical, both bags have the same curved handle that is also depicted on the Gobekli Tepe pillar. Quickly I scan through the report I wrote twenty years earlier. Oannes was a civilizing hero, revered by all the ancient cultures of Mesopotamia. He was said to have appeared there in the remotest antiquity and to have taught the inhabitants the skills necessary for writing and for doing mathematics and for all sorts of knowledge, how to build cities, found temples, make laws, determine borders and divide land, also how to plant seeds and then to harvest their fruits and vegetables. In short, he taught men all those things conducive to a civilized life. The fullest account we have of Oannes is found in surviving fragments of the works of a Babylonian priest called Berossus, who wrote in the 3rd century BC. Fortunately, I have a translation of all the Berossus fragments in one volume in my library, so I dig it out, along with a few other sources on ancient Mesopotamian myths and traditions. It doesn't take me long to discover that Oannes did not do his work alone, but was supposedly the leader of a group of beings known as the Seven Apkalu, the seven sages, who were said to have lived before the flood. A cataclysmic global deluge features prominently in many Mesopotamian traditions, including those of Sumer, Akkad, Assyria, and Babylon. Alongside Oannes, these sages are portrayed as bringers of civilization who, in the most ancient past, gave humanity a moral code, arts, crafts, and agriculture, and taught them architectural, building, and engineering skills. That's a list, I can't help thinking, that includes all the skills supposedly invented at Gobekli Tepe. I call up a map on my computer screen and see that not only does southeastern Turkey adjoin Mesopotamia geographically, but also that the two areas are linked in an even more intimate and direct way. Largely occupied today by the modern state of Iraq, the ancient name Mesopotamia means literally land between rivers the rivers in question being the Tigris and the Euphrates, which reach the sea in the Persian Gulf, but which both have their headwaters in the same Taurus mountain range of southeastern Turkey, where Gobekli Tepe is situated. While I'm online, I run some searches for images of the Seven Sages. I don't get many hits at first, but the moment I change the search terms to Apkalu and Seven Apkalu, I open a colossal archive of images from all over the Internet, many of them reliefs from Assyria, a culture that thrived in Mesopotamia from approximately 2500 BC to about 600 BC. I add Assyrian Apkalu to the search parameters, and even more images flood my screen. Often they show bearded men holding bags or buckets which closely resemble those depicted on the Gobekli Tepe pillar and the one held by the Mexican man in serpent figure. It's not just the curved handles of these containers or their shape, where the resemblance is much closer than on the original Oannis relief I reproduced in Fingerprints of the Gods. Even more striking is the peculiar and distinctive way that the figures from both Mesopotamia and Mexico hold these containers with the fingers of the hands turned inwards and the thumb crooked forwards over the handle. There's something else as well. A good number of the images show not a man, but a therianthrope, a birdman, with a hooked beak exactly like the hooked beak of the therianthrope on the Gobekli Tepe pillar. What makes the resemblance even closer is that in the Mesopotamian reliefs, the birdman is holding the container in one hand and a cone-shaped object in the other. The shape is a little different, but a comparison with the disc cradled above the wing of the Gobekli Tepe birdman is hard to resist. I can't prove anything yet. It could, of course, all be coincidence, or I could be imagining links that aren't there. 
but my curiosity is aroused by the similar containers on different continents in different epochs, and so I jot down a series of questions that can form the frame of a loose hypothesis for future testing. For instance, could these containers, whether they're bags or buckets, be the symbols of office of an initiatic brotherhood, far-traveled and deeply ancient, with roots reaching back into the remotest prehistory? I feel that this possibility, extraordinary though it may seem on the face of things, is worth looking into, and is strengthened by the distinctive hand postures. Might these not have served the same sort of function as Masonic handshakes today, providing an instant means of identifying who is an insider and who is not? And what might have been the purpose of such a brotherhood? Curiously enough, in both Mexico and Mesopotamia, where myths and traditions have survived in connection with the imagery and symbolism, we are left in no doubt as to what the purpose was. Stated simply, it was to teach, to guide, and to spread the benefits of civilization. This, after all, was the explicit function of Oannes and the Apkalu sages, who taught the inhabitants of Mesopotamia how to plant seeds and then to harvest their fruits and vegetables, agriculture in other words, and who also taught them architectural and engineering skills, notably the building of temples. If they needed to be taught these things, then they must have had no knowledge of them before the arrival of the sages. They must, in other words, have been nomadic hunter-gatherers, just as the inhabitants of southeastern Turkey were until the sudden and surprising entry onto the world stage of Gobekli Tepe. The same, it transpires, was believed to be the case with the ancient inhabitants of Mexico before the arrival of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, who came to teach them the benefits of settled agriculture and the skills necessary to build temples. Although this deity is frequently depicted as a serpent, he is more often shown in human form, the serpent being his symbol and his alter ego, and is usually described as a tall, bearded, white man, a mysterious person, a white man with a strong formation of body, broad forehead, large eyes, and a flowing beard. Indeed, as Sylvanus Griswold Morley, the doyen of Mayan studies, concluded, the attributes and life history of Quetzalcoatl are so human that it is not improbable that he may have been an actual historical character, the memory of whose benefactions lingered after his death, and whose personality was eventually deified. The same could very well be said of Oannes, and just like Oannes at the head of the Apkalu, likewise depicted as prominently bearded, it seems that Quetzalcoatl travelled with his own brotherhood of sages and magicians we learn that they arrived in Mexico from across the sea in a boat that moved by itself without paddles, and that Quetzalcoatl was regarded as having been the founder of cities, the framer of laws, and the teacher of the calendar. The 16th century Spanish chronicler, Bernardino de Sahagun, who was fluent in the language of the Aztecs and took great care to record their ancient traditions accurately, tells us further that Quetzalcoatl was a great civilizing agent who entered Mexico at the head of a band of strangers. He imported the arts into the country and especially fostered agriculture. He built spacious and elegant houses and inculcated a type of religion which fostered peace. So in summary, as well as a complex pattern of shared symbols and iconography, Quetzalcoatl and Oannes shared the same civilizing mission, which they delivered in widely separated regions of the world, in an epoch that is always described as being very far back in time, remote, antediluvian, and hoary with age. Could it have been as far back as 9600 BC, the epoch of Gobekli Tepe, where many of the same symbols are found, and where although we have no surviving legends, the signs of a civilizing mission in the form of the sudden appearance of agriculture and monumental architecture are everywhere to be seen. The implications, should I ever be able to prove this hypothesis, are stunning. At the very least, it would mean that some as yet unknown and unidentified people, somewhere in the world, had already mastered all the arts and attributes of a high civilization more than 12,000 years ago, in the depths of the last ice age, and had sent out emissaries around the world to spread the benefits of their knowledge. Who might these shadowy emissaries have been? these sages, these magicians of the gods, as I was already beginning to think of them. 
And why was there this insistent connection to the date of 9600 BC? For as Klaus Schmidt rightly pointed out as he showed me round Gobekli Tepe under the baking sun of the Taurus Mountains, 9600 BC is indeed an important date. Important not only because it marks the end of the Ice Age, but for another rather surprising reason as well. The Greek lawmaker Solon visited Egypt in 600 BC, and there he was told a very extraordinary story by the priests at the Temple of Sais in the Nile Delta, a story that was eventually handed down to his more famous descendant Plato, who in due course shared it with the world in his dialogues of Timaeus and Critias. It is, of course, the story of the great lost civilization called Atlantis, swallowed up by flood and earthquake in a single terrible day and night, 9,000 years before the time of Solon, or in our calendar, in 9,600 BC. Chapter 2. The Mountain of Light Everything we've been taught about the origins of civilization may be wrong, says Danny Hillman Natwajaja, PhD, senior geologist with the Research Center for Geotechnology at the Indonesian Institute of Sciences. Old stories about Atlantis and other great lost civilizations of prehistory, long dismissed as myths by archaeologists, look set to be proved true. It's December 2013. We're in Shanjur Regency about 900 metres, 2,950 feet, above sea level and 70 kilometres, 43 miles, west of the city of Bandung on the island of Java, Indonesia. I'm climbing with Dr. Natwajaja up the steep slope of a 110-metre, 360-foot-high step pyramid set amidst a magical landscape of volcanoes, mountains and jungles interspersed with paddy fields and tea plantations. In 1914, lying scattered amongst the dense trees and undergrowth that then covered the summit of the pyramid, ancient man-made structures formed from blocks of columnar basalt were first shown to archaeologists. Local people held the site to be sacred and called it Gunung Padang, the name it still goes by today, often mistranslated as Mountain Field, by those unaware that the language of this area is not Indonesian but Sundanese, in which Gunung Padang means Mountain of Light or Mountain of Enlightenment. The structures were found to be arranged across five terraces with a combined area of about 150 metres, 492 feet long, by 40 metres, 131 feet wide. The visiting archaeologists were told that the terraces had been used as a place of meditation and retreat since time immemorial, and again this remains true today. However, Neither the archaeologists nor apparently the locals realized the pyramid was a pyramid. It was believed to be a natural hill, somewhat modified by human activity, until Natawijaja and his team began a geophysical survey here in 2011 using ground-penetrating radar, electrical resistivity and seismic tomography. By then, the summit had long since been cleared and the structures on the terraces recognized as works of megalithic architecture but no radiocarbon dating had yet been done, and the age attributed to the site, about 1000 BC, was based on guesswork rather than on excavations. The first scientific radiocarbon dating was done by Natawijaja himself on organic materials in soils underlying the megaliths at or near the surface. The dates produced around 500 to 1500 BC were close enough to the archaeological guesswork to cause no controversy. But a surprise was in store, as Natawijaja and his team extended their investigation using tubular drills that brought up cores of earth and stone from much deeper levels. First, the drill cores contained evidence, fragments of worked columnar basalt, that more man-made megalithic structures lay far beneath the surface. Secondly, the organic materials brought up in the drill cores began to yield older and older dates. 3000 BC to 5000 BC, then 9600 BC as the drills bit deeper, then around 11,000 BC, then 15,000 BC, and finally at depths of 27 and a half meters, 90 feet and more, an astonishing sequence of dates of 20,000 BC to 22,000 BC and earlier. 
This was not at all what my colleagues in the world of archaeology expected or wanted to hear, says Natawajaja, a world-renowned expert in the geology of megathrust earthquakes, who earned his PhD at Caltech in the United States and who, it becomes apparent, regards archaeology as a thoroughly unscientific discipline. A truly cataclysmic period. The problem is that those dates, going back before 9600 BC, take us deep into the last ice age, when Indonesia was not a series of islands as it is today, but was part of a vast antediluvian Southeast Asian continent dubbed Sunderland by geologists. Sea level was 122 meters, 400 feet lower then. Huge ice caps 3.2 kilometers, 2 miles deep, covered most of Europe and North America until the ice caps began to melt. Then all the water stored in them returned to the oceans, and sea level rose, submerging many parts of the world where humans had previously lived. Thus Britain was joined to Europe during the Ice Age. There was no English Channel or North Sea. Likewise, there was no Red Sea, no Persian Gulf. Sri Lanka was joined to southern India. Siberia was joined to Alaska. Australia was joined to New Guinea, and so on and so forth. It was during this epoch of sea-level rise, sometimes slow and continuous, sometimes rapid and cataclysmic, that the Ice Age continent of Sunderland was submerged, with only the Malaysian Peninsula and the Indonesian islands as we know them today, high enough to remain above water. As we saw in the last chapter, the established archaeological view of the state of human civilization until the end of the last Ice Age is that our ancestors were primitive hunter-gatherers, ignorant of agriculture, and incapable of any architectural feats bigger than wigwams and bivouacs. This is why Gobekli Tepe, in southeastern Turkey, is so significant, because it breaks that paradigm wide open and cries out for serious consideration of a possibility, previously relegated to the lunatic fringe, that civilization might be much older and more mysterious than we thought. With the date of its foundation presently set at 9600 BC, exactly 9600 BC, as Klaus Schmidt was at pains to point out to me, Gobekli Tepe also requires us to reopen the cold case of Atlantis, which archaeologists have long ridiculed, pouring scorn and derision on anyone daring to utter the much-reviled A-word. As noted at the end of the last chapter, the Greek philosopher Plato whose dialogues Timaeus and Critias contain the earliest surviving mention of the fabled sunken kingdom, sets the catastrophic destruction and submergence of Atlantis by floods and earthquakes at 9,000 years before the time of Solon, i.e. exactly 9,600 BC. The Greeks could not have known of Gobekli Tepe, let alone that it was mysteriously founded at the very moment Atlantis was said to have died. Moreover, they had no access to the Greenland ice cores dating the end of the Ice Age to 9,620 BC, just 20 years before the foundation of Gobekli Tepe, nor to modern scientific knowledge about the rapidly rising sea levels, often accompanied by cataclysmic earthquakes as the weight of the melting ice caps was removed from the continental land masses that occurred in this period. With all this in mind, therefore, the date Plato gives is, to say the least, an uncanny coincidence. In Danny Natawijaja's view, however, it is no coincidence at all. His research at Gunung Padang has convinced him that Plato was right about the existence of a high civilization in the depths of the last ice age, a civilization that was indeed brought to a cataclysmic end, involving floods and earthquakes, in an epoch of great global instability between 10,800 B.C. and 9,600 B.C. This epoch, which geologists call the Younger Dryas, has long been recognized as mysterious and tumultuous. In 10,800 B.C., when it began, the Earth had been emerging from the Ice Age for roughly 10,000 years. Global temperatures were rising steadily, and the ice caps were melting. Then there was a sudden, dramatic return to colder conditions, nearly as cold as at the peak of the Ice Age 21,000 years ago. 
This short, sharp deep freeze lasted for 1,200 years until 9,600 BC, when the warming trend resumed, global temperatures shot up again, and the remaining ice caps melted very suddenly, dumping all the water they contained into the oceans. It is difficult, Natawijaja says, for us to imagine what life on Earth must have been like during the Younger Dryas. It was a truly cataclysmic period, of immense climate instability and terrible, indeed terrifying, global conditions. It's not surprising that many large animal species, such as the mammoths, went extinct during this precise time. And, of course, it had huge effects on our ancestors, not just those primitive hunter-gatherers the archaeologists speak of, but also, I believe, a high civilization that was wiped from the historical record by the upheavals of the Younger Dryas. A Controversial Pyramid What has brought Natawijaja to this radical view is the evidence he and his team have uncovered at Gunung Padang. When their drill cores began to yield very ancient carbon dates from organic materials embedded in clays, filling the gaps between worked stones, they expanded their investigation using geophysical equipment, ground-penetrating radar, seismic tomography, and electrical resistivity to get a picture of what lay under the ground. The results were stunning, showing layers of massive construction using the same megalithic elements of columnar basalt that are found on the surface, but with courses of huge basaltic rocks beneath them, extending down to 30 meters, 100 feet and more, beneath the surface. At those depths, the carbon dates indicate that the megaliths were put in place more than 12,000 years ago and in some cases as far back as 24,000 years ago. Columnar basalt does form naturally. The famous Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland is an example. But at Gunung Padang, it has been used as a building material and is laid out in a form never found in nature. The geophysical evidence is unambiguous, Natawijaja says. Gunung Padang is not a natural hill, but a man-made pyramid, and the origins of construction here go back long before the end of the last ice age. Since the work is massive, even at the deepest levels, and bears witness to the kinds of sophisticated construction skills that were deployed to build the pyramids of Egypt or the largest megalithic sites of Europe, I can only conclude that we're looking at the work of a lost civilization, and a fairly advanced one. The archaeologists won't like that, I point out. They don't, Natawijaja agrees with a rueful smile. I've already got myself into a lot of hot water with this. My case is a solid one, based on good scientific evidence, but it's not an easy one. I'm up against deeply entrenched beliefs. The next step will be a full-scale archaeological excavation. We have to excavate in order to interrogate our remote sensing data and our carbon dating sequences, and either confirm or deny what we believe we found here, says Natawijaja. But unfortunately, there's a lot of obstacles in our way. When I ask what he means by obstacles, he replies that some senior Indonesian archaeologists are lobbying the government in Jakarta to prevent him from doing any further work at Gunung Padang on the grounds that they know the site is less than 3,000 years old and see no justification for disturbing it. I don't deny that the megaliths at the surface are less than 3,000 years old, Natawijaja hastens to add, but I suggest they were put here because Gunung Padang has been recognized as a sacred place since time immemorial. It's the deepest layers of the structure at between 12,000 and more than 20,000 years old that are the most important. They have potentially revolutionary implications for our understanding of history, and I think it's vital that we be allowed to investigate them properly. Atlantis. Happily, there was a decisive presidential intervention during 2014, and I can now report that Danny, I'll use his first name henceforth as we have become friends, was given carte blanche to excavate the site. He and his team began work in August 2014, completing a short season there between August and October. But as the experience at Gobekli Tepe shows, painstaking detailed archaeology is a slow process and they do not expect to reach the deepest layers until 2017 or 2018. As the first season neared its end, however, Danny emailed me an update. The research progress has been great. 
we have excavated three more spots right on top of the megalithic site in the past couple of weeks, which give more evidence and detail about the buried structures. We have uncovered lots more stone artefacts from the excavations. The existence of the pyramid-like structure beneath the megalithic site is now loud and clear. Even for non-specialists, it's not too difficult to understand if they come and see for themselves. We have found some kind of open hall, buried by soil five to seven meters thick. However, we've not yet got into the main chamber. We are now drilling to the suspected location of the chamber, based on subsurface geophysic, in the middle of the megalithic site. Buried structures? Chambers? Ah, yes, I forgot to mention those. We'll go into the implications of all this in more detail in a later chapter, but in brief, the geophysical survey work that Danny and his team did between 2011 and 2013, deploying the latest technologies in electrical resistivity, seismic tomography, ground-penetrating radar and core drilling, revealed not only deeply buried massive constructions and very ancient carbon dates at Gunung Padang, but also the presence of three further hidden and as yet unexcavated chambers, so rectilinear in form that they're most unlikely to be natural. The largest of these lies at a depth of between 21.3 and 27.4 meters, 70 to 90 feet, and measures approximately 5.5 meters, 18 feet high, 13.7 meters, 45 feet long, and 9.1 meters, 30 feet wide. Could it be the fabled Hall of Records of Atlantis? Danny has put his impeccable scientific credentials on the line with the controversial claim that it might be. Not only does he refuse to scoff at the idea of Atlantis, but also he's written a book arguing that Indonesia, or rather the huge areas of Sundaland that were drowned by rising sea levels at the end of the Ice Age, might actually be Atlantis. Danny and I made an extensive research trip around the whole of the Indonesian archipelago in June 2014, searching out megalithic sites off the beaten track that have never been properly studied by archaeologists. In Chapter 18, I'll describe our findings and how they relate to the Gunung Padang mystery. But meanwhile, I want to report here on the opinion of Dr. Robert Schock, professor of geology at Boston University, who was with me in December 2013, when I first met Danny at Gunung Padang. The View of Professor Robert Schock Schock is a renowned figure, indeed notorious, for the case he's made based on strict geological evidence that the great Sphinx of Giza bears the unmistakable erosion patterns of thousands of years of heavy rainfall. This means it has to be much older than 2500 BC, the Orthodox date, when Egypt received no more rain than it does today, and must originally have been carved around the end of the Ice Age, when the Nile Valley was subjected to a long period of intense precipitation. A tall, rangy, scholarly man with a full beard and a mop of unruly hair, Shock was in his element at Gunung Padang carefully interrogating the results of the geophysical scans with Danny, collecting samples and minutely examining the site. Afterwards, when he'd returned to the U.S. and had time to analyze the data, he wrote, The first important observation is that Gunung Padang goes back to before the end of the last ice age, circa 9700 B.C. Based on the evidence, I believe that human use of the site began by circa 14700 B.C., Possibly the earliest use of the site goes back to 22,000 BC, or even earlier. In my assessment, layer 3, some 4 to 10 meters, 13.1 to 32.8 feet or so, below the surface, includes the period of the very end of the last ice age, circa 10,000 to 9,500 BC, when major climatic changes took place with dramatic global warming, rising sea levels, torrential rains, increased earthquake and volcanic activity, widespread wildfires, and other catastrophes occurring across the surface of the Earth. There is evidence of collapsed structures in Layer 3, possibly the result of the tumultuous conditions at that time. Visiting Gunung Padang, pondering the dates and evidence of collapse and rebuilding that may have occurred here, I could not help but think about another major site, representing very ancient civilization, that spans the end of the last ice age, namely 
Gobekli Tepe in southeastern Turkey. I also think of Egypt and my own work on redating the Great Sphinx, the extreme weathering and erosion seen on the Proto Sphinx. The head was recarved and the monument reused during dynastic times, caused by torrential rains, could have been a result of the extreme climatic changes at the end of the last ice age. Putting together the evidence of Gunung Padang with that derived from Gobekli Tepe, the Sphinx of Egypt, and other sites and lines of data from around the world, I believe we're coming closer to understanding the cataclysmic times and events at the end of the last ice age. Genuine civilizations of a sophisticated nature existed prior to circa 9700 BC, which were devastated by the events that brought the last ice age to a close. Looking for the smoking gun. At 6,000 or more years older than the stone circles of Stonehenge, the megaliths of Gobekli Tepe, like the deeply buried megaliths of Gunung Padang, mean that the timeline of history taught in our schools and universities for the best part of the last hundred years can no longer stand. It is beginning to look as though civilization, as I argued in my controversial 1995 bestseller, Fingerprints of the Gods, is indeed much older and much more mysterious than we thought. In essence, what I proposed in that book was that an advanced civilization had been wiped out and lost to history in a global cataclysm at the end of the last ice age. I suggested there were survivors who settled at various locations around the world and attempted to pass on their superior knowledge, including knowledge of agriculture and architecture, to hunter-gatherer peoples who had also survived the cataclysm. Indeed, even today, we have populations of hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari Desert, for instance, and in the Amazon jungle, who coexist with our advanced technological culture. So we shouldn't be surprised that equally disparate levels of civilization might have coexisted in the past. What I couldn't do when I wrote fingerprints, because the data wasn't then available, was identify the exact nature of the cataclysm that had wiped out my hypothetical lost civilization. Instead, I speculated on a number of possible causes, notably the radical earth-crust displacement theory of Professor Charles Hapgood, which, though endorsed by Albert Einstein, has since found little favor amongst geologists. This absence of a credible smoking gun was one of the many aspects of my argument that was heavily criticized by archaeologists. Since 2007, however, a cascade of scientific evidence has come to light that has identified the smoking gun for me. It's all the more intriguing because it's the work of a large group of impressively credentialed mainstream scientists, and because it does not rule out, indeed, it in some ways reinforces, the case for massive crustal instability that I made in Fingerprints of the Gods. We'll explore this new evidence, and its stunning implications, in the following chapters. Part 2. Comet. Chapter 3. A Wall of Green Water Destroying Everything in Its Path Could certain ancient myths and traditions, judged to be of no historic value by scholars, in fact encode accurate recollections of an epoch when humanity experienced a crisis so devastating, so cataclysmic, and so dislocating that we lost our memory of our true past? Consider this account from the Ojibwa, a Native American people. The star, with the long, wide tail, is going to destroy the world some day when it comes low again. That's the comet called Long-Tailed Heavenly Climbing Star. It came down here once, thousands of years ago, just like the sun. It had radiation and burning heat in its tail. The comet burnt everything to the ground. There wasn't a thing left. Indian people were here before that happened, living on the earth. But things were wrong. A lot of people had abandoned the spiritual path. The Holy Spirit warned them a long time before the comet came. Medicine men told everyone to prepare. Things were wrong with nature on the earth. Then that comet went through here. It had a long, wide tail, and it burnt up everything. It flew so low the tail scorched the earth. The comet made a different world. After that, survival was hard work. The weather was colder than before. 
There are other interesting details in the various versions of this myth told amongst the Ojibwa and recorded by anthropologist Thor Conway. For example, there's a reference to the comet killing off giant animals. You can find their bones today in the earth. It is said that the comet came down and spread his tail for miles and miles. At the time of this event, usually referred to as the first burning of the earth, we are told that the Ojibwa lived near the edge of the frozen lands. It's also recorded that soon after the comet disaster, the first flooding of the earth occurred. Just as the Ojibwa tradition laments that things were wrong, people had abandoned the spiritual path, thus implicating human behavior in the disaster that followed, so too the Brule, one of the tribes of the Lakota nation, tell of a time in the world before this one when the people and animals turned to evil and forgot their connection to the Creator. In response, the Creator resolved to destroy the world and start over. He first warned a few good people to flee to the highest mountaintops, then sent down fierce thunderbirds to wage a great battle against the other humans and the giant animals. Again, as in the Ojibwa myth, the Brule account speaks of animals of extraordinary size. Finally, at the height of the battle, the thunderbirds suddenly threw down their most powerful thunderbolts all at once. The fiery blast shook the entire world toppling mountain ranges and setting forests and prairies ablaze. The flames leapt up to the sky in all directions, sparing only the few people on the highest peaks. Even the rocks glowed red-hot, and the giant animals and evil people burned up where they stood. Now the Creator began to make the world anew. As the Creator chanted the song of creation, it began to rain. The Creator sang louder, and it rained harder, until the rivers overflowed their banks and surged across the landscape. Finally, the Creator stamped the earth, and with a great quake the earth split open, sending great torrents across the entire world, until only a few mountain peaks stood above the flood, sheltering the few people who had survived. After the flood subsided, as the people went out over the land, they found the bleached bones of the giant animals buried in rock and mud. People still find them today, in the Dakota Badlands. Of particular note, when we remember that a species of giant beaver became extinct in North America at the end of the Ice Age, is a myth of the Passamaquoddy, Micmac, and Malisi that speaks of a being called Glooskap, described as a spirit, a medicine man, and a sorcerer, who created the first animals, amongst them the first beaver, a creature so large that when it built a dam it flooded the country from horizon to horizon. Glooskap tapped the beaver on its back and it shrank to its present size. The reference to a flood in this story is one amongst hundreds in the myths of the Native Americans. Many of them contain intriguing details of great relevance to new scientific information about events in North America at the end of the Ice Age that we will explore in the following pages. For example, the Cowichan of British Columbia recall a time in the remote past when their seers became greatly troubled on account of strange dreams which foretold destruction. One man said, I have dreamed a strange thing. I dreamed that such rain fell that we were all drowned. Another said, I dreamed that the river rose and flooded the place, and we were all destroyed. So did I, chimed another, and I too. The seers were disbelieved by their people, but nonetheless resolved to build a huge raft of many canoes joined together. Not long after they were done, the rain commenced. The drops were as large as hailstones, and so heavy that they killed the little babies. The river rose and all the valleys were covered. The seers and those few of their friends who had believed them took their families and placed them on the raft and took food and waited. By and by the raft rose with the water. At length the rain stopped and they felt the waters going down and their raft rested on the top of Kawichan Mountain. Then they saw the land, but what desolation met their eyes. How their hearts were wrung with anguish. It was indescribable. Unusually large hailstones feature in a Quilayut cataclysm myth. For days and days great storms blew. Rain and hail and then sleet and snow came down upon the land. The hailstones were so large that many of the people were killed. The survivors grew thin and weak from hunger. 
The hailstones had beaten down the firms and the camas and the berries. Ice locked the rivers so that men could not fish. The Pima, or river people, presently live in Arizona, whence they migrated in remote antiquity from much further north. As is the case with the Cowichan, a seer features in their cataclysm traditions, in this case a seer who was warned by a great eagle that a flood was coming. The eagle visited the seer four times, and each time he ignored its warnings. You'd better believe what I'm telling you, said the eagle. The whole valley will be flooded. Everything will be destroyed. You're a liar, said the seer. And you're a seer who sees nothing, said the eagle. The bird flew away, and hardly had he gone when a tremendous thunderclap was heard, the loudest there has ever been. The sun remained hidden behind dark clouds, and there was only twilight, grey and misty. Then the earth trembled, and there came a great roar of something immense moving. The people saw a sheer green wall advancing toward them, filling the valley from one side to the other. At first they did not know what it was, and then they realized that it was a wall of green water. Destroying everything in its path, it came like a huge beast, a green monster rushing upon them, foaming, hissing in a cloud of spray. It engulfed the seer's house and carried it away with the seer, who was never seen again. Then the water fell upon the villages, sweeping away homes, people, fields and trees. The flood swept the valley clean as with a broom. Then it rushed on beyond the valley to wreak havoc elsewhere. The Inuit of Alaska preserve a tradition of an earthquake accompanied by a terrible flood that swept so rapidly over the earth that only a few people managed to escape in their canoes or take refuge on the top of the highest mountains. The Luiseño of California also remember a flood that covered the mountains and destroyed most of mankind. Only those few who fled to the highest peaks were spared when all the rest of the world was inundated. Similar flood myths were recorded amongst the Hurons and the Montagniers, who belonged to the Algonquin family, relate how the god Michabo reconstructed the world after a great flood. Michabo was hunting with his pack of trained wolves one day when he saw the strangest sight. The wolves entered a lake and disappeared. He followed them into the water to fetch them, and as he did so, the entire world flooded. Michabo then sent forth a raven to find some soil with which to make a new earth, but the bird returned unsuccessful in its quest. Then Michabo sent an otter to do the same thing, but again to no avail. Finally he sent the muskrat, and she brought him back enough earth to begin the reconstruction of the world. Lynn's History of the Dakotas, written in the 19th century, preserves many indigenous traditions that would otherwise have been lost. These include an Iroquois myth that the sea and the waters had at one time infringed upon the land so that all human life was destroyed. The Chickasaws asserted that the world had been destroyed by water, but that one family was saved and two animals of every kind. The Lakota, Dakotas, also spoke of a time when there was no dry land and when all men disappeared from existence. Myths Speaking to Science For years, an often acrimonious debate has been underway amongst scholars regarding the peopling of the Americas. Who are the Native Americans exactly? When did they first arrive in the New World? And by what route? Whenever a resolution has begun to look possible, whenever some kind of consensus has been about to emerge, new information has been presented, by one side or the other, that calls for a rethink. What has never been in dispute, however, is that the ancestors of today's Native Americans were already in North America 12,800 years ago, when the mysterious cold event that geologists call the Younger Dryas began, and that they witnessed and hunted the megafauna that flourished during the Ice Age, including the gigantic Columbia mammoth, the somewhat smaller woolly mammoth, the giant beaver, short-faced bears, giant sloths, two species of tapirs, several species of peccaries, and the fearsome American lion. It's thought likely, therefore, that the references to very large animals in the myths cited above are not mere fantasies, but preserve eyewitness accounts 
of some of the many genera of mega mammals that were present in North America before the Younger Dryas began, but had passed into extinction by the time it ended 1,200 years later. The same goes for the floods that the myths describe, for geologists agree that North America was indeed subjected to episodes of cataclysmic flooding in the final millennia of the last ice age. What new research has called into question in the past decade, however, is whether the scale, extent, and most importantly, the causes of those floods have been properly understood. The mainstream view is copiously represented and endlessly repeated in books and journals published since the 1960s. But in order to get to grips with a powerful alternative view that now poses a serious challenge to established theories, I made an extensive field trip across North America in September and October 2014 with catastrophist researcher Randall Carlson. Randall cannot be a reincarnation of J. Harlan Bretz, because J. Harlan Bretz, whose first name was the letter J, and who hated it when proofreaders tried to treat it like an initial, passed away on the 3rd of February 1981, by which time Randall was already 30 years old. However, in his passion for real fieldwork, for walking the walk, rather than just reading the literature, and in his dogged advocacy of a radical geological hypothesis concerning the cataclysmic floods that tore North America apart at the end of the Ice Age, Randall is, in every meaningful sense, the new J. Harlan Bretz. I will describe my travels with Randall and the compelling evidence he presented me with in the chapters that follow. But first, you may well be wondering, who was J. Harlan Bretz? Meet J. Harlan Bretz. Here is Bretz, writing in 1928, after one of his field trips across Washington State in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. No one with an eye for landforms can cross eastern Washington in daylight without encountering and being impressed by the scab land, like great scars marring the otherwise fair face of the plateau are these elongated tracts of bare or nearly bare black rock carved into mazes of buttes and canyons. Everybody on the plateau knows Scabland. It interrupts the wheat lands, parceling them out into hill tracts less than 40 acres to more than 40 square miles in extent. One can neither reach them nor depart from them without crossing some part of the ramifying Scabland. Aside from affording a scanty pasturage, Scabland is almost without value. The popular name is an expressive metaphor. The Scablands are wounds, only partially healed, great wounds in the epidermis of soil with which nature protects the underlying rock. With eyes only a few feet above the ground, the observer today must travel back and forth repeatedly and must record his observations mentally, photographically, by sketch and by map, before he can form anything approaching a complete picture. Yet long before the paper bearing these words has yellowed, the average observer, looking down from the air as he crosses the region, will see, almost at a glance, the picture here drawn by piecing together the ground-level observations of months of work. The region is unique. Let the observer take the wings of the morning to the uttermost parts of the earth, he will nowhere find its likeness. By 1928, Bretz was an experienced and highly credentialed field geologist. Born in 1882, he'd started his career as a high school biology teacher in Seattle, but spent most of his spare time exploring the geology of Puget Sound. Although he didn't have a geology degree at the time, he succeeded in getting several articles on his findings published in scientific journals. In 1911, he enrolled at the University of Chicago to pursue a doctorate in geology. He graduated summa cum laude in 1913 and immediately thereafter returned to Seattle where he accepted a position as assistant professor of geology at the University of Washington. He had difficulties with the attitudes of other teaching staff there. He later described them as stick-in-the-muds. And by 1914, he was back at the University of Chicago initially as an instructor, but soon afterward as an assistant professor. The first field trip Bretz made to the Scablands of eastern Washington was in 1922. By this point, as a result of his earlier work, he was fully informed about the Ice Age in all its dimensions, 
and more aware than most other geologists that immense ice sheets up to two miles deep had covered North America for the best part of a hundred thousand years until the ice melted dramatically somewhere between fifteen thousand and eleven thousand years ago. Thus, when he saw huge numbers of erratics, giant boulders that didn't belong naturally in the area but had clearly been brought in from elsewhere, he was inclined to assume that they might have travelled here in icebergs, carried on some great glacial flood. This impression was strengthened when he explored Grand Coulee and Moses Coulee, gigantic channels gouged deeply in the earth, and visited the Quincy Basin at the southern end of Grand Coulee, where he found the whole 600-square-mile depression filled up to a depth of 400 feet with small particles of basalt debris. He couldn't help but wonder, where had all the debris come from and when? Again, the answer that presented itself to him was a flood. Bretz was back in the Scablands in 1923 for three months of exploration, and it seems to have been during this field trip that his later views, namely that some spectacular hydrological event had begun in this region, then abruptly stopped, really began to take shape. In the November to December 1923 issue of the Journal of Geology, Bretz published a paper summarizing his findings. To understand the somewhat defensive tone of the paper, it's important to keep in mind the prevailing geological doctrine of the time, the principle known as uniformitarianism. This is the assumption that existing processes, acting as at present, are sufficient to account for all geological changes. Integral to it is the parallel assumption of gradualism, namely that the present is the key to the past and that the rate of change observable today is an accurate guide to rates of change that prevailed in the past. Such ideas, which had acquired the status of an unchallengeable truth by Bretz's day, had themselves arisen from the necessary, indeed essential, overthrow of the old religious belief in creationism and the notion that God whimsically intervened in the earth's history by ordaining cataclysms such as the biblical flood. In righteous opposition to these thoughts of supernatural creation and destruction, uniformitarianism seemed a profoundly rational response that saw only the forces of nature at work upon the earth over periods of millions, or indeed billions of years. Mountains had not been built overnight, but had risen slowly, imperceptibly, over time. Likewise had fantastic geological features such as the Grand Canyon been eroded by the flow of rivers over many millions of years. Bretz was an eminently rational man, and certainly no religious dogmatist. Yet, as his biographer John Sonichsen notes, while hiking through the hot, dry, ragged world of the Scablands, everything he had seen pointed not to a slow, uniform change over time, but to a catastrophe— a sudden release of colossal quantities of water that had quickly washed away the loesial topsoil and then carved deeply into the basalt rock beneath. The problem was, where had all this water come from? It was well understood that at the margin of the North American ice sheets there must have been some melting, as one indeed sees at the edges of all glaciers today. But such melting could hardly explain the magnitude of the erosive changes that were visible in the field. As Brett noted in his 1923 paper, the writer confesses that during ten weeks of study of the region, each newly examined scabland tract reawakened a feeling of amazement that such huge streams could take origin from such small, marginal tracts of an ice sheet, or that such an enormous amount of erosion despite high gradients, could have resulted in the very brief times these streams existed. Not River Warren, nor the Chicago Outlet, not the Mohawk Channel, nor even Niagara Falls and Gorge itself approach the proportions of some of these scabland tracts and their canyons. From one of these canyons alone, Upper Grand Coulee, ten cubic miles of basalt was eroded by its glacial stream. Concluding the paper, and moving towards the profoundly heretical and anti-uniformitarian idea that would soon get him into a great deal of trouble, 
namely that a single cataclysmic flood unleashed in a very short period had been responsible for all the devastation he had witnessed, Bretz wrote, Fully 3,000 square miles of the Columbia Plateau were swept by the glacial flood and the lowest and silt cover removed. More than 2,000 square miles of this area were left as bare, eroded, rock-cut channel floors, now the Scablands, and nearly 1,000 square miles carry gravel deposits derived from the eroded basalt. It was a debacle which swept the Columbia Plateau. In other words, as Bretz's biographer summarizes, the geologist now believed that the features he had documented could only have been created by a flood of unimaginable proportions, possibly the largest flood in the history of the world. The reaction of the geological establishment was one of stunned, embarrassed silence. To have strayed so far from the doctrine of uniformitarianism could only mean that Bretz must have gone mad. David Alt, Professor Emeritus of Geology at the University of Montana, describes one of the lectures that Bretz gave in which he expounded on the ideas in his 1923 paper. The geologists were aghast in the same way that a room full of physicists would be upon hearing a colleague explain how he had made a perpetual motion machine out of old popsicle sticks. Physicists had all learned very early of the futility of perpetual motion machines, and no properly educated geologist was supposed to traffic in catastrophes of any sort. Alt describes an old professor of his own undergraduate days who had been a student sitting in the audience when Bretz read his 1923 paper. It seems the professor did a hilarious impersonation of Brett's pounding on the podium with both fists and stomping on the floor as he used vivid language and gestures to convey his idea of a catastrophic flood to his horrified audience. Quite apart from the theatricals, Alt says, the geologists were shocked to hear Brett's invoke a sudden catastrophe to explain the scablands of eastern Washington. In their view, this was a reversion to the unscientific thinking of some 125 years before. To this day, most geologists consider it nothing less than heresy to invoke a catastrophic explanation for a geologic event. So Brett stepped off the edge of a very long limb when he suggested that a great flood had eroded the scablands. It made him a pariah amongst geologists, an outcast from the politer precincts of society. The outcast did not give up, however. On the contrary, he doggedly continued with his research, bringing down ever more controversy on his head in the process, but believing that facts ultimately would vindicate him. The crunch came on the 12th of January, 1927, when Bretz was ambushed by a lynch mob of his colleagues at a lecture he'd been invited to give to the Geological Society of Washington in the Cosmos Club, Washington, D.C., Bretz was now calling his flood the Spokane Flood, after the town of Spokane, and liked to refer to the ice sheet from which it had emerged as the Spokane Ice Sheet. Neither term is used today, but Bretz's Spokane Ice Sheet was, effectively, the southern part of that great late Pleistocene ice sheet now known as the Cordilleran. He believed that large parts of it must have melted with extraordinary rapidity, because the volume of water was very great, almost incredibly great. In spite of high gradients to draw it off, the pre-existing valleys first entered were inadequate to carry it all, and the flood spread widely in a complicated group of anastomosing roots. W. C. Alden, then the chief of Pleistocene geology with the profoundly conservative U.S. Geological Survey, objected to the idea that all the channels must have been developed simultaneously in a very short time and took great offence at the tremendous amount of water postulated by Bretz. It seems to me impossible, Alden protested, that such part of the great ice fields as would have drained across the Columbia Plateau could, under any conditions, have yielded so much water as is called for in so short a time. He admitted that he'd never visited the Scablands himself, but felt sure that a uniformitarian explanation was what was required. The problem would be easier if longer time and repeated floods could be allotted to do the work. James Gillooly, well known as an apostle of geologic gradualism, dismissed the notion of a single cataclysmic flood with words like preposterous, incompetent, 
and wholly inadequate. He found nothing in Brett's evidence to exclude his own preferred solution, namely that multiple smaller floods had been involved, and that these would have been of the order of magnitude of the present Columbia's, or at most a few times as large. Likewise, G. R. Mansfield doubted that so much work could be done on basalt in so short a time. The scablands seemed to me better explained as the effects of persistent ponding and overflow of marginal glacial waters, which changed their position or their places of outlet from time to time through a somewhat protracted period. O. E. Meinzer was obliged to confess that the erosion features of the region are large and bizarre, but he too preferred a gradualist explanation. Before a theory that requires a seemingly impossible quantity of water is fully accepted, every effort should be made to account for the existing features without employing so violent an assumption. I believe the existing features can be explained by assuming normal stream work of the ancient Columbia River. In summary, not a single voice was raised in support of Brett's, and there was much patronizing dismissal of his outrageous hypothesis of a single large flood. In particular, the massed geologists homed in on what they clearly believed was the fatal flaw in the case for a sudden and overwhelming cataclysm, namely that Bretz had failed to identify a convincing source for his floodwaters. Bretz replied that he saw no logic in this, since lack of a documented source for the flood did not prove that there had been no flood. I believe my interpretation of channeled scabland should stand or fail on the scabland phenomena themselves, he argued. He was, he said, as sensitive as anyone else to adverse criticism, and had no desire to invite attention simply by advocating extremely novel views. Moreover, he himself had repeatedly been driven to doubt the verity of the Spokane flood only to be forced by reconsideration of the field evidence to use again the conception of enormous volume. These remarkable records of running water on the Columbia Plateau and in the valleys of the Snake and Columbia Rivers cannot be interpreted in terms of ordinary river action and ordinary valley development. Enormous volume, existing for a very short time, alone will account for their existence. It was this accumulation of compelling field evidence that Bretz asked to be considered not by emotion, not by intuition, not by reference to received wisdom, but only by the established principles of the scientific method. Ideas without precedent, he was to write later, are generally looked on with disfavor, and men are shocked if their conceptions of an orderly world are challenged. A hypothesis, earnestly defended, begets emotional reaction, which may cloud the protagonist's view. But if such hypotheses outrage prevailing modes of thought, the view of antagonists may also become fogged. On the other hand, geology is plagued with extravagant ideas which spring from faulty observation and misinterpretation. They are worse than outrageous hypotheses, for they lead nowhere. The writer's Spokane flood hypothesis may belong to the latter class, but it cannot be placed there unless errors of observation and direct inference are demonstrated. And this was the problem with all the criticisms of Brett's both before and after the Washington meeting. The geological establishment didn't like what he had to say. It flew in the face of their gradualist reference frame, and they regarded it as a heresy that must be gently but firmly stamped out. In the final analysis, however, they couldn't disprove his science, only disapprove of it, which is a very different thing. The heart of the matter remained Brett's assertion that the ice cap had melted precipitously, and his inability to propose a mechanism that could have brought about such melting. He himself, as noted, did not regard this as a significant stumbling block, but his critics did. Over the years, therefore, in attempts to appease them, he several times reluctantly proposed two possible solutions. These were some sort of radical, short-lived climate change on the one hand, or on the other, an episode of volcanic activity beneath the ice cap. He admitted of the former, however, that no such climatic change is recorded elsewhere, and the rapidity demanded seems impossible. While of the latter, he observed that nothing has been found in the literature to suggest Pleistocene volcanism in the area which was drained across the Columbia Plateau. Interestingly, 
By the time Bretz faced his hostile peers in Washington, he was already aware of but had dismissed the very explanation for cataclysmic flooding that would much later be taken up by the geological establishment and open the door to the universal acceptance of his evidence that prevails today. In his outline for his January 1927 presentation, he wrote, Both Mr. Alden and Mr. Pardee have suggested that I consider the sudden draining of a glacial lake to account for the flood. Mr. Pardee, in a 1925 letter to Bretz, specifies Lake Missoula, which is the only one of any magnitude known in the region that might have functioned. Eventually, in the 1940s, Bretz would indeed embrace a sudden draining of glacial Lake Missoula as the source of his flood. But the reason why he did not do so in 1927 is important, and as we shall see, of the greatest relevance to the evolving debate about what exactly happened in North America at the end of the Ice Age. In brief, Bretz's view in 1927, as his biographer explains, was that the volume of Lake Missoula might not have been adequate to form the Scablands. Would run the flood for only two weeks, reads a handwritten comment by Bretz in this section of his outline. In March 1930, Bretz published a brief abstract in the Bulletin of the Geological Society of America. The abstract was titled Lake Missoula and the Spokane Flood. In it, Bretz wrote that this lake had first been named and described by the geologist J.T. Pardee, whose letter on the subject he'd received in 1925 that it stood more than 4,000 feet above sea level, and that it was at least 2,100 feet deep. Without going into any detail, he noted that the lake had been held in place by an ice dam, and that 70 miles to the southwest, along the western arm of the Purcell Trench and the Spokane Valley, are the easternmost heads of the Scabland Channels. If a bursting of the dam occurred, water could only escape along this 70-mile stretch. By 1932, Bretz had warmed further to the idea that Lake Missoula could be the culprit behind his flood, although he felt that issues concerning the hypothetical ice dam and its proposed cataclysmic failure remained to be worked out. At this point in his life, however, he seemed ready to move on and was to devote most of the next decade to other completely different geological puzzles. Then in 1940, he was invited to speak on his Scablands theory at a meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science being held in Seattle. He declined the invitation, saying that his views and evidence were already in print. But the event turned out to be a seminal one. J.T. Pardee was there and presented a paper on his work on Glacial Lake Missoula, making public for the first time his long-held conclusion that there had been a failure of an ice dam and that the entire lake had drained catastrophically and most likely quite dramatically. Curiously, Pardee did not connect his Missoula findings to Brett's own long-standing and well-known case about the creation of the channeled scablands by a catastrophic flood. But much later, Brett's would write, He never said, at least in print, anything about the final deposition of this vigorous discharge. I do believe, however, that he was generously leaving that to me. In the process of making the most of what had been left to him, Bretz abandoned his single cataclysmic flood model in favor of one more palatable to his opponents. There were several floods he was eventually to write in 1959. The theory is elastic enough to take care of that. In the same year, Bretz was presented with the Neil Milner Award in honor of his exceptional contributions to earth sciences. A few years later, in 1965, Bretz's transformation from pariah to poster boy seemed complete. The International Union for Quaternary Research organized a field trip to the Columbia Plateau for many former critics of the catastrophic flood theory. The group traversed the full length of Grand Coulee, part of the Quincy Basin, and much of the Palouse Snake Scabland Divide. At the end of the trip, the participants, humbled by what they had seen and satisfied as to the source of the flood damage in Glacial Lake Missoula, sent Bretz a telegram of greetings and salutations. The telegram closed with the words, We are all now catastrophists. Be assured, wrote Bretz, that after thirty years and thirty papers in self-defense and more than thirty people who vigorously denied my theory, it did my heart good like medicine. The final accolade came in 1979, when Bretz, by then aged 96, received the Penrose Medal, 
the Geological Society of America's highest accolade. After this award, he told his son, All my enemies are dead, so I have no one to gloat over. Bretz went on to his next great adventure, aged 98 years, on the 3rd of February, 1981. Gradualism draws the teeth of Bretz's cataclysm. So, all seemed well. The evidence of a land scoured by cataclysmic deluge could not be denied. The timing had been set, perhaps not precisely, but at any rate somewhere in the last millennia of the Ice Age, between 15,000 and 11,000 years ago. The source of the deluge had been tracked down to Glacial Lake Missoula, and the crunch point of whether there had been just one gigantic flood, which Bretz's honed instincts as a field geologist had originally suggested, or multiple floods, as his gradualist colleagues preferred, had been conceded with reference to the elasticity of his theory and an allowance of several floods. It becomes clear in later papers published by Bretz that he was willing to accept that up to eight floods had occurred. This was undoubtedly a concession to gradualism. Eight smaller floods, politely spread out over a period of some thousands of years, being more palatable to those of a uniformitarian persuasion, i.e. to most geologists then and now, than a single humongous event of great violence that occurred suddenly, did massive damage and was over and done with in about three months. Nonetheless, Bretz remained a catastrophist at heart. Victor R. Baker of the Department of Hydrology and Water Resources at the University of Arizona notes in his study The Spokane Flood Debates that while Bretz did indeed extensively modify his original hypothesis, there was a lingering suspicion that one was dealing with an unusual exception to a general rule. Bretz himself had claimed the unique assemblage of forms described as the channeled scabland records a unique episode in Pleistocene history. Special causes seem clearly indicated. In other words, regardless of any concessions, what is referred to here are causes that were still unique and special enough to be described as catastrophic, and that did not undermine the conclusion that it was a debacle which swept the Columbia Plateau. It is surely significant that in his last published work, a note he wrote to the Geological Society of America in 1979 accepting its highest accolade, the Penrose Medal, that Bretz took the opportunity to drive this point home. Perhaps, he wrote, I can be credited with reviving and demystifying legendary catastrophism and challenging a too rigorous uniformitarianism. What Bretz, the catastrophist and challenger of uniformitarianism, could not have known, however, was that once he had invited the vampire of gradualism through the door, it would not be satisfied with the compromise that he had tried to strike, but would keep on remorselessly sucking the blood out of any notion that what had happened in the channeled scablands had been any sort of debacle at all. Thus, as the years have gone by, and new generations of gradualist scholars have taken their places at universities around the world, the eight floods that were first allowed to modify Bretz's single cataclysm have steadily increased in number, to a dozen, then to more than twenty, then to thirty-five, then to about forty, and finally, in recent papers, to as many as ninety or more. The most current opinion, summarizes Vic Baker, is that there were about 80 floods that all occurred within a period of 2,500 years, roughly between 15,000 years ago and 12,000 years ago, possibly at regular intervals. 80 floods in 2,500 years works out at one flood approximately every 31 years, thus doing away with any need for a single exceptional cataclysm and accounting for the horrendous mess of the channeled scablands by the accumulated effects of a rather regular, predictable, essentially gradualist series of events. Better still, from a uniformitarian point of view, outburst floods from ice-dammed glacial lakes still occur today. They happen regularly in Iceland, for example, where they are called joculaups, the term that has been adopted for them worldwide and that I will continue to use here. Other locations where they are common include the Himalayas, Antarctica, northern Sweden and North America. As geology professor David Alt points out, several glacially dammed lakes in Alaska and northern British Columbia are prone to episodes of very fast drainage, 
These events usually occur in summer when a fast snowmelt rapidly raises the level of the lake. The ice dam that held Glacial Lake Missoula probably floated and broke during the summer for the same reason. In this way, the uniformitarian doctrine that the present is the key to the past and that the rate of change observable today is an accurate guide to rates of change that prevailed in the past has quietly reasserted itself. And Bretz's disturbing flood evidence has been explained away as nothing very much to worry about after all. The scholars have also rather cleverly contrived to have their cake and eat it, on the one hand giving Bretz a medal and proclaiming that they are all catastrophists now, on the other quietly transmuting Bretz's catastrophe into the sort of thing that one sees every summer in Alaska and British Columbia. This is all very reassuring, of course, but suppose that Bretz's original insight was right and that what happened in North America at the end of the Ice Age really was a sudden cataclysmic flood, something unprecedented and unmatched since. Suppose it really was a debacle. Back to Bretz. Randall Carlson is quite certain that it was indeed a debacle, one that unfolded on an almost unbelievable scale and has spent the last twenty years trekking back and forth across the channeled scablands, asking local geologists difficult questions that no one else seems to have considered, and building a formidable case. The sort of case, I suspect, that Bretz would be making if he were still with us and at the height of his powers. I first met Randall in 2006. The North American Ice Age floods were amongst the subjects we discussed, and I was startled to discover that he didn't accept the ice dam theory at all and regarded Glacial Lake Missoula as a huge diversion, an easy solution that panders to uniformitarian prejudices and has led geologists away from the truth. In the years that followed, we corresponded from time to time and occasionally bumped into each other at conferences where we were both speaking. I was enormously impressed by his depth of knowledge, by his field experience, and by the intriguing new insights his research seemed to offer into the mysterious events that brought the Ice Age to an end. I found we shared a particular and growing interest in the younger Dryas, that return to full glacial conditions that began suddenly 12,800 years ago, just when the world seemed to be warming up, and that ended equally suddenly 1,200 years later. During this peculiar episode, certain Stone Age hunter-gatherer peoples such as the Clovis culture of North America vanished from the archaeological record, and there were mass extinctions of animal species, so clearly something unusual was going on. Yet no uniformitarian or gradualist explanations have ever been offered. Moreover, although I didn't investigate it in my 1995 book Fingerprints of the Gods, I realized afterwards that the span of the Younger Dryas from 12,800 years ago to 11,600 years ago coincided exactly with the window during which I had argued that an advanced civilization of prehistoric antiquity was obliterated from the face of the earth and lost from human memory. Accordingly, in my book Underworld, published in 2002, I was more attentive to the Younger Dryas problem. At around 13,000 years ago, I noted, the long period of uninterrupted warming that the world had just passed through, and that had greatly intensified according to some studies between 15,000 years ago and 13,000 years ago, was instantly brought to a halt, all at once, everywhere, by a global cold event known to paleoclimatologists as the Younger Dryas. In many ways mysterious and unexplained, this was an almost unbelievably fast climatic reversion, from conditions that are calculated to have been warmer and wetter than today's 13,000 years ago to conditions that were colder and drier than those at the last glacial maximum just a few hundred years later. From that moment, around 12,800 years ago, it was as though an enchantment of ice had gripped the earth. In many areas that had been approaching terminal meltdown, full glacial conditions were restored with breathtaking rapidity and all the gains that had been made since the LGM, last glacial maximum around 21,000 years ago, were simply stripped away. Temperatures fell back on the order of 8 to 15 degrees centigrade, with half this brutal decline possibly occurring within decades. The polar front in the North Atlantic redescended to the level of Cabo Finisterre in northwest Spain, and glaciers re-advanced in the high mountain chains 
with respect to temperature, the setback to full glacial conditions was nearly complete. For human populations at the time, in many except the most accidentally favoured parts of the world, the sudden and inexplicable plunge into severe cold and aridity must have been devastating. The sense of mystery and mortal danger to mankind that clung about the younger Dryas continued to intrigue me, encouraging me to read up on it and try to understand it better. I recall a number of conversations and email exchanges with Randall after 2006 that focused on the subject, and it became increasingly obvious to me that the Younger Dryas had been a global cataclysm in every meaningful sense of the term. It wasn't until 2013, however, when Randall made the case to me that North America, and particularly the Channeled Scablands, had stood at the epicenter of that cataclysm, that I decided it was time to see the evidence on the ground. On impulse, I invited him to join me on a field trip. It took more than a year to find a time that worked for both our schedules, but finally, in September 2014, I met Randall in Portland, Oregon, and we took off east and north into neighboring Washington State to explore the Scablands in the big red four-wheel drive we'd hired. Chapter 4. Journey Through the Scablands We're on a... 2,500-mile, 4,000-kilometer road trip from Portland, Oregon to Minneapolis, Minnesota. The journey would be shorter if we took the direct route, but we're stopping and diverting into coolies and river valleys and around buttes and up the sides of mountains and across the channeled scablands immediately south of the vast Cordilleran and Laurentide ice caps that once covered much of North America. The objective is for me to get as full an understanding as possible of what happened here, and by the fourth day, when we reach dry falls in the middle of the extraordinary scar on the landscape called Grand Coulee, the picture is beginning to become clear. The ground under our feet is ancient black basalt, covered with a thin layer of topsoil. The basalt, extruded by volcanic eruptions between 17 million and 6 million years ago, covers much of the Columbia Plateau and in some places is 2,000 metres, 6,600 feet thick. Not in Grand Coulee, though, because here it's as if some capricious force, perhaps even the hand of God himself, has seized a giant chisel with a blade miles wide, plunged it violently into the earth, and gouged out a sheer-sided gash hundreds of feet deep and almost 60 miles, 96 kilometres long. The chisel, however, was not made of steel, but of immense quantities of rushing, turbulent, debris-laden water that flowed for a few weeks only. The water of Bretz's flood. Grand Coulee, he wrote, affords the greatest example of canyon cutting by glacial streams, not alone for the Columbia Plateau, but for the world. A glacial river three miles in minimum width spilled southward here over the divide and down a steep monoclinal slope, the stream descended nearly 1,000 feet on a grade of approximately 10 degrees. Such a situation is unparalleled even in this region of huge, suddenly initiated high-gradient rivers. At least 10 cubic miles of basalt were excavated and removed. Bretz refers here only to the northern or upper part of Grand Coulee, but the same amount of basalt again was also excavated from lower Grand Coulee as the stream rushed on. Making our way here today, we paused in the Ephrata Erratics Fan, south of the southern end of Lower Grand Coulee, to see where all that basalt excavated by the waters was dumped. It was a chaotic, jumbled, disturbing sight. Disturbing because as far as the eye could see, in all directions across the prairie, lay scattered countless thousands, more likely millions, of jagged, broken basalt boulders, some about the size of a family car, some smaller, down to the size of a football, and many larger. Everything was reduced to rubble, Randall Carson explained to me as we stood there in the midst of the fan, and that's what you're seeing. This rubble was part of the former world. The former world? Yes, the antediluvian world. And what's lying here on the surface is just a fraction of what the flood flushed out of Grand Coulee. The rubble goes down deep, hundreds of feet deep. From the Ephrata Fan, we drove north on Washington State Route 17 into Lower Grand Coulee, its sheer forbidding basalt cliffs rearing up on either side of us. 
The grey rain clouds above reflected darkly in the chain of alkaline lakes, Soap Lake, Lenore Lake, Blue Lake and Park Lake, that lie ponded in its floor. Now we've reached Dry Falls at the head of Lower Grand Coulee, and as we get out of the truck, Randall reminds my wife Santa to bring her camera. You're going to see something cataclysmic here, he announces with a mischievous grin. Meet Randall Carlson. You may be too young to remember the 1977 TV series called The Life and Times of Grizzly Adams, but you can always Google it if you weren't here. The eponymous hero, a tough woodsman played by actor Dan Haggerty, was a big, bluff, bearded sort of fellow. And Randall Carlson, by virtue of his enormous beard, his general appearance and his rough, gruff personal style, reminds me of him a lot. Randall lives in Atlanta, Georgia now but he spent most of his youth in rural Minnesota, and his voice still carries the quirky undertones of Scandinavian and German that make the Minnesota accent so recognizable. He grew up on the shores of Schmidt Lake, one of tens of thousands of small meltwater lakes spread across Minnesota and Wisconsin, and he used to go fishing there as a boy, perched on a huge boulder that he afterwards understood to be a glacial erratic a boulder quarried from bedrock and carried by an advancing glacier, perhaps many hundreds of miles from its source, to be deposited in a location far removed from its origin. Today, half a century on from his boyhood, he says that the Midwestern landscapes of his youth have left an indelible imprint on his psyche. From these early experiences, I entered into a sort of dialogue with the earth, which continues unabated to this day. This dialogue has involved thousands of hours spent in the field, traversing and studying a wide variety of landscapes, along with thousands of hours in the study of various sciences related in one way or another to the goal of understanding this extraordinary planet upon which we are engaged in this ongoing human experience. It is a fearsomely dynamic planet, one that has undergone profound changes on a scale far exceeding anything within recent times. In fact, I now realize that what we think of as history is merely the record of human events that have transpired since the last great planetary catastrophe. I also understand that the imprint of these catastrophes is to be found all around us, in virtually every environment, and we are just beginning to be able to perceive and decipher the evidence. Randall makes his living as an architect and builder, but his passion is geology. Catastrophist geology. And as those of us who have attended one of his lectures will attest, he knows more about it than pretty much anyone else you are ever likely to meet. He has gleaned his knowledge from a vast reading of the scientific literature, and, as he says above, from thousands of hours of fieldwork. To me, this sort of in-depth, on-the-ground learning, the miles walked through the wilderness, the years of dedicated library research, mean far more than any university degree. Randall is not a geologist and does not claim to be a geologist, but his grasp of the subject is worth a dozen PhDs. And right now, we're standing on a sort of concrete pier with waist-high fencing suspended out over the plunging horseshoe amphitheater of dry falls. There's a chill wind blowing this late September day, and Randall is about to give me a geology lesson. Dry Falls Ever been to Niagara Falls, Randall asks? I confess that I have not. But you've seen photographs? You have a sense of the place? I suppose so, yes. Okay, so just a guess. Which is bigger? He indicates the vista that confronts us. Dry Falls or Niagara? I'm thinking it's a trick question. Randall, being a Minnesotan, is of course compelled to ask trick questions. I look out at the natural amphitheatre. It's a long way down, and a long way across. A couple of circular lakes of pooled rainwater, overgrown with reeds, decorate the base of the towering horseshoe of sheer cliffs confronting me, over which, it is absolutely obvious, huge quantities of water must once have flowed. I haven't been to the Niagara Falls, which are 51 metres high, but I did spend a day of amazement at Victoria Falls in southern Africa, and they're 108 metres high. The classic horseshoe shape of Niagara that you see in all the pictures is repeated at Victoria Falls, and here's the same horseshoe shape in Washington State in the U.S., preserved in the dry fossil of an ancient cataract. Dry Falls is bigger than Niagara, I say, sounding more confident than I feel. 
Okay, good so far, but how much bigger? Twice as big? I hazard a guess. Not bad, Randall says, but actually Dry Falls is close to three times as high as Niagara and more than six times as wide. He points. See how the cliffs are scalloped there? I do. The Dry Falls horseshoe is in fact two horseshoes side by side, one to the east, one to the west. Well, Niagara would easily fit into just half of the eastern horseshoe, and its rim would be almost 250 feet beneath the rim of Dry Falls. Also, look there. Randall draws my attention to the eastern side of the horseshoe, where there's a gap and then a high, narrow fin of cliffs running south. That's Umatilla Rock, he says, indicating the fin. It would have been a kind of island at the peak of the flood, an underwater island. Underwater? Yes. When the flood came through here, the water was more than 500 feet deep. It would have overtopped Umatilla Rock and the falls themselves, and right here where we're standing by, oh, 100, maybe 150 feet. So if I'd been able to stand here then, which you wouldn't have, I know, I'd have been swept away, but just for the sake of argument, if I'd been able to stand here, I take it I wouldn't have seen a sheer sheet of water bursting over the lip of the falls and crashing down hundreds of feet. No, because that was happening far beneath the surface. What you would have seen at this point would have looked more like a whirling, churning slope in the torrent, with some kind of abrupt bump or gradient in it than an actual waterfall but all the work that a waterfall does on rock was still going on under the surface. What do you mean by work on the rock? The water is coming through here in enormous quantities and horribly fast, running at up to 70 miles an hour according to some estimates, and you've got to realise that it isn't just water. It's more like a slurry of thick mud, and there's whole forests torn up by their roots that are roiling around in it and fleets of icebergs jostling on the surface, and down at the bottom there's a huge rumbling rubble of rocky debris, boulders like the ones we saw dumped all over the Afrata fan, and this whole mess is rushing and tumbling and plucking as it passes. Plucking? Yes, that's the best way to describe it, like giant fingers plucking out blocks of the basalt bedrock, ripping them out, dragging them into the torrent and sweeping them downstream. That's how the erosive work is done. Randall gestures again at the scalloped horseshoe cliffs. But what we see from here is less than half the picture. If we were up in an airplane looking down, we'd see another set of horseshoes, even bigger than these ones off to the east, wrapping round beyond Umatilla Rock. So with all that taken into account, what's the total extent of Dry Falls? About three and a half miles. That was where it had got to when the flood stopped. God only knows what it would have ended up looking like or where it would have been today if the flood had continued even for another couple of weeks. I don't understand. The indications are that the flood only lasted a matter of weeks, and throughout that time the falls were constantly migrating northwards. Migrating? Yes, all falls migrate, at different rates, depending on the amount and force of the water flowing over them. They pluck at the bedrock and constantly eat it away upstream. Take Niagara, for example. It's retreated seven miles in the last 12,000 years, but that's puny compared with what happened here, where the retreat was about 30 miles, the whole length of Lower Grand Coulee, in less than a month. So the rate of erosion was incredibly fast. Yes, thousands of times faster than Niagara, because of the incredible amount and force of the water here. Dry Falls was the greatest waterfall that's ever existed on planet Earth. And all that water's supposed to have come out of Glacial Lake Missoula? Well, says Randall, his beard juts out stubbornly, that's the theory. Erratic Hunting Randall doesn't buy the gradualist theory that multiple emptyings of Lake Missoula through multiple breakings and remakings and breaking again of its ice dam can account for the evidence on the ground. He doesn't dispute that the glacial lake existed or that there were outburst floods from it, but he's convinced it was never anywhere near big enough to account for all the cataclysmic features of the channeled scablands like J. Harlan Bretts in the 1920s, he believes that one sudden, short-lived, totally exceptional flood of truly immense proportions was the real culprit. On another day, Randall takes me erratic hunting to explain why. 
we pull off Interstate 97 onto the Waterville Plateau and drive across rugged, rolling country where occasional green and yellow fields intermingle with wilder moorland, too poor ever to be farmed. Pretty soon we start seeing huge clusters, flocks, packs, crowds of giant boulders, all of ominous black basalt, all alien to this landscape, and I know enough now to recognize them for what they are. As ice caps move and spread, they snatch up, enchain, and transport huge rocks that then remain locked within them until the ice melts and drops its load. What happened here? The place is actually called Boulder Park and is recognized as a national natural landmark was a different aspect of the same process. When the Ice Age flood came pouring down over the Waterville Plateau, Randall explains, it was carrying thousands of icebergs with it, icebergs as big as oil tankers with house-sized boulders frozen inside them. When they bumped up against hillsides, he points to a distant ridge with ranks of colossal boulders strewn across it. The icebergs grounded and stuck there. Eventually, after the flood had subsided, they melted out, leaving the boulders where they sit to this day, strewn all over the top of the plateau beyond the ridge and carpeting the hillside for twenty miles going north. But that ridge must be, what, eight hundred, maybe nine hundred feet above us, I observe? Exactly, which tells us that the water was at least that deep here or rather not simply water, but a sludge slurry, and as the flood starts to subside, the slurry just gets thicker and thicker with sediment until it finally leaves the whole valley floor covered in sediment, hundreds of feet thick, and filled with embedded boulders. I mean, again, we're looking at the ruins and wreckage of a former world. We get back onto Interstate 97, heading south along the west bank of the majestic Columbia River, and divert west on alternate 97 towards Lake Chelan. Fifty miles long and never more than a mile and a half wide, lying in the bottom of a forested, steep-sided valley overshadowed by lofty mountains, Chelan has the look and feel of a grand Scottish loch. It's appropriate, therefore, that it also has traditions of a lake monster, a dragon, according to Native American legends, that ate up all the game, leaving the people starving. The great spirit was angered and decided to intervene. He descended from the sky and struck the earth with his huge stone knife. All the world shook from his blow. A great cloud appeared over the plain. When the cloud went away, people saw that the land had changed. Huge mountain peaks rose on all sides of them. Among the mountains were canyons. Extending from the northwest to the southeast for a two days journey was a very deep canyon. The great spirit threw the monster's body into this deep and long gorge. Then he poured much water into it and so formed the lake. Long afterwards, Indians called it Chilan. Chilan means deep water in the local Salish Indian language, and Lake Chilan is indeed 1,468 feet, 453 meters deep, making it the third deepest lake in the U.S. and the 26th deepest in the world. Some aspects of the myth, I note in passing, are evocative of earth changes at the end of the Ice Age. Mountains that had been hidden beneath the ice cap, and that therefore no one had seen before, did indeed appear when the ice melted. Canyons were indeed carved through the whole of the Columbia Plateau by the rushing waters of Brett's flood. And as we will see in the next chapter, there may also be more than meets the eye to the huge stone knife from the sky, striking the ground so hard that the world shook, and to that ominous cloud that appeared over the land. Likewise, the presence of an immense iceberg-rafted erratic above the town of Manson on Chelan's north shore suggests that the notion of much water being poured into the lake, in other words, of a flood passing through here, may also be rooted in memories of real events. After passing more erratics scattered around the southern end of Lake Chelan, we head back to Interstate 97, cross to the east bank of the Columbia River at Beebe Bridge, then go north to the mouth of McNeil Canyon, where yet more boulder-strewn moorland awaits us. Numbering in their thousands, the erratics here are known locally as haystack boulders because of their distinctive appearance but the rounded profile they show from a distance gives way close up to a mass of jagged and splintered basalt. Many of them are thought to weigh more than 10,000 tons, and as Randall and I examine them, I'm daunted by their great height and mass and amazed at the power and energy of the floodwaters that brought them here. 
We get back on Interstate 97 again and drive the 40 miles south to the confluence of the Wenatchee and Columbia Rivers near the eastern foothills of the Cascade Mountains. Here Randall has a last giant erratic to show me, this one weighing, he estimates, 18,000 tons. It stands high up on the side of a long, wide valley, looming over a modern housing development, hundreds of feet above the confluence of the rivers and the town of Wenatchee. We scramble to the top of the erratic so we can look down on the rivers glistening far below. Obviously, Randall explains, the floodwaters must have filled the whole valley from bottom to top. So when the iceberg floated in, it stranded right here, then melted away and left this sitting on the ridge. And the flood itself? Where did it go next? The water coming down through here met the water coming out of Grand Coulee and Moses Coulee and many other Scabland channels and then it all together flowed down to Pasco Basin and Wallula Gap. Black Rain The next day finds us on top of a high bluff overlooking Wallula Gap. So the water here rose up to roughly 1,200 feet above sea level, Randall says. He consults his GPS. And where we're standing now is 1,150 feet above sea level, so the flood would have been 50 feet over our heads. And the water came from which direction? Randall points north. It came roaring out of the channeled scablands. A mass of different flows converged here and then passed on through down the Columbia. So this was the gathering of the waters. Here's where all these great flood streams came together. I look out over the scene below. A drama of earth and sky and water. The sky is grey, thunderous and filled with rain as it has been throughout our trip. The earth element begins with a very thick, powdery layer of soft, dun-coloured dust called loess that lies everywhere under our feet on the top of the bluff. But then the bluff plunges away in a steep, tumbling fall down to the Columbia, which forms the water element below. Across the stream, more than a mile wide here, the terrain rises again towards the east, not so sheer as on the west side where we're standing, still covered by that same thick layer of powdery loess and marked in addition by distinctive scabland topography, with cliffs plunging into valleys and a series of outcrops carved by the ancient floods, most prominently the two isolated basalt pillars known as the Twin Sisters that stand directly opposite us. Those Twin Sisters, Randall explains, are a remnant. Look there, immediately to the left of the sisters you can see a shelf. That would have all been continuous. I believe that was the pre-flood valley floor. When the flood hit, it ripped through here and lowered the valley floor by about 200 feet based on the present depth of the river and the height of the Twin Sisters. Had the flood continued for a week longer, the twins would have been washed away as well. They would have been about 800 feet under water. And really, if you look across there, way above the level of the Sisters, you'll see that uppermost crop of basalt roughly at our level. That would have been the high water mark, and everything below that was underwater at the peak of the flood. So what you're seeing over there in the scabland around the sisters is that spectacular erosion of the basalt by the water just ripping through here at 60 or 70 miles an hour because the back pressure would have been so great. Fearsome and ferocious flows, I hazard. Oh my God, yes, Randall replies. Like an inland sea, except that it's moving. And it's turbulent and it's angry. Yes, says Randall and the turbulence is increasing massively as it comes up to this constriction at Waluda Gap. But when you look at the capacity of this valley, it would have had to have been a hell of a lot of water pouring in from the north to back flood to the extent that it did. The valley out of Lake Missoula is no bigger than this one, and it's 200 miles north of here. So how could that water have spilled out of Lake Missoula, travelled 200 miles to here, and not have attenuated to the degree that it would just pass through without ponding above the gap? But it did pond, massively and deeply, as we can tell from the high water mark, and that, to me, is just incontrovertible evidence that there was more water pouring into this than could ever have been pouring out of Lake Missoula. So, I summarize, we have water 1,200 feet deep which flows through here turbulently. Very turbulently, Randall agrees. And then how long does it stay that deep? The estimates are that it's probably one to three weeks, offers Randall and then it begins to ebb away, because they call this hydraulic ponding. 
This was effectively a hydraulic dam in the sense that the water itself forced through a constriction like Waluda Gap becomes a kind of dam, and especially so since the water here was filled with massive icebergs. All throughout the flood pathway are erratics that were carried by icebergs, all the way down into Eugene, Oregon. You've got to picture it. You've got a moving sea, choked with thousands of icebergs. I'm getting the picture all right. Wild scene, I say. Wild scene, Randall agrees. All of these icebergs are jostling up against each other and getting jammed in the gap. And what that's going to do is cause the water level to rise still further until the pressure increases enough to push the whole mass down through the gap. Then the water level drops until the next jam occurs. So I think what we're seeing is a pulsating hydrograph that every time it rises, it backfloods further up the valley and then the water level drops and then it rises again. The next point I put to Randall, closely connected to the vision of the flooded hell world that he's just conjured up, relates to the central enigma I wish to explore in the rest of this section, but which I have not yet placed before the reader. It concerns the growing body of evidence that 12,800 years ago, a giant comet, travelling on an orbit that took it through the inner solar system, broke up into multiple fragments, and that many of these fragments, some more than a mile, 2.4 kilometres in diameter, hit the Earth. It is believed that North America was the epicentre of the resulting cataclysm, with several of the largest impacts on the North American ice cap causing floods and tidal waves and throwing a vast cloud of dust into the upper atmosphere that enshrouded the Earth, preventing the sun's rays from reaching the surface and thus initiating the sudden, mysterious, global deep freeze that geologists call the Younger Dryas. We'll go into the evidence for all this and how it relates to Brett's flood which might not, after all, have emerged from Lake Missoula, in the chapters that follow. But for now, please bear with me as I play out the rest of my conversation with Randall at Wallula Gap. And there's been a comet impact, I say, so we're expecting that the sky is going to be bad too. Oh, it's got to be, Randall replies. Dark, I think about it, then add. Lots of stuff wafted up there by the impact. Stuff. Randall kicks a furrow in the soft dust with the toe of his hiking boot. That's what I think this six-foot layer of Lois is. All over the flood areas you see this six, seven, eight-foot thick layer of Lois and clearly it rained down out of the atmosphere. Like the legends of Contiki Viracocha, I name the South American civilizing hero, white-skinned and bearded like Quetzalcoatl and the Apkalu sages described in Chapter 1, who was said to have come to the Andes during a terrifying period, thousands of years in the past, when the earth had been inundated by a great flood and plunged into darkness by the disappearance of the sun. Exactly like Quetzalcoatl in Mexico and the Apkalu sages in Mesopotamia, Viracocha's civilizing mission in the Andes had been to bring laws and a moral code to the survivors of the disaster and to teach them the skills of agriculture, architecture and engineering. Ah, yes, Randall muses, the legends of Viracocha. Wasn't there something about a black rain? There was, absolutely, a thick black rain. It's pretty much universal to the flood myths I've studied. Randall kicks the Lois again. This stuff is puzzling, you know. It has a kind of vertical structure. Most theories suggest that it's windborne, but the vertical structure is inconsistent with that. I'm developing an idea that it's actually both water and windborne because I think that the final rainout after the comet hit the ice cap was essentially a rainout of mud. There would have been a huge injection of superheated water into the stratosphere, filthy, particle-laden water, which would have then spread rather like the debris cloud of a nuclear explosion, and the end result would undoubtedly have been a very intense and prolonged rainout. But did a comet hit the Earth 12,800 years ago? As we'll see in the next chapter, the evidence assembled by an international team of highly credentialed scientists is taking the comfortable world of gradualist, uniformitarian geology by storm. Chapter 5. Nanodiamonds are forever. Continuing our journey east through the northern states of the U.S. after leaving Washington and driving across the Idaho panhandle, Randall made a point of showing me some of the spectacular features of Camas Prairie in western Montana. 
there what looked to the unpractised eye like a series of colossal dunes, march in serried ranks across the flat yellow floor of an elliptical basin twelve miles long and ten miles wide in the midst of the rocky mountains. But the dunes, it turns out, are not dunes at all. Instead, they're giant current ripples, some more than fifty feet high and three hundred feet long, formed at the end of the Ice Age when Camas Prairie was part of the bed of Glacial Lake Missoula and lay under about one thousand four hundred feet of water. Geologists are agreed that the ripples were shaped by powerful currents set in motion when the lake drained catastrophically. And I don't dispute it, Randall says, as we stand on a vantage point above the prairie. A largely deserted highway runs through the floor of the ancient basin, but now as a vehicle appears providing scale, I see that it's dwarfed to matchbox size by the ripples. So, I ask, you have nothing against the existence of Lake Missoula as such, or the notion that it did drain catastrophically? No, nothing at all, Randall replies. I have no doubt there were dozens of joculops out of Lake Missoula. Some were even pretty big. My point, though, is that none of them were of sufficient size to cause the spectacular flood damage that we've seen in the channeled scablands. That was done by an event orders of magnitude bigger than anything Lake Missoula could provide. So, yes, the lake was dammed by ice in the Clark Fork Valley, just as the gradualists maintain. And, yes, that ice dam did break frequently over a period of a few thousand years, say from 15,000 years ago down to about 13,000 years ago. But the amount of water released in these periodic floods was minuscule, just a drop in the bucket compared to the final event in which Lake Missoula was also involved, of course, but definitely not as the main culprit. And that final event had to do with the impact of our comet? I've started calling it ours, but it's usually referred to in the scientific literature as the Clovis Comet, or the Younger Dryas Comet. You bet, Randall replies, but not just one impact, multiple impacts. I'm guessing as many as four of the fragments, each of them maybe half a mile across, maybe bigger, hit the Cordilleran and Laurentide ice caps in a sort of scattergun effect, and caused just a massive amount of instantaneous melting. The meltwater was everywhere, in enormous quantities. Naturally, some of it cascaded into Lake Missoula, filling it up suddenly and causing it to burst its ice dam, thus adding its contents to the much bigger floods that were already sweeping down from the north. So Lake Missoula was more of an innocent bystander, really, than the culprit. Randall chuckles. Yes, that's right. The lake was the innocent bystander that was in the way and that later got accused of the crime. But the comet was the culprit. Conspiracy Corner I'm no conspiracy theorist, but I have a sneaking feeling, nothing more, that something a bit like a conspiracy is at work in science to prevent the proper consideration and wide public uptake of catastrophist ideas. I gave the example of J. Harlan Bretz in Chapter 3, the frosty and deeply unpleasant reception initially given to his findings, the years that he spent in academic limbo afterwards, the repeated persistent efforts made by a host of scholars to dismiss his evidence entirely, or failing that to account for it by gradualist means. And then at last, years later, when all that had failed and the notion of outburst floods from glacial Lake Missoula had offered itself as a solution, the realization that he had been right all along, but not right, not right under any circumstances, not right in any imaginable universe on the issue of the single cataclysmic debacle that his instincts had originally led him to. If J. Harlan Bretz was to be right, then it was necessary that he should be right in a politically correct way, in other words, in a way that could be redacted by skilled uniformitarian spinmeisters to edit out any hint of lurking cosmic disaster. Indeed, within the fantasy of such a conspiracy, I sincerely hope it is a fantasy, the Joculaup's idea is an exceptionally useful one. First of all, it provides what purports to be a wholesomely rational, sober, and above all, scientific account of the tortured geological features witnessed by Bretts in the Scablands. Secondly, Joculaups happen every year in various parts of the world today, and thus do not violate the commandment that existing processes, acting as at present, must be held sufficient to account for all geological changes. Thirdly, present relevance can be assigned. The Ice Age floods need not be simply of scholarly interest. 
Since joculabs still occur in the 21st century, science can be brought to bear to anticipate and ameliorate their effects. All of this might start to look like a very effective diversion from the truth, if the truth is that a cataclysm, a single, prodigious cataclysm, did occur at the end of the Ice Age, and might, furthermore, recur. What, in other words, if the Ojibwa prophecy is true? What if the star with the long white tail is indeed going to destroy the world some day, when it comes low again? Would those who know this benefit from sharing their knowledge with others? Or might they think it served their interests better to keep quiet about the whole thing? We'll return to this in Chapter 19. By comparison, the question we have to ask and answer first is much simpler. Was the Younger Dryas cold event that began so suddenly and so mysteriously 12,800 years ago brought on by the effects of a large comet hitting the Earth? The Evidence for the Comet The Younger Dryas, YD, impact hypothesis, as its proponents restated it in a keynote paper in the Journal of Geology in September 2014, proposes that a major cosmic impact event occurred at the Younger Dryas boundary, YDB, 12,800 years ago. The paper, as we will see, presented a mass of new evidence in support of the hypothesis, in particular confirming and greatly extending earlier evidence of the copious presence of nanodiamonds in samples from the Younger Dryas boundary layer taken in many different countries. Nanodiamonds are microscopic diamonds that form under rare conditions of great shock, pressure and heat and are recognized as being amongst the characteristic fingerprints, proxies in scientific language, of powerful impacts by comets or asteroids. By 2014, when the Journal of Geology paper was published, debate over whether or not a comet impact was involved in setting off the Younger Dryas had been raging for seven years. The first headline that caught my eye was in New Scientist magazine of the 22nd of May 2007, and asked provocatively, did a comet wipe out prehistoric Americans? At that time, 2007, I was taking a break from the lost civilization mystery that had absorbed my energies and been the subject of so many of my books for so long. The New Scientist article tweaked my curiosity, however, because it referred to the exact epoch that I had focused on in my books. The article didn't speak of a lost civilization, but began with a reference to the so-called Clovis culture of North America, which, as we saw in Chapter 3, vanished from the archaeological record during the Younger Dryas between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. The Clovis people, the article observed, flourishing some 13,000 years ago, had a mastery of stone weaponry that stood them in good stead against the constant threat of large carnivores such as American lions and giant short-faced bears. It's unlikely, however, that they thought death would come from the sky. According to results presented by a team of 25 researchers this week at the American Geophysical Union meeting in Acapulco, Mexico, that's where the Clovis people's doom came from. Citing several lines of evidence, the team suggests that a wayward comet hurtled into the Earth's atmosphere around 12,900 years ago. Note, that date would later be revised downwards by a hundred years to 12,800 years ago. Fractured into pieces and exploded in giant fireballs. Debris seems to have settled as far afield as Europe. As I read on, I learnt that the team the article was referring to was composed of highly credentialed and eminently respectable mainstream scientists. Jim Kennett, an oceanographer at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and one of the team's three principal investigators, claims immense wildfires scorched North America in the aftermath, killing large populations of mammals and bringing an abrupt end to the Clovis culture. The entire continent was on fire, he says. Lead team member Richard Firestone, a nuclear analytical chemist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California, says the evidence lies in a narrow 12,900-year-old carbon-rich layer of sediment found at eight well-dated Clovis-era sites and a peppering of sediment cores across North America as well as one site in Belgium. Probed as to why no crater had yet been identified with this hypothetical impact 12,900 years ago, a third team member, 
Arizona-based geophysicist Alan West, suggested that smaller, low-density parts of the comet would have exploded in the atmosphere, while larger fragments might have crashed into the two-mile-deep ice cap that covered North America at that time. Such craters, West observed, would have been ice-walled and basically melted away at the end of the last ice age, leaving few traces. The article went on to explain that the sediment samples the team's evidence focused on contained several different types of debris that could only have come from an extraterrestrial source such as a comet or an asteroid. As well as nanodiamonds, the debris included tiny carbon spherules that form when molten droplets cool rapidly in air, and carbon molecules containing the rare isotope helium-3 far more abundant in the cosmos than on Earth. You might find some other explanation for these individually, says Firestone, but taken together, it's pretty clear that there was an impact. The team says the agent of destruction was probably a comet, since the key sediment layer lacks both the high nickel and iridium levels characteristic of asteroid impacts. Last but not least, the New Scientist article confirmed, all the evidence pointed to North America as the epicenter of the disaster. Levels of the apparent extraterrestrial debris, for example, are highest at the Ganey Archaeological Site in Michigan, just beyond the southern reach of North America's primary ice sheet 12,900 years ago. Moreover, levels decrease the further you go from Ganey, suggesting that the comet blew up largely over Canada. In other words, largely over the ice cap that covered the northern half of North America during the Ice Age the source of all the meltwater that scarred and hacked the scablands of Washington State in Brett's flood. Whether or not that meltwater came exclusively from Lake Missoula or gushed forth in far larger quantities than Lake Missoula alone could ever have held. Brett's himself, as we've seen, was forced to abandon his own strong intuition that there had been a single massive meltwater flood in favor of multiple flushings of limited amounts of meltwater out of Lake Missoula again and again over thousands of years. The primary reason he embraced this theory, however, was not that he had become a convert to gradualism, but because he was never able to explain how a large enough area of the ice cap to supply all the vast amounts of water needed for his flood could simply have melted all at once. He had proposed two possibilities, dramatic overnight global warming on the one hand or volcanic activity under the ice cap on the other, but as the reader will recall, he very quickly conceded there was no evidence for either. What Bretz did not consider, and could not consider, because the supporting evidence only began to come in a quarter of a century after his death, was the possibility that the ice cap could have undergone cataclysmic melting as a result of a comet impact. If only Bretts had known. A few months after the article appeared in New Scientist, the Clovis Comet team published a detailed paper on their findings. It appeared in the prestigious Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, on the 9th of October 2007. Despite the sober setting, the headline was dramatic. Evidence for an extraterrestrial impact 12,900 years ago that contributed to the megafaunal extinctions and the younger Dryas cooling. A carbon-rich layer, summarized the team, dating to around 12,900 years ago, has previously been identified at Clovis Age sites across North America and appears contemporaneous with the abrupt onset of the younger Dryas YD cooling. The in-situ bones of extinct Pleistocene megafauna, along with Clovis tool assemblages, occur below this black layer, but not within or above it. Causes for the extinctions, YD cooling, and termination of Clovis culture have long been controversial. In this paper, we provide evidence for an extraterrestrial ET impact event close to 12,900 years ago which we hypothesized caused abrupt environmental changes that contributed to YD cooling, major ecological reorganization, broad-scale extinctions, and rapid human behavioral shifts at the end of the Clovis period. Clovis Age sites in North America are overlain by a thin, discrete layer with varying peak abundances of 1. magnetic grains with iridium, 2. magnetic microspherules, 3. charcoal, four, soot, five, carbon spherules, six, glass-like carbon containing nanodiamonds, 
and seven fullerenes with ET helium, all of which are evidence for an ET impact and associated biomass burning circa 12,900 years ago. We propose that one or more large, low-density ET objects exploded over northern North America, partially destabilizing the Laurentide ice sheet and triggering YD cooling. The shock wave, thermal pulse, and event-related environmental effects, e.g. extensive biomass burning and food limitations, contributed to megafaunal extinctions. Nor were the mammoths, mastodons, ground sloths, horses, camels, giant beaver, and other megafauna alone. In total, it is particularly striking that no less than 35 genera of mammals, with each genus consisting of several species, became extinct in North America between 12,900 and 11,600 years ago. In other words, precisely during the mysterious Younger Dryas cold event. What was now emerging, therefore, was an explanation both for the sudden onset of the Younger Dryas itself and for the accompanying extinctions, and perhaps for much else besides, including the cataclysmic flooding that left its marks on the channeled scablands of Washington State. This seemed all the more plausible when I learned that Firestone, Kennett and West's proposal for their comet was that it was a conglomeration of impactors, including one that might have been as much as four kilometers, two and a half miles in diameter. Furthermore, that four-kilometer object would itself have been just one amongst multiple fragments, resulting from the earlier disintegration, while still in orbit, of a giant comet up to 100 kilometers or more in diameter. Many of the fragments of the parent comet, including some of great size as we'll see in Chapter 19, remained in orbit. Those that hit the Earth at the onset of the Younger Dryas underwent further explosive fragmentation accompanied by powerful airbursts that would themselves have had cataclysmic effects as they entered the atmosphere over Canada. Nonetheless, the authors thought it likely that a number of large impactors up to two kilometers in diameter would have remained intact to collide with the ice cap. There, as West had earlier told New Scientist, any craters would have been transient, leaving few permanent traces on the ground after the ice had melted. Lasting evidence, the PNAS paper added, may have been limited to enigmatic depressions or disturbances in the Canadian Shield, for example under the Great Lakes or Hudson Bay. Summarizing the damage, the authors envisaged a devastating high-temperature shock wave with extreme overpressure followed by underpressure, resulting in intense winds traveling across North America at hundreds of kilometers an hour, accompanied by powerful, impact-generated vortices. In addition, whether single or multiple objects collided with the Earth, a hot fireball would have immersed the region near the impacts. At greater distances, the re-entry of high-speed superheated ejecta would have induced extreme wildfires which would have decimated forests and grasslands, destroying the food supplies of herbivores and producing charcoal, soot, toxic fumes and ash. And how might all this have caused the dramatic cooling of the Younger Dryas? The authors offered many mechanisms operating together amongst the most prominent of these being the huge plume of water vapor from the melted ice cap that would have been cast into the upper atmosphere, combined with immense quantities of dust and debris composed of the impactor, ice sheet detritus, and the underlying crust, as well as the smoke and soot from continent-wide wildfires. Taken in sum, it's quite easy to understand how so much lofted debris could, as the authors propose, have led to cooling by blockage of sunlight. Meanwhile, the water vapor, smoke, soot and ice would have promoted the growth of persistent cloudiness and noctilucent clouds, leading to reduced sunlight and surface cooling, thus reducing the solar insulation at high latitudes, increasing snow accumulation and causing further cooling in the feedback loop. Severe and devastating enough in themselves, these factors nonetheless pale into insignificance when compared with the consequences of the hypothesized impacts on the ice cap. The largest potential effect would have been impact-related partial destabilization and or melting of the ice sheet. In the short term, this would have suddenly released meltwater and rafts of ice into the North Atlantic and Arctic oceans, lowering ocean salinity with consequent surface cooling. 
the longer-term cooling effects would have resulted largely from the consequent weakening of thermohaline circulation in the northern Atlantic, sustaining YD cooling for more than a thousand years until the feedback mechanisms restored ocean circulation. Impact-related partial destabilization and or melting of the ice sheet and on a scale capable of disrupting the circulation of the world's oceans for more than a thousand years, this matter of thermohaline circulation is an important one that requires explanation. We'll return to it. But what most struck me in the paragraph quoted above was that the authors had only considered the consequences of the huge quantities of icebergs and meltwater dumped into the oceans north and east of the epicenter of their proposed comet impacts. They did not consider the effects of that gigantic icy flood on the lands lying immediately south of the ice cap, which most certainly would not have been spared. Once again, I found myself wondering how J. Harlan Bretz might have reacted if information about a possible comet impact had been at his disposal during his lifetime. I can't prove it, of course, but I think he would have been much less likely to be seduced by Lake Missoula gradualism, and much more likely, now that a credible heat source had been provided, to stick to his catastrophist guns. A single cataclysmic meltwater flood on a truly gigantic scale coming directly off the ice cap to scour the scablands, begins to look very feasible indeed in the light of the case made by Firestone West, Kennett, and the large team of scientists working with them. Meanwhile, my own hypothesis of an advanced civilization of prehistoric antiquity obliterated from the face of the earth during the younger Dryas window is also strengthened by their work. For if their calculations are correct... The explosive power of the Younger Dryas comet would have been of the order of 10 million megatons. That makes it 2 million times greater in its effects than the former USSR's Tsar Bomba, the largest nuclear weapon ever tested, and a thousand times greater than the estimated explosive power, 10,000 megatons, of all nuclear devices stockpiled in the world today a global disaster of such magnitude at exactly the time I suggested in Fingerprints of the Gods, does not prove the existence of a lost civilization of the Ice Age, but does at least provide us with a mechanism large enough, if such a civilization did exist, to have obliterated it almost entirely from human memory. The evidence continues to mount. Because it has such important ramifications for almost everything we think we know about the safety and security of the Earth's cosmic environment and about our own past, it is reasonable to ask how solid the Younger Dryas Comet Impact Theory really is. Since 2007, when it was first proposed, how has it stood up to scientific scrutiny and what new evidence has been brought forward in support of it? The answer is that it has stood the test of time well, and benefited from a steady accumulation of new evidence set out in the proper way in the scientific literature and subject to rigorous peer review. There is neither space nor need here to explore this extensive literature in depth, but to give the general picture, I'll list the dates and titles of a few of the more important papers, with brief summaries of the conclusions and full references in the footnotes. 2008 Wildfire and Abrupt Ecosystem Disruption on California's Northern Channel Islands at the Alarod-Younger Dryas Boundary. Evidence for ecosystem disruption at 13,000 to 12,900 years ago on these offshore islands is consistent with the Younger Dryas Boundary Cosmic Impact Hypothesis. 2009. Shock Synthesized Hexagonal Diamonds in Younger Dryas Boundary Sediments. The presence of shock synthesized hexagonal and other nanometer-sized diamonds in YDB sediments in association with soot and other wildfire indicators is consistent with the cosmic impact at 12,900 years ago and the hypothesis that the Earth crossed paths with a swarm of comets or carbonaceous chondrites producing air shocks and or surface impacts that contributed to abrupt ecosystem disruption and megafaunal extinctions in North America. 2010. Discovery of a nanodiamond-rich layer in the Greenland ice sheet. The presence of rounded nanodiamonds and lonsdaleite in Greenland ice suggests that a large cosmic impact occurred. 
the existence of this layer appears consistent with the occurrence of a major impact event that correlates with the nanodiamond-rich YDB in North America at 12,900 years ago. 2010. Paleolithic extinctions and the Torrid complex. Intersection with the debris of a large 50 to 100 kilometer short period comet during the Upper Paleolithic provides a satisfactory explanation for the catastrophe of celestial origin which has been postulated to have occurred around 12,900 years ago and which presaged a return to Ice Age conditions of about 1,300 years duration. The Torrid complex appears to be the debris of this erstwhile comet. It includes about 19 of the brightest near-Earth objects. Note, the implications of this important paper by astronomer Bill Napier of the Centre for Astrobiology at the University of Cardiff, Wales, UK, will be considered in greater detail in Chapter 19. 2010. Evidence for a cosmogenic origin of fired glaciofluvial beds in the northwestern Andes. Correlation with experimentally heated quartz and feldspar. Fired sediment, considered equivalent to the black mat impact of 12,900 years ago, has been located and analysed in the Andes of northwestern Venezuela. The black mat refers to possible fallout from the Enki comet airburst presumed to have occurred over the Laurentide ice sheet, the impact spreading ejecta over large portions of North America and Europe, making it an interhemispheric event of considerable magnitude. The presence of copious monazite in the carbonaceous coatings is considered part of the incoming ejecta, as it is not a common indicator mineral in the local lithology. The intergrowth of carbonaceous black matte material with thermally disrupted and fragmented quartz and feldspar, a welded patina of 100 to 400 nanometers in thickness, could only have occurred with temperatures in excess of 900 degrees centigrade, the event here interpreted to be of cosmogenic origin. 2011. Framboidal iron oxide, chondrite-like material from the black mat, Murray Springs, Arizona. At the end of the Pleistocene, a younger dryass black mat was deposited on top of the Pleistocene sediments in many parts of North America. A study of the magnetic fraction from the basal section of the black mat at Murray Springs, Arizona, revealed the presence of amorphous iron oxide framboids in a glassy iron-silica matrix. Our data suggests that the observed textures are due to a shock event that fractured and largely amorphized the grains. Therefore, we argue that these particles are the product of a hypervelocity impact event. 2012. Evidence from central Mexico supporting the younger Dryas extraterrestrial impact hypothesis. We report the discovery in Lake Quitzeo in central Mexico of a black carbon-rich lacustrine layer containing nanodiamonds, microspherules, and other unusual materials that date to the early Younger Dryas. We find the evidence cannot be explained by any known terrestrial mechanism. It is, however, consistent with the Younger Dryas boundary impact hypothesis, postulating a major extraterrestrial impact involving multiple airbursts and or ground impacts, at 12,900 years ago. 2012. Very high temperature impact melt products as evidence for cosmic airbursts and impacts 12,900 years ago. We examined sediment sequences from 18 dated Younger Dryas boundary YDB sites across three continents. All sites display abundant microspherules in the YDB, with none or few above and below. In addition, three sites display vesicular, high-temperature, silicea scoria like objects, or SLOs, that match the spherules geochemically. Our observations indicate that YDB objects are similar to material produced in nuclear airbursts, impact crater plumes and cosmic airbursts, and strongly support the hypothesis of multiple cosmic airbursts impacts at 12,900 years ago. Data presented here require that thermal radiation from air shocks was sufficient to melt surface sediments at temperatures up to or greater than the boiling point of quartz, 2,200 degrees centigrade. 2013. Large PT anomaly in the Greenland ice core points to a cataclysm at the onset of Younger Dryas. 
One explanation of the abrupt cooling episode known as the Younger Dryas, YD, is a cosmic impact or airburst at the YD boundary that triggered cooling and resulted in other calamities. We tested the YD impact hypothesis by analysing ice samples from the Greenland Ice Sheet Project 2, GISP2, ice core across the Bolling Alarod YD boundary for major and trace elements. We found a large platinum PT anomaly at the YDB. Circumstantial evidence hints at an extraterrestrial source, perhaps a metal impactor with an unusual composition. 2013. New evidence from a black matte site in the northern Andes supporting a cosmic impact 12,800 years ago. The spherules from Venezuela are morphologically and compositionally identical to YDB spherules documented elsewhere on three continents, North America, Europe and Asia, confirming the YDB magnetic spherule results of previous researchers. Their microstructural texturing indicates they formed from melting and rapid quenching. Thus the most likely origin of the spherules seems to be by cosmic impact airburst 12,800 years ago, with interhemispheric consequences. The site in Venezuela, along with one in Peru, are the two southernmost sites currently known to display evidence for the YDB impact event, and these sites represent the first evidence that the effects of the impact event extended into South America and even into the southern hemisphere. 2014 Nanodiamond-rich layer across three continents consistent with major cosmic impact at 12,800 Carl BP. A major cosmic impact event has been proposed at the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling episode at 12,800 years, plus or minus 150 years before the present, forming the Younger Dryas boundary, YDB, layer, distributed across up to 50 million square kilometres on four continents in 24 dated stratigraphic sections in 10 countries of the Northern Hemisphere, the YDB layer contains a clearly defined abundance peak in nanodiamonds, NDs, a major cosmic impact proxy. The large body of evidence now obtained about YDB NDs is strongly consistent with an origin by cosmic impact around 12,800 years ago and is inconsistent with formation of YDB ND by natural terrestrial processes, including wildfires, anthropogenesis, and or influx of cosmic dust. Note, this paper and its important implications will be discussed in more detail later in this chapter. Taking on the dogmatic uniformitarians. One would have thought, with such an impressive accumulation of evidence, that the Younger Dryas impact theory would by now be fully accepted, and that researchers would have moved on to a broader consideration of the implications of such a recent and hitherto unsuspected global cataclysm for our understanding of the history of the Earth and of our own species. However, we've already seen from the example of J. Harlan Bretz how scientists wedded to the uniformitarian and gradualist reference frame react with extreme negative force to catastrophist theories. Nor was Bretz an exception. Alfred Wegener, who first proposed the notion of continental drift, plate tectonics, was similarly pilloried, as subsequently were Lewis and Walter Alvarez, the Chicxulub KT impact, Stephen J. Gould, punctuated equilibrium, Victor Klub and Bill Napier, coherent catastrophism, and James Lovelock, Sherwood Rowland, Mario Molina and Lynn Margulis for their contributions to geophysiology and the Gaia theory. It should come as no surprise, therefore, that Richard Firestone, Alan West, James Kennett and others who have followed the evidence and stuck their necks out to suggest that a comet impact caused the Younger Dryas have also come under sustained and bitter attack. Indeed, the triumphant crowing of critics who clearly believe they have done away once and for all with the heretical catastrophism of Firestone, West and Kennett has filled the academic air several times in the past few years. On each occasion, you can almost hear the collective sigh of relief as if to say, thank God, we finally got those bastards. But then a few months later comes the devastating and absolutely convincing refutation that forces the critics back to the drawing board. This is why eight years of sustained attacks have only served to prove again and again that the science behind the theory of the Younger Dryas Comet is good. 
It's quite noticeable, reviewing the literature, that academics form themselves into gangs. The ringleaders in the anti-YD comet camp, whose names appear frequently at the top of critical articles, include Mark Boslow, a physicist on the technical staff of Sandia National Laboratories, and Nicholas Pinter, a geology professor at Southern Illinois University. In 2012, they teamed up with half a dozen other scientists to publish a paper entitled Arguments and Evidence Against a Younger Dryas Impact Event. And a year earlier, Pinter and some of the authors of the 2012 attack had joined forces to write a paper hubristically entitled The Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, a Requiem. To paraphrase Mark Twain, reports of the death of the comet theory have been greatly exaggerated. For example, one of the key critiques made by Boslow et al. in their 2012 article was that magnetic microspherule abundance results published by the impact proponents have not been reproducible by other workers. Analysis of the same YD site stratigraphy by Suraval et al. 2009 could not replicate observations for two of the impact markers published by Firestone et al. 2007. The study by Suraval et al. 2009, found no peaks of abundance unique to the YD time interval. But the impact proponents were later able to show that Boslow and his co-authors neglected to cite nine independent spherule studies on two continents that reported finding significant YDB spherule abundances. More damning, though, was the fact that when other scientists repeated the analysis of Suraval et al., their findings did indeed support an impact the scientists concluded that the inability of Suravel et al. to find YDB spherule peaks resulted from not adhering to the prescribed extraction protocol. For example, Suravel et al. did not conduct any analyses using scanning electron microscopy, a necessary procedure clearly specified by Firestone et al. A second independent study by Malcolm A. Lecomte et al., noted that Suraval et al. collected and analysed samples from seven YDB sites purportedly using the same protocol as Firestone et al., but did not find a single spherule in YDB sediments at two previously reported sites. Lecomte et al. set out to examine this discrepancy. After a thorough investigation of all the evidence, their results cast the work of Suraval et al. into an even deeper shadow. We conducted an independent, blind investigation of two sites common to both studies, and a third site investigated only by Suravel et al. We found abundant YDB microspherules at all three widely separated sites, consistent with the results of Firestone et al., and conclude that the analytical protocol employed by Suravel et al. deviated significantly from that of Firestone et al., morphological and geochemical analysis of YDB spherules suggest they formed from abrupt melting and quenching of terrestrial materials and are consistent with a previously proposed cosmic impact 12,900 years ago. Unsurprisingly, after all this, Pinter's requiem for the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis turned out to have been premature. Pinter et al. claimed to have sampled the YDB layer at a location identical or nearly identical with the location reported by Kenneth et al. as part of three studies that reported finding no YDB spherules or nanodiamonds. However, the published Universal Transverse Mercator coordinates reveal that their purported continuous sequence is actually four discontinuous sections. These locations range in distance from the site investigated by Kennet et al. by 7,000 metres, 1,600 metres, 165 metres and 30 metres, clearly showing that they did not sample the YDB site of Kennet et al. Furthermore, this sampling strategy raises questions about whether Pinter et al. sampled the YDB at all and may explain why they were unable to find peaks in YDB magnetic spherules, carbon spherules or nanodiamonds. In 2012-13, to 13, in an effort to limit the scope for poor or misleading scholarship to be cited as though it discredits their work when in fact it does no such thing, Jim Kennett, Richard Firestone, Alan West and a formidable group of pro-impact scientists launched one of the most comprehensive investigations of spherules ever undertaken. The investigation focused on 18 sites across North America, Europe and the Middle East, the latter represented by Abu Huraira in Syria, 
and conducted more than 700 analyses on spherules using energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy for chemical analysis and scanning electron microscopy for surface microstructural characterization. The results, published in PNAS on the 4th of June 2013, took advantage of recent advances in radiocarbon technology to refine the date of the Younger Dryas impact from 12,900 to 12,800 years ago and enabled a much more detailed map of the YDB field to be drawn up, covering close to 50 million square kilometers of North, Central and South America, a large segment of the Atlantic Ocean, and most of Europe, North Africa and the Middle East. Calculations indicate that the impact deposited around 10 million tons of spherules across this vast strewn field. Nor was there any doubt in the researchers' minds that an impact had been at the heart of the matter. The analysis of 771 YDB objects presented in this paper strongly support a major cosmic impact at 12,800 years ago. Spherules are, one, widespread at 18 sites on four continents, two, display large abundance peaks only at the YD onset at around 12,800 years ago, three, are rarely found above or below the YDB, indicating a rare event, and four, amount to an estimated 10 million tons of materials, distributed across 50 million square kilometers of several continents, thus precluding a small local event. Despite the annoying ability of the Younger Dryas comet to keep on proving itself, and of its proponents to keep on refuting all attacks, Nicholas Pinter, lead author of the 2011 Requiem paper, felt moved in an interview with NBC News in September 2013 once again to attempt to cast the hypothesis into scientific limbo. My only comment, he said, is that the pro-impact literature is at this point fringe science being promoted by a single journal. A number of observers with no particular acts of their own to grind were puzzled by this remark. First of all, as National Geographic correspondent Robert Kunzig noted, it smacked a little of wishful thinking, even desperation on Pinter's part. Some opponents of the hypothesis, wrote Kunzig, want so badly for it to go away that they've attempted to declare it dead. Secondly, the journal that Pinter accused of promoting fringe science was none other than the revered, utterly mainstream and extensively peer-reviewed Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS. Thirdly, although a number of articles by Kenneth West, Firestone and their team have appeared in PNAS, it is simply not true to suggest that PNAS is promoting their cause. On the contrary, at the time Pinter blurted out his protest to NBC, the critics of the YD Comet hypothesis had published ten times in PNAS, whereas the proponents of the hypothesis had published there only eight times. Likewise, Pinter's claim that the hypothesis is only being presented in a single journal could hardly be more wrong. By September 2013, in addition to their eight papers in PNAS, proponents had published no less than 15 papers in 13 other journals. The scholarly fight over the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis is far from over. At the time of writing, the most recent salvo fired by critics of the hypothesis was entitled Anthropogenic Origin of Cilicius Scoria Droplets from Pleistocene and Holocene Archaeological Sites in Northern Syria, authored by P. Tai, G. Wilcox, G. H. Barford and D. Q. Fuller, it was published online on 16 December 2014 and in print in January 2015 in the Journal of Archaeological Science. The essence of the argument in this paper is that Cilicius scoria droplets, composed mostly of glass matrix and bubbles together with partially melted mineral grains from Abu Huraira in Syria, cited by pro-impact scientists as evidence for their case, were nothing to do with the comet, but were instead a product of ancient buildings destroyed by house fires. We therefore conclude that melting of building earth in ancient settlements can occur during fires reaching modest temperatures. There is no evidence to suggest that Cilicius scoria droplets result from very high temperature melting of soil and are the result of a cosmic event. For the Syria site, the impact theory is out, boasted lead author Peter Tai in a press interview headlined Study Casts Doubt on Mammoth Killing Cosmic Impact. But once again, it seems the bluster was premature. 
Alan West is listed as the corresponding author on the majority of scholarly papers published by the team of scientists working on the Younger Dryas impact, so I emailed him on the 18th of March 2015 to ask if he and his colleagues had any response to the critique by Ty et al. West replied as follows. We agree with Ty et al. that hut fires can produce glass, but it does not follow, therefore, that all glass comes from hut fires, as they conclude. We have analysed natural glasses supplied by one of the authors of that study, and the 12,800-year-old glass from Syria is only superficially similar. Instead, it matches known cosmic impact glass, as well as high-temperature atomic bomb glass. Most importantly, those authors did not discuss or look for the evidence of abundant high-temperature minerals presented in our previous papers on three sites on two continents. Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and Syria, where we found suicide that melts at 2,300 degrees centigrade and corundum at around 1,800 degrees centigrade. Now we have even stronger evidence from the Syrian site and are working on a new paper to be published this year. The 12,800-year-old Syrian glass contains a range of minerals that melted at extraordinarily high temperatures. Those temperatures are sufficient to melt steel. Furthermore, the same glass-rich layer at the Syrian site contains large peaks in nanodiamonds, nickel and platinum. No building fire can duplicate that range of evidence. Such fires can't produce nanodiamonds or platinum enrichments. All this evidence refutes the hypothesis of Thai et al. that this glass was produced in low-temperature building fires. When the new paper by West and his colleagues is published later in 2015, after this book has gone to press, I have no doubt that it will effectively refute the arguments of Ty et al., just as all previous attacks have been successfully refuted. But I also have no doubt that others, who for whatever reasons of their own are philosophically opposed to the notion of a cataclysm 12,800 years ago, will publish yet more so-called requiems for the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis in the years ahead, even while the constant discovery of new evidence means that it continues to thrive and grow. As we've seen throughout this book, catastrophist ideas, no matter how thoroughly documented and persistently argued and presented they may be, are routinely and regularly brushed under the carpet by the uniformitarian establishment. Thus, while he lacked nothing in persistence or in the thoroughness of his documentation, J. Harlan Bretz faced years of discouragement before his ideas were welcomed by the mainstream. Jim Kennett, Richard Firestone, Alan West and their colleagues have argued the catastrophist case for the Younger Dryas Comet impact with equally commendable persistence and with equal mastery of documentation, and they too have faced rejection and hostility. Two things are different in their case, however. First, this is the 21st century, and we have the Internet, which allows the very rapid sharing and proliferation of ideas. That was not the case when Bretz began his lonely struggle. Secondly, Kennett, Firestone and West seem to have a better understanding of the politics of science than Bretz did, and have greatly strengthened their own hand by mobilising support for their work from many colleagues. It is one thing to shout down and silence a lone wolf like Bretz, it is quite another to shout down and silence a large team of highly credentialed scientists from multiple disciplines and universities. And the team is growing. As I complete this chapter in March 2015, I have before me on my desk the latest paper published by Firestone, Kennett and West. The paper, entitled Nano-Diamond-Rich Layer Across Three Continents Consistent with Major Cosmic Impact 12,800 Years Ago, appears in the September 2014 issue of the Journal of Geology. The lead author is Charles R. Kinsey of the Department of Chemistry, DePaul University, Chicago. Firestone, Kennett, West and 22 other leading scientists from prestigious universities and research institutes around the world are co-authors. The gravity of the paper of its authors and of the journal in which it appears, together with the further detailed refutations it contains of prior critiques, combine to make a laughing stock of Nicholas Pinter's claim that the Younger Dryas comet hypothesis is fringe science. Indeed, the contrary is true. What is clearly happening is that an extraordinary hypothesis has again and again met the demand for extraordinary evidence to support it, 
and has begun to force its way through the staunchly defended doors of the mainstream. It will not be an easy struggle. It never is. There will be setbacks as well as progress. But the 2013 paper on spherules and the 2014 paper on nanodiamonds contains a wealth of evidence that even the most hardened gradualists must find hard to dismiss entirely. As Wallace Broker, a geochemist and climate scientist at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory recently begrudgingly admitted, most people were trying to disprove this. Now they're going to have to realize there's some truth to it. But there cannot be just some truth to it. The younger Dryas comet hypothesis is either right or wrong. My own assessment, having poured through more than seven years of research papers and having read every attack and refutation since the first public airing of the hypothesis in 2007, is that the case for the impact is a very strong one that grows stronger and more convincing every day. I could give many further examples of the successful efforts by the proponents of the hypothesis to defend their ideas over the years, but rather than doing so here, I refer the interested reader to the sources given in the footnote. Meanwhile, the September 2014 paper, summarizing the evidence presented, concludes. A cosmic impact event at the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling episode is the only hypothesis capable of explaining the simultaneous deposition of peak abundances in nanodiamonds, magnetic and glassy spherules, melt glass, platinum, and or other proxies across at least four continents approaching 50 million square kilometers. The evidence strongly supports a cosmic impact 12,800 years ago. Of particular note, adds James Kennett, is the fact that the glassy and metallic materials in the YDB layers could only have formed at temperatures in excess of 2,200 degrees Celsius and therefore could not have resulted from any alternative scenario other than a massive comet impact. The exact size of that impact remains to be resolved with further research. Until then, says Kennett, there is no known limit to the YDB strewn field, which currently covers more than 10% of the planet, indicating that the YDB event was a major cosmic impact. The nanodiamond datum recognized in this study gives scientists a snapshot of a moment in time called an isochron. Worldwide, to this day, scientists know of only two layers of sediment broadly distributed across several continents, that exhibit coeval abundance peaks in a comprehensive assemblage of cosmic impact markers, including nanodiamonds, high-temperature quenched spherules, high-temperature melt glass, carbon spherules, iridium, and isiniform carbon. These layers are found at the Younger Dryas boundary 12,800 years ago and at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary 65 million years ago when it has long been agreed that a gigantic cosmic impact in the Gulf of Mexico, in that case the impactor is thought to have been an asteroid some 10 kilometers in diameter, caused the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. The evidence we present settles the debate about the existence of abundant YDB nanodiamonds, Kennett says. Our hypothesis challenges some existing paradigms within several disciplines, including impact dynamics, archaeology, paleontology and paleoceanography, paleoclimatology, all affected by this relatively recent cosmic impact. The point Kennett makes here has important implications for the study and understanding of our past. Archaeologists have been in the habit of regarding cosmic impacts, supposedly only occurring at multi-million year intervals, as largely irrelevant to the 200,000 year story of anatomically modern humans. When we believed that the last big impact had been the dinosaur-killing asteroid of 65 million years ago, there was obviously little point in trying to relate cosmic accidents on such an almost unimaginable scale in any way to the much shorter time frame of history. But the very real possibility, confirmed by Kennett's study, that a huge, earth-shaking, extinction-level event occurred just 12,800 years ago, in our historical backyard, changes everything. Chapter 6. Fingerprints of a Comet 
the evidence from deposits of nanodiamonds, microspherules, high-temperature melt glass and other ET impact proxies at the Younger Dryas boundary points strongly towards a cataclysmic encounter between the Earth and a large comet around 12,800 years ago. The point of entry would have been somewhere over Canada, by which time the comet might already have broken up into multiple fragments on its journey through space, as was the case with Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 when its freight train of large fragments hit Jupiter with spectacular effect in 1994. It's equally possible, however, that the breakup of the Younger Dryas comet did not occur until after it had entered the Earth's atmosphere. Either way, some of the fragments very soon exploded in the air. Others, with diameters of up to two kilometers, smashed down at various points on the North American ice cap. Yet others streaked on in a southeasterly direction across the Atlantic Ocean, where further impacts followed on the European ice cap and still others remained aloft until they reached the Middle East in the vicinity of Turkey, Lebanon and Syria, where the final rain of impacts occurred. Because the evidence for the comet is so new, and because the impact hypothesis is still disputed, almost no consideration has yet been given to the immediate effects of the multiple major impacts that are thought to have taken place on the North American ice cap. In all cases, the ice itself still more than two kilometers thick 12,800 years ago, would have absorbed most of the shock of the impact, leaving very few lasting features on the ground. Even so, researchers have begun to home in on a number of possible craters. One candidate is the so-called Charity Shoal feature in Lake Ontario, consisting of a raised rim around a small circular basin approximately a kilometer in diameter and 19 meters deep, it was studied by a team of scientists led by Troy Holcomb, who concluded that it was likely to be of extraterrestrial impact origin and might have been created in the late Pleistocene around the time of the onset of the Younger Dryas. Similarly, the half-kilometre diameter, ten-metre-deep Bloody Creek structure in southwestern Nova Scotia was identified as a possible impact crater by Ian Spooner, George Stevens and others in a 2009 paper in the journal Meteoritics and Planetary Science. They couldn't be confident as to its age, but noted that impact onto glacier ice during the waning stages of the Wisconsin glaciation about 12,000 years ago may have resulted in dissipation of much impact energy into the ice, resulting in the present morphology of the Bloody Creek structure. A third candidate is the Corosol Crater in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, Canada. Discovered by the Canadian Hydrographic Service during underwater mapping, Corosol is four kilometers in diameter implying an impacting object with a diameter of up to half a kilometer. The crater presently lies in 40 to 185 meters of water and was originally thought to be very ordovician, dating to some point after the Middle Ordovician about 470 million years ago. Recent research, however, casts doubt on this chronology. For example, M.D. Higgins and his colleagues from the University of Quebec and the Geological Survey of Canada argued in a paper presented at the 42nd Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in March 2011 that the paucity of sediments in the crater might be taken to indicate that it is young. The minimum age was established using data from a 7-meter core taken in the central trough. Calibrated carbon-14 ages of shells in the sediments can be extrapolated to give an estimate of the age of the base of the sedimentary sequence of around 12,900 years ago. This is taken to be the youngest possible age of the impact. That youngest possible age of 12,900 years is comfortably within the margin of error of 12,800 years, plus or minus 150 years, that is presently accepted for the Younger Dryas boundary. In other words, if the findings of Higgins and his team are confirmed, Corosol could well be one of the hitherto missing impact craters left by the Younger Dryas comet. Firm identification of such a crater would be jam on the cake for Firestone, Kennett, West and other pro-impact scientists, but as they've made clear many times, they do not need craters to prove their hypothesis, since prominent craters are not to be expected either from airbursts or from impacts on ice caps. Nonetheless, Charity Shoal, Bloody Creek and Corosol do not stand alone. A fourth possible impact site has been identified somewhat to the west of Corosol, in an area known to geologists as the Quebecia terrain. 
high concentrations of YDB microspherules found near the towns of Melrose in Pennsylvania and Newtonville in New Jersey were analyzed by Wu, Sharma, Lecomte, Dimitrov and Landis in a paper published in September 2013 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Their conclusion was that an impact on the Laurentide ice sheet penetrated to the bedrock of the Quebecia terrain, throwing ejecta high into the atmosphere. The ejecta included spherules in the range of 2 to 5 millimetres in diameter that were spread by the winds and rained down hundreds of miles away in the Melrose-Newtonville area. Significantly, the spherules turned out on analysis to contain minerals such as suicide that form at temperatures in excess of 2,000 degrees centigrade. Gross texture, mineralogy, and the age of the spherules appear consistent with their formation as ejecta from an impact 12,900 years ago. The rare earth element patterns and the SR and ND isotopes of the spherules indicate that their source lies in the Quebecia terrain. We have provided evidence for an impact on top of the ice sheet, concluded study co-author Mukul Sharma. We have, for the first time, narrowed down the region where a younger Dryas impact did take place, even though we have not yet found its crater. Judging from the apparent northwest to southeast trajectory of the Younger Dryas comet, the Charity Shoal feature in Lake Ontario, ejecta from the Quebecia terrain, the Corosol crater in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and the Bloody Creek structure in Nova Scotia might mark the impacts of the last large fragments to hit North America. But the even larger fragments in the range of two kilometers in diameter that Firestone, Kennet, and West envisage would inevitably have hit the ice cap earlier in the trajectory, and thus at points lying further to the north and west. It is to these hypothetical impacts on the western fringes of the Laurentide ice cap and on the Cordilleran ice cap that we should look for the possible source of the meltwater for Bretz's flood. Radical Thinking Although the notion of outburst floods from glacial Lake Missoula has long been accepted by mainstream science as the source of the spectacular flood damage documented by Bretz, it's important to recognize that a number of senior, highly credentialed scientists continue to dissent from this view. Prominent amongst the dissenters is John Shaw, professor of earth sciences at the University of Alberta in Canada. Shaw argues that the volume of water in Lake Missoula, estimated at around 2,000 cubic kilometers at its peak, is not sufficient to account for the field evidence. His own theory is that huge quantities of meltwater, of the order of 100,000 cubic kilometers, were impounded in a subglacial reservoir deep beneath the North American ice cap, and he proposes that the flood damage was caused by a single massive release from this reservoir. Japanese researchers Goro Komatsu, Hideaki Miyamoto, Kazumasa Ito, and Hiroyuki Tosaka have carried out extensive computer simulations of large-scale cataclysmic floods across the Scablands and agree with Shaw that glacial Lake Missoula was not, on its own, anywhere near large enough to account for the flood damage. Even the whole draining of Lake Missoula cannot explain the field evidence of high watermarks. The subglacial flooding from the north proposed by Shaw may provide an explanation for the increased volume of water required to explain the high watermark evidence in the channeled scabland. Likewise, Victor Baker, professor of hydrology and water resources at the University of Arizona, and Jim O'Connor of the U.S. Geological Survey's Water Science Center, have expressed concern about the case for periodic colossal joculops out of glacial Lake Missoula. In our view, anomalies still exist between some aspects of the field evidence and the conceptual models that have been advocated. The position that the scores of floods hypothesis completes Brett's imaginative theory may prematurely divert attention from some of the outstanding problems that remain in interpreting the spectacular features of the channeled scabland. In 1977, geologist C. Warren Hunt set out to conduct a detailed investigation into Bretz's flood. He did so because, like the scholars cited above, he was unconvinced by the theory, which had already assumed the status of unassailable fact by the mid-1970s, that all the water damage visible in the scablands had been caused by outburst floods from Lake Missoula. Hunt's dissatisfaction stemmed from his own extensive knowledge of dams and how to design them to take best advantage of local geology. The bottom line, according to his calculations, was that the proposed ice dam on the Clark Fork River, behind which Lake Missoula is supposed to have backed up, 
would have been, quite literally, impossible. Let us first of all consider the statistics. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, Glacial Lake Missoula at its highest level, the level it is presumed to have reached before the Clark Fork ice dam broke, covered an area of about 3,000 square miles and contained an estimated 500 cubic miles, 2,084 cubic kilometers, of water. Its surface would have been at 4,150 feet above sea level, but the bottom terrain varied in altitude from point to point, so the USGS calculates that the lake would have been about 950 feet deep at present-day Missoula, 260 feet deep at Derby, and around 1,100 feet deep near Polson. At the ice dam itself, however, a gradient in the underlying terrain meant the glacial lake would have been more than 2,000 feet deep, its deepest point, more than twice the depth of modern Lake Superior. While broadly concurring with the U.S. Geological Survey's figures, C. Warren Hunt emphatically rejected the suggestion that ice might have dammed the Clark Fork so as to impound water to a depth of 2,100 feet. When one considers, he wrote, that modern engineering employs bedrock grouting for securing the footings of 500-foot dams, it must surely strike any reader as virtually frivolous to suggest that chance emplacement of glacial ice might have dammed Clark Fork across a seven-mile span, lacking in intermediate abutments, and then retained water at four times the pressure of modern engineered dams. Hunt's incredulity at the notion of an ice dam more than 2,000 feet high and seven miles long receives support from studies which argue that at a lake depth of approximately 200 metres, 656 feet, the hydrostatic pressure exerted on the damming ice is sufficient to begin to force a hole through the ice. Once formed, this hole will enlarge by frictional melt widening, enabling the drainage of ice-dammed lake water to occur. At more than thrice 200 metres in height, therefore, the hypothetical Clark Fork Ice Dam does indeed begin to look impossible. Yet, as noted, Hunt accepted the USGS statistics. The surface of Lake Missoula certainly did at one point stand 4,150 feet above sea level, and the lake therefore must indeed have reached around 2,100 feet deep in the Clark Fork Valley between the Bitterroot and Cabinet mountain ranges. That it did so is confirmed by an ancient strand line at that altitude, and other strand lines have been found at lower altitudes, which clearly show many subsequent lower water levels after the high one. Hunt's solution, however, since he continued to regard the Clark Fork Dam as a geological impossibility, was to propose that a gigantic flood, thousands of feet deep, must have washed over the entire region at the end of the Ice Age, in the process filling the various basins of glacial Lake Missoula up to the 4,150-foot level where the highest strand line is found, and leaving the lower strand lines as it receded. As the source of his proposed region-wide flood, Hunt suggested that Tidal inundation, brought on by some form of gravitational attraction from a celestial source, the nature of which is beyond the competence of the writer, must have resulted in a tide rising to 5,000 feet, 1,600 meters, above present sea level. The waters were held there for several weeks, during which there was much surging, partial floating of glaciers, and development of the highest beaches in Lake Missoula. The tidal ebb and flood with successive lower beaches developed, allowing sweeping of the canyons, removal of previous glacial deposits, fans and tailors, scouring the scablands, ice rafting, polishing of standing rock obstructions to tidal surge, aggradation of valley and bypass floors, and discharge of boulders into submarine deltas and fans. Lastly, a layer of silt was left in the wake of the tide, especially in the quieter waters of cul-de-sac estuaries. In other words, Hunt had very much gone back to Brett's in proposing a single gigantic flood as the source of all the damage on the Columbia Plateau. His 1977 notion that it was a tidal inundation of seawater rushing up estuaries and brought on by the gravitational attraction of some hypothetical celestial body is, however, untenable, and Hunt himself recognized this when he revisited the subject some years later in his 1990 book, Environment of Violence. Conceding that the tidewater solution is weakened by the great distance to tidewater 
and the absence of a trail of evidence along the possible routes, he sought out other possible sources of water in sufficiently vast quantities to inflict the damage to the landscape that he had observed in the field. In the process, he briefly considered John Shaw's theory of a subglacial reservoir of 100,000 cubic kilometers of meltwater, but asked some pertinent questions. How could such melting take place without a heat source such as the volcanic heat, which precipitates Icelandic joculabs? What climatic regimen would allow such melting in the first place? Why would the water not have lifted the periphery of the ice sheet and emerged without accumulating soon after it was produced by melting? What containment mechanism would allow accumulation of a great under-ice lake beneath 3,000 meters of ice? And would not water beneath the maximum ice thickness tend to escape towards the lesser confining pressures under peripheral areas of the ice sheet? Is there any possible way such a huge under-ice chamber of water could accumulate? To cut a long story short, Hunt reasoned that there was not. Besides, the 100,000 cubic kilometers that Shaw's theory offered was, in his opinion, insufficient. Almost ten times as much water would be needed to account for all the field evidence. With a tidal source, Glacial Lake Missoula and Shaw's under-ice reservoir all dismissed, therefore, Hunt found himself left with only one possible, though startlingly catastrophist, solution. Somehow, in some way, very rapid cataclysmic melting of an immense area of the North American ice cap must have taken place. After doing the necessary calculations, Hunt concluded that 840,000 cubic kilometers of ice, in other words about 10% of the entire glaciated area, would have had to melt. The reader will recall that Bretz originally envisaged something similar but was defeated by the inability of either radical global warming or subglacial volcanism, quite simply neither happened, to account for the vast quantities of meltwater his flood called for. In the end, as we saw, he settled for outburst floods from glacial Lake Missoula as the answer. In 1990, Hunt faced the same dilemma, with the exception that he'd already ruled out Lake Missoula but showed himself to be an extraordinarily competent and prescient innovator when, without any preamble, he wrote, Earth heat cannot have melted continental ice to produce floodwaters in the volumes required. A cometary heat source could have served the purpose. To melt 10% of the North American ice cap, Hunt calculated that the kinetic energy of a half-kilometer diameter comet would be sufficient. A comet of the type that exploded above the Tunguska site in 1908 could have provided this heat. The great lake it might have created in the middle of the ice sheet would rapidly have tunneled under the remaining glacier and emerged as catastrophic floods in many directions. Cometary melting of the ice seems necessary to yield so much water in such a short time. Anticipating the objection that no crater had been found, Hunt pointed out that the Tunguska event, an airburst, likewise left no crater or ejector blanket. Furthermore, in the case of a hypothetical comet impact on the North American ice cap, all ejector and cometary matter would likely have been swept away in the ensuing flood, coming to rest widely dispersed in the drift blanket far from its source. Thus diluted and mixed with other debris, Direct evidence for either the exploded projectile or ejector from the site could be difficult to recognize, if not lost to science permanently. Last but not least, and again the prescience is almost eerie, Hunt noted that glass spherules, if found in glacial debris, could support the theory. He could not have known then, writing a quarter of a century ago, that from 2007 onwards a team of leading scientists would champion the cause of comet impacts on the North American ice cap, and in the absence of obvious craters would derive much of their evidence from microspherules, fused glass, and nanodiamonds. How to change global climate in an instant Hunt's suggestion was that a single, relatively small, half-kilometer diameter object would have packed sufficient kinetic energy to set off the melting of approximately one-tenth of the North American ice cap, producing a cataclysmic flood. Twenty-five years on, 
the proponents of the Younger Dryas Comet hypothesis, as we've seen, are proposing that multiple two-kilometer objects may have impacted the ice cap. If they're correct, the scale of the ensuing floods must have been almost unimaginably large, nor would they have been confined only to the channeled scablands of the Columbia Plateau. The Comet hypothesis envisages a rain of impacts right across the ice sheet from the Pacific to the Atlantic coasts of North America, so we should find evidence of flooding everywhere. We do. The Columbia Plateau displays flood-ravaged scablands, but so too does the state of New Jersey much further to the east. The Columbia Plateau is notable for its fields and hillsides strewn with huge ice-rafted erratics, but so too is the state of New York. Indeed, perched on the bare rock surfaces of Manhattan's Central Park are many imposing erratic boulders, including diabase from the Palisades Sill along the Hudson River and schist from even further afield. Interestingly, too, just as the Columbia Plateau has its coulees, so New York State has its finger lakes. These latter were long thought to have been carved by glaciers, but their geomorphology closely parallels that of the coulees, and some researchers now believe they were cut by glacial meltwater at extreme pressures, a process linked by sediment evidence to the collapse of continental ice sheets. Likewise in Minnesota, on the St. Croix River, where Randall Carlson and I finished our long road trip across North America, there is a spectacular array of more than 80 giant glacial potholes. One is 10 feet wide and 60 feet deep, making it the deepest explored pothole in the world. Others as yet unexcavated are even wider, suggesting the probability that they may be deeper as well. And all of them, without exception, were carved out by turbulent floods at the end of the Ice Age, floods emanating, Randall believes, from the superior lobe of the Laurentide ice cap. You could spend a lifetime, he tells me, traveling this land and still not see it all. The effects of megascale flood flows have been extensively documented in the eastern foothills of the Rocky Mountains, in both Canada and the U.S., across the prairie states, in the vicinity of the Great Lakes, in Pennsylvania and western New York, and in New England. All the Canadian provinces preserve large-scale evidence of gigantic water flows. All regions within or proximal to the area of the last great glaciation show the effects of intense, mega-scale floods. But the question that remains concerns the source of these floods. Having been dragged, kicking and screaming into conceding that flooding occurred at all, Gradualist science, as we have seen, subsequently engaged in a love affair with glacial Lake Missoula, elevating it and its epic joculopes to serve as the sole explanation for all the astonishing diluvial features of the channeled scablands of the Columbia Plateau. It is not surprising, therefore, that other Ice Age floods, wherever they are admitted to have occurred, are also attributed to joculopes from glacial lakes. More than that, it is the floodwaters from these glacial lakes, rather than anything so vulgarly catastrophist as a comet, that are presently regarded by mainstream science as the most likely cause of the Younger Dryas cold event. The giant glacial lake Agassiz, which lay across most of Manitoba, northwestern Ontario, northern Minnesota, eastern North Dakota, and Saskatchewan, is particularly implicated. Around 13,000 years ago, that is, immediately before the onset of the Younger Dryas, Lake Agassiz is thought to have covered an area as great as 440,000 square kilometers, 170,000 square miles, when an ice dam broke and allowed a substantial fraction of its contents, perhaps as much as 9,500 cubic kilometers, to spill out along a flood path running through the Mackenzie River system in the Canadian Arctic coastal plain and thence into the Arctic Ocean. There, the anticyclonic circulation of a current known as the Beaufort Gyre would have gradually moved it onwards into the subpolar North Atlantic in the transpolar drift. The slow release of meltwater through Fram Strait provides a mechanism unique to the Arctic that is capable of turning a short-duration, high-magnitude meltwater discharge into a significantly longer, more moderated and sustained meltwater rerouting event to the North Atlantic. What made matters worse, however, was that at the same time, 
huge quantities of icy meltwater were also being dumped into the North Atlantic from the other glacial lakes and directly off the Laurentide ice sheet itself. The combined effect, so the theory goes, disrupted ocean circulation to such an extent that it radically affected global climate. A great gush of cold, fresh water, derived from the melting Laurentide ice sheet, swept across the surface of the North Atlantic. It prevented warm, salty water from the Southern Ocean flowing deep beneath the surface, the Gulf Stream, from rising to the surface. The normal overturning of the ocean water stopped. As a consequence, the atmosphere over the ocean, which would normally have been warmed, remained cold, and so in consequence did the air over Europe and North America. These are highly technical matters, with which we do not need to concern ourselves at too great length here. In brief, though, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, also known as the Thermohaline Circulation, is the great ocean conveyor belt that not only carries warm, salty equatorial water to the surface and thence northwards, where it eventually cools and sinks off the coasts of Greenland and Norway, but also carries the resultant cold North Atlantic deep water south, returning it slowly to the equator, where it mixes with warmer water, rises again to the surface, and thus continues the cycle. It transports large amounts of water, heat, salt, carbon, nutrients, and other substances around the globe, and connects the surface ocean and atmosphere with the huge reservoir of the deep sea. As such, it is of critical importance to the global climate system. It was the shutting down of this delicately balanced, intricately interconnected, hugely complex, critical cycle, scientists agree, that caused the dramatic global cooling of the Younger Dryas, that the shutdown was the result of colossal meltwater floods out of glacial lakes and directly off the Laurentide ice cap, is also agreed. A major puzzle, however, as S.J. Fidel points out in a keynote paper in the journal Quaternary International, is why this should have happened 12,800 years ago, rather than, say, 800 or 1,000 years earlier, at the height of the warm phase, known as the bolling alarod interstadial, that immediately preceded the Younger Dryas. Intuitively, one feels the meltwater floods should have been at their peak during the warming phase. In reality, however, it was only at the bolling alarod Younger Dryas boundary that the meltwater releases occurred. The solution to the mystery seems transparently obvious to Richard Firestone, Alan West, Jim Kennett, and other proponents of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. Quite simply, there is no mystery. In their reckoning, the huge meltwater floods that so radically affected global climate were caused by multiple large fragments of a comet ripping through the Earth's atmosphere and smashing down into the ice cap. Not just one fragment of half a kilometre or so as envisaged by Sea War and Hunt, but as many as eight fragments, and possibly more, including some that might have been as much as two kilometres in diameter. The colossal heat generated by such impacts with a combined explosive power estimated, as we've seen, at ten million megatons, provides all the energy needed to set off a truly cataclysmic meltdown of huge sectors of the North American ice cap. The gigantic flood that would have followed, after scouring the land in its path, would indeed have entered the oceans as a great gush of fresh water, and provided the shock to the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation that kept global climate savagely cold for the next 1,200 years. The situation would have been worsened by the injection of dust and immense quantities of smoke into the upper atmosphere, blocking sunlight for an extended period of time, which would, of course, have had the effect of lowering temperatures even further. Moreover, the impact event, followed by extensive fires and sudden climate change, likely contributed together to the rapid extinction of the megafauna and many other animals. The reader will recall that no less than 35 genera of North American mammals became extinct during the Younger Dryas. We are therefore, by definition, looking for an extinction mechanism that is capable of wiping out up to 35 genera across a continent in a geologic instant. Nor is it just North America that we must consider, for most of the diverse megafauna of South America that had flourished before the Younger Dryas also suffered extinction by 12,000 years ago, in other words, before the Younger Dryas came to an end. 
Could it have been overkill by human hunters? The question touches upon a contentious issue, namely when, in fact, and from where did human beings first arrive in the Americas? Whatever the answer, it seems implausible that bands of nomadic hunter-gatherers would have been either motivated or ruthlessly efficient enough to wipe out so many animals, including giants like the Colombian mammoth, in so short a time, across two continents. Moreover, there is much to suggest that human beings in the Americas themselves entered a period of deep distress during the Younger Dryas that would have further reduced their motivation and efficiency. Archaeological evidence from South America is limited, but in North America, this was the time when the Clovis culture, with its sophisticated stone weapons technology, abruptly vanished from the record. Indeed, all available indicators point to a significant decline and or reorganization in human population during the early centuries of the Younger Dryas. Once again, therefore, the only explanation that makes complete sense of the evidence is the comet impact hypothesis of Firestone, Kennett, West and their large group of colleagues and co-authors. In the light of their findings, which we've reviewed extensively in the preceding chapters, I propose the following. 1. There was indeed cataclysmic flooding in North America at the end of the Ice Age. 2. It was not primarily caused by outburst floods from glacial lakes, but rather by the rapid, almost instantaneous meltdown of a large area of the ice cap. 3. The heat source needed to initiate this meltdown came from the kinetic energy of a series of impacts from fragments of a giant comet that entered the Earth's atmosphere over North America 12,800 years ago and bombarded the North American ice cap. 4. North America, while being the epicenter of the disaster, was by no means the only region hit. Other fragments of the disintegrating comet, including some particularly large objects, appear to have smashed into the European ice cap. In this connection, it may be of relevance that recent high-resolution sonar scans of the English Channel, the floor of which was above water during the Ice Age, have revealed evidence of cataclysmic flooding there in the form of a 400-kilometer-long network of submerged and partially infilled valleys carved into the bedrock. The data show a collection of landforms that, taken together, indicate a catastrophic flood origin, state the authors of a study published in Nature. The study specifically likens these now submerged landforms to the Cheney Palouse terrain of the channeled scabland of Washington, USA. The authors state that they cannot resolve the absolute timing of the flooding events. They do conclude, however, that their study provides the first direct evidence that a mega flood event was responsible for carving the English Channel Valley network. Our observations are consistent with erosion by high magnitude flows, as in the channeled scabland. 5. Altogether, more than 50 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface were affected by impacts and air bursts of fragments of the Younger Dryas Comet, some large, some smaller, but all devastating in their effects, extending from North America right across the Atlantic Ocean and across Europe, with the final rain of fragments falling as far afield as the Middle East. 6. The combined effect of these multiple impacts, particularly the immense freshwater floods into the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans that followed, set off the Younger Dryas cooling event, itself a cataclysm on a truly global scale that resulted in the extinction of huge numbers of animal species and pressed humanity very hard. 7. The human costs of the disaster might not have been confined to the complete destruction of hunter-gatherer cultures such as the Clovis people of North America the possibility must be considered that an advanced civilization, now lost to history, might also have been obliterated. Spring is coming. What is particularly striking is that the very radical climate changes at both the onset and the termination of the Younger Dryas were global and were accomplished within the span of a human generation. Again, the comet impact hypothesis makes the best sense of this. The estimated combined explosive force of the impacts at 10 million megatons would have lofted sufficient ejecta into the atmosphere 12,800 years ago to plunge the Earth into a long, sustained twilight, akin to a nuclear winter, the time of darkness that so many ancient myths speak of. 
capable of reducing solar radiation for more than a thousand years, the dramatic warming that began 11,600 years ago would then be explained by the final dissipation of the ejector cloud, coupled with an end to the system-wide inertia that had beset thermohaline circulation in the North Atlantic. Another possibility, not necessarily mutually contradictory with any of the above mechanisms, is that 11,600 years ago, the Earth interacted again with the debris stream of the same fragmenting comet that had caused the Younger Dryas to start 12,800 years ago. On the second occasion, however, analysis suggests that the primary impacts were not on land or onto ice, but into the world's oceans, throwing up vast plumes of water vapor and creating a greenhouse effect that caused global warming rather than global cooling. According to renowned British astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle, the difference between a warm ocean and a cold one amounts to a ten-year supply of sunlight. Thus the warm conditions produced by a strong water vapor greenhouse must be maintained for at least a decade in order to produce the required transformation of the ocean. And this is just about the time for which water, suddenly thrown into the stratosphere, might be expected to persist there. The needed amount of water is so vast, 100 million million tons, that only one kind of causative event seems possible, the infall of a comet-sized object into a major ocean. More research certainly needs to be done to establish the exact mechanisms in all their complexity that brought about the sudden end of the Younger Dryas, but the effects on global climate are already well understood. The Greenland ice cores, those invaluable windows into the past, tell us that temperatures rose in less than a decade at the climate transition marking the end of the Younger Dryas cold interval and the beginning of the warmer Holocene epoch at 11,600 years before the present. In less than 20 years, the climate in the North Atlantic region turned into a milder and less stormy regime as a consequence of a rapid retreat of sea ice cover. A warming of 7 degrees centigrade was completed in about 50 years. In exactly the same interval, in the subalpine belt of Western Europe, tree species that had never been present before, including Laris, Pinus chembra, and Betula, suddenly began to proliferate. In northwestern Montana, in the USA, glacial ice in the Marias Pass had receded up valley from the canyon mouth, and the Sun River Glacier had completely vanished by 11,200 years ago. A thousand other examples could be cited, but the message is the same everywhere. From Tasmania to the Andes, from Turkey to Japan, from North America to Australia, from Peru to Egypt, winter had ended, and a great global spring had begun. Such is the rebirth of the cosmos, as the hermetic texts proclaim. It is a making again of all things good, a holy and awe-inspiring restoration of all nature. A rebirth a making again, a restoration. But of what? Who went before? What exactly was to be reborn? We'll consider these questions in the following chapters. Part 3. Sages Chapter 7. The Fire Next Time Three singularities occurred near the end of the last ice age linked to the sudden onset and equally sudden termination of the mysterious epoch known as the Younger Dryas. Somewhere around 12,800 years ago, after more than 2,000 years of uninterrupted global warming, and with a margin of error of plus or minus 150 years that is as close as the resolution of the data allows us to get to the actual moment, a flood of icy meltwater entered the North Atlantic so suddenly and in such quantities that it disrupted ocean circulation. The source of the flood was the North American ice cap. Since the previous two millennia had witnessed continuous sea level rise, the resolution of the data means there's no way of knowing exactly how much coastal land was swallowed up by this singular event. With so much new water that had previously been locked in ice abruptly added, however, we may surmise that a dramatic and instantaneous rise in sea level did occur. In the same geological instant that the meltwater flood was unleashed, 
global temperatures plummeted, and the world's climate underwent a reversal from that balmy 2,000-year-long summer that had begun about 15,000 years ago. By 13,000 years ago, conditions are thought to have improved to such an extent that they were warmer and wetter than they are today, to a savage and icy global winter. Again, the resolution of the data does not allow us to say exactly how soon after the meltwater flood the deep freeze began, but as we saw in the previous chapter, there is much to suggest that this radical reversal of temperatures was achieved within the span of a single human generation. In that same span, the ice sheets that had everywhere been melting and in retreat began remorselessly to re-advance, and sea level rise ceased. Around 11,600 years ago, again with a margin of error of 150 years in either direction imposed by the data, but again apparently within a single generation, the freeze suddenly ended, global temperatures soared, and the remnant ice caps collapsed, shedding their residual water burden into the world's oceans, which rose dramatically to close to today's level. Our ancestors passed through these tumultuous changes, and it is inconceivable that they would not have remarked upon them or sought to speak about their experiences to one another. Their stories and eyewitness accounts would in turn have become part of revered oral traditions, and as such would have been passed down from generation to generation until they became hoary with age. As the reader will recall from Chapter 3, certain Native American myths do absolutely seem to speak of events at the end of the last Ice Age. The terrible floods that scoured and ravaged the land are described in detail. But of even greater interest are the traditions of the star with the long white tail that came down here once thousands of years ago, that burnt up everything, and that made a different world in which the weather was colder than before. These traditions appear to memorialize the devastating effects of the comet impact that we can now date conclusively, within the understood margins of error, to around 12,800 years ago. We've seen how scientists Richard Firestone, Alan West, Jim Kennett and others believe the comet broke into multiple fragments, perhaps eight of which, some with diameters approaching two kilometers, hit the North American ice cap, generating huge amounts of heat and instantly transforming great masses of ice into the floods of meltwater that disrupted oceanic circulation and played a key role in bringing on the deep freeze of the Younger Dryas. The reader will also recall that other fragments of the giant comet are thought to have hit the northern European ice cap and to have gone on to rain down on even more distant lands as far away as the Middle East. Thus, though the epicenter was in North America, it's not surprising that the Younger Dryas was a global event that affected peoples and cultures all around the world. What is surprising is the remarkable consistency with which traditions from every part of the globe speak not only of cataclysmic events, but also of very specific warnings given to certain selected wise or good or pure humans in advance of the impending cataclysm. We saw several examples of such warnings in the Native American traditions reviewed in Chapter 3, but if we travel oceans and continents away from the epicenter of the impacts, we find similar accounts of warnings preserved in the Middle East at the furthest extent to which the effects of the comet have so far been documented. Note this does not mean that the strewn field of comet debris is confined to the 50 million square kilometers presently recognized. It simply means that samples of sediment from other regions have thus far not been assayed for nanodiamonds, magnetic and glassy spherules, melt glass, platinum, and other tell-tale proxies of impact. Up to the limit of research so far done, however, the site furthest from North America that has produced firm evidence of the presence and effects of the Younger Dryas Comet is an archaeological mound, or tell, called Abu Huraira in Syria, which was excavated in 1974, just before completion of the Takba Dam on the Euphrates River caused it to disappear forever beneath the advancing waters of Lake Assad. Sediment samples from the archaeological trenching of Abu Huraira were removed and preserved before the site was flooded, and it was the Younger Dryas boundary layer of one of these samples, from Trench E, dated to 12,800 years ago, that Firestone West, Kennett and their team assayed in 2012. As we saw in Chapter 5, 
they found nanodiamonds, abundant cosmic impact spherules, and melt glass that could only have formed at temperatures in excess of 2,200 degrees Celsius, suggesting that the site was near the center of a high-energy airburst impact. Abu Huraira cannot be subjected to further direct archaeological investigation since it now lies under Lake Assad, but Firestone, Kennett and West believe the effects of the comet on that settlement and its inhabitants would have been severe. Of note is the fact that the site lies close both to southeastern Turkey, where Gobekli Tepe is situated, and to the modern state of Iran, formerly Persia, where traditions of great antiquity have been preserved in the scriptures of Zoroastrianism, the pre-Islamic religion of ancient Persia. The fatal winters are going to fall. Exactly how old Zoroastrianism is has not yet been satisfactorily established by scholars, since even the lifetime of its prophet Zarathustra, more usually known as Zoroaster, is uncertain. Indeed, as Columbia University's authoritative Encyclopedia Iranica admits, controversy over Zarathustra's date has been an embarrassment of long-standing to Zoroastrian studies. The Greek historians were amongst the first to address themselves to the matter. Plutarch, for example, tells us that Zoroaster lived 5,000 years before the Trojan War, itself a matter of uncertain historicity, but generally put at around 1300 BC, Thus, 5,000 plus 1,300 equals 6,300 BC. A similar chronology is given by Diogenes Laertius, who relates that Zoroaster lived 6,000 years before Xerxes' Greek campaign, in other words, around 6,480 BC. More recent scholars have proposed dates as far apart as 1,750 BC and 258 years before Alexander, in other words, around 588 BC. Whatever the truth of the matter, it's agreed that Zoroaster himself borrowed from much earlier traditions, and that Zoroastrianism, therefore, like many other religions, has roots that extend very far back into prehistory. In the Zoroastrian scriptures known as the Zend Avesta, certain verses in particular are recognized as drawing on these very ancient oral traditions. The verses speak of a primordial father figure called Yima, the first man, the first king and the founder of civilization, and appear in the opening section of the Zend Avesta, known as the Vendidad. There we read how the god Ahura Mazda created the first land. Ariana Vaejo, by the good river Daicha, as a paradise on earth, and how the fair Yima, the great shepherd, was the first mortal with whom Ahura Mazda chose to converse, instructing him to become a preacher. Yima refused, at which the god set him a different task. Since thou wantest not to be the preacher and the bearer of my law, then make my world thrive, make my world increase. Undertake thou to nourish, to rule, and to watch over my world. To this Yima agreed, at which the god presented him with a golden ring and a poniard, a long tapered thrusting knife inlaid with gold. Significantly, for we will see in chapter 17 there are close parallels to this story as far away as the Andes Mountains of South America, Yima then pressed the earth with the golden ring and bored it with the poniard. By this act we learn he made the earth grow larger by one-third than it was before, a feat that over the course of thousands of years he repeated twice more, in the process eventually doubling the land area available for the flocks and herds with men and dogs and birds, who gathered unto him at his will and wish as many as he wished. Anatomically modern humans like ourselves have existed, so far as we know, for a little less than 200,000 years. The earliest anatomically modern human skeleton acknowledged by science is from Ethiopia and dates to 196,000 years ago. Within this time span, there has been only one period when those parts of the earth that are useful to humans increased dramatically in size, and that was during the last ice age, between 100,000 and 11,600 years ago. Indeed, previously submerged lands totaling 27 million square kilometers, equivalent to the area of Europe and China added together, 
were exposed by lowered sea levels at the last glacial maximum 21,000 years ago. While it is probably far-fetched to suppose that it is this very real increase of useful land, of which a great part was still above water at the beginning of the Younger Dryas 12,800 years ago, that is referred to in the Yima story, or that it has anything to do with the Golden Age that Yima's benign rule supposedly achieved in Ariana Vallejo, it is interesting to note what happened next. After another immense span of time, we read, Yima was summoned to a meeting place by the good river Daicha, where the god Ahura Mazda appeared to him, bearing an ominous warning of sudden and catastrophic climate change. O fair Yima, upon the material world the fatal winters are going to fall, that shall bring the fierce, foul frost. Upon the material world the fatal winters are going to fall, that shall make snowflakes fall thick, even on the highest tops of mountains. Therefore make thee a vara, a hypogeum or underground enclosure, long as a riding ground on every side of the square, and thither bring the seeds of sheep and oxen, of men, of dogs, of birds, and of red blazing fires. Thither thou shalt bring the seeds of men and women of the greatest, best, and finest kinds on this earth. Thither shalt thou bring the seeds of every kind of cattle, of the greatest, best, and finest kinds on this earth. Thither shalt thou bring the seeds of every kind of tree, of the greatest, best, and finest kinds on this earth. Thither shalt thou bring the seeds of every kind of fruit, the fullest of food and the sweetest of odour. All those seeds shalt thou bring, two of every kind, to be kept inexhaustible there, so long as those men shall stay in the vara. There shall be no hump-backed, none bulged forward there, no impotent, no lunatic, no leprous. So, you get the idea, this underground hideaway was to serve as a refuge, from a terrible winter that was about to seize Iriana Vallejo, a winter at the onset of which, as the Bundahish, another Zoroastrian text, informs us, the evil spirit sprang like a snake out of the sky down to the earth. He rushed in at noon, and thereby the sky was as shattered and frightened by him as a sheep by a wolf. He came onto the water which was arranged below the earth, and then the middle of this earth was pierced and entered by him. He rushed out upon the whole creation, and he made the world quite as injured and dark at midday, as though it were dark night. Studying these accounts, I couldn't help but be reminded of the two millennia of warm, fine weather, which must indeed have seemed like a golden age, before the sudden, lethal onset of the younger Dryas 12,800 years ago. The Zoroastrian texts would not be far wrong in describing it as a fierce, foul frost, and as a fatal winter. The evil spirit to whom this affliction is attributed is Angra Mainyu, the agent of darkness, destruction, wickedness, and chaos, who stands in opposition to and seeks to undermine and undo all the good works of Ahura Mazda. For Zoroastrianism is a profoundly dualistic religion, in which human beings and the choices we make for good or evil are seen as the objects of an eternal competition or contest between the opposed forces of darkness and light. And in this contest, the darkness sometimes wins. Thus the Vendidad reminds us that although Ariana Vallejo was the first of the good lands and countries created by Ahura Mazda, it could not resist the evil one. Thereupon came Angra Mainyu, who is all death, and he counter-created by his witchcraft the serpent in the river, and winter, a work of the demons. Now there are ten winter months there, two summer months, and these are cold for the waters, cold for the earth, cold for the trees. Winter falls there, with the worst of its plagues. In other translations, the phrase, the serpent in the river and winter, is given as a great serpent and winter, and alternatively as a mighty serpent and snow. Again, you get the idea. The metaphor that is being repeatedly driven home here is that of the mighty serpent who springs from the sky down to the earth, who penetrates the earth, and who brings a prolonged winter upon the world, 
so severe that it is dark, most turbid, opaque, according to some translations, at midday, and even the fleeting summer months are too cold for human life. Once again, the whole scenario seems very accurately to describe the terrible conditions that would have afflicted the world after the younger Dryas comet spread its trail of destruction across at least fifty million square kilometers, brought on a vehement destroying frost, and threw such quantities of dust into the upper atmosphere, together with smoke from the continent-wide wildfires sparked off by air bursts and superheated ejecta, that a turbid, opaque darkness would indeed have filled the skies, reflecting back the sun's rays and perpetuating something very like a nuclear winter for centuries. The Zoroastrian texts leave us in no doubt that these conditions posed a deadly threat to the future survival of civilization. It was for this reason that Ahura Mazda came to Yima with his warning and his instruction to build an underground shelter where some remnant of humanity could take refuge, keeping safe the seeds of all animals and plants until the dire winter had passed and spring returned to the world. Moreover, the account reveals very little that seems mythical or that obviously derives from flights of religious fancy. Rather, the whole thing has about it an atmosphere of hard-headed, practical planning that adds a chilling note of veracity. For example, the admonition that deformed, impotent, lunatic and leprous people should be kept out of the vara sounds a lot like eugenics, a distasteful policy to be sure, but one that might be implemented if the survival of the human race was at stake and there was limited space available in the refuge. For the same reasons, it's not surprising that only the seeds of the greatest, best, and finest kinds of trees, fruits, and vegetables, those that are fullest of food and sweetest of odor, are to be brought to the vara. Why waste space on anything but the best? Also, although it is certain that a number of carefully selected people were to be admitted to the vara, perhaps as caretakers and managers of the project and as future breeding stock, the emphasis throughout is on seeds which in the case of human beings would be sperm from the males and eggs from the females. So when we read that the vara is to be constructed in three subterranean levels, each smaller than the one above, each with its own system of crisscrossing streets, it is legitimate to wonder whether some kind of storage system, perhaps with ranks of shelves arranged in crisscrossing aisles, might not really be what is meant here. In the largest part of the place... Thou shalt make nine streets, six in the middle part, three in the smallest. To the streets of the largest part, thou shalt bring a thousand seeds of men and women. To the streets of the middle part, six hundred. To the streets of the smallest part, three hundred. If it seems fanciful to imagine that we might, in an almost high-tech sense, be looking at the specifications of a seed bank here, then how are we to assess other technological aspects of the vara, for example, its lighting system? As well as making a door to the place and sealing it up with the golden ring already given to him by Ahura Mazda, Yima is also to fashion a window, self-shining within. When Yima asks for clarification as to the nature of this self-shining window, Ahura Mazda tells him cryptically, there are uncreated lights and created lights. The former are the stars, the moon and the sun, which will not be seen from within the confines of the vara during the long winter, but the latter are artificial lights which shine from below. Yima did as he was instructed and completed the vara, which thereafter glowed with its own light. That accomplished, he then made waters flow in a bed a mile long. There he settled birds by the evergreen banks that bear never-failing food. There he established dwelling places consisting of a house with a balcony, a courtyard, and a gallery. There, too, we're reminded, in accord with the commands of the god, he brought the seeds of men and women. There he brought the seeds of every kind of tree and every kind of fruit. All those seeds he brought, two of every kind, to be kept inexhaustible there, so long as those men shall stay in the vara. Finally, we learn that every fortieth year, to every couple, two are born, a male and a female, and thus it is for every sort of cattle, and the men in the vara which Yima made live the happiest life. 
Interestingly, the translator explains in a footnote drawn from various ancient learned commentaries on the text that the human inhabitants of the Vara live there for 150 years. Some say they never die. Moreover, and particularly intriguing, the births of offspring to every couple do not result from sexual union, but from the seeds deposited in the Vara. Other hints of a mysterious lost technology connected to Yima include a miraculous cup in which he could see everything that was happening anywhere in the world, and a jeweled glass throne, sometimes described as a glass chariot, that was capable of flight. Flood and Rain As well as a climate catastrophe, in the form of an overnight reversion to peak Ice Age cold, we also know that the Younger Dryas involved extensive global flooding as a large fraction of the North American ice cap melted and poured into the world ocean. It is therefore noteworthy that the Zoroastrian texts speak not only of the vehement destroying frost of a global winter, but also of an associated flood accompanied by heavy precipitation in which every single drop of rain became as big as a bowl and the water stood the height of a man over the whole of this earth. On the other side of the world, and much closer to the North American epicenter of the cataclysm, the Popol Vuh, an original document of the ancient Quiche Maya of Guatemala, based on pre-conquest sources, also speaks of a flood, and associates it with much hail, black rain and mist, and indescribable cold. It says, in a remarkable echo of the Zoroastrian tradition, that this was a period when it was cloudy and twilight all over the world. The faces of the sun and the moon were covered. Other Maya sources confirm that these strange and terrible phenomena were experienced by mankind in the time of the ancients. The earth darkened. It happened that the sun was still bright and clear. Then at midday it got dark. Sunlight was not seen again until the twenty-sixth year after the flood. Returning to the Middle East, the famous account of the Hebrew patriarch Noah and the great ark in which he rides out the flood commands attention. It's obvious that there are many parallels with the story of Yima and his Vara. The Vara, after all, is a means of surviving a terrible and devastating winter, which will destroy every living creature by enchaining the earth in a freezing trap of ice and snow. The ark, likewise, is a means of surviving a terrible and devastating flood, which will destroy every living creature by drowning the world in water. In both cases, a deity, Ahura Mazda in the case of the Zoroastrian tradition, the god Yahweh in the case of the Hebrew tradition, intervenes to give advance warning to a good and pure man to prepare for the coming cataclysm. In each case, the essence of the project is to preserve the seeds, or the breeding pairs, of all life, and of every living thing, of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. Easily missed but noteworthy is the fact that Noah's ark, like Yima's vara, is to have a window, is to be closed with a door, and is to consist of three levels. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower second and third stories shalt thou make it. Last but not least, there are hints of a lost lighting technology in Noah's Ark that parallel the references to the artificial lights in the Vara. In the Legends of the Jews, Lewis Ginsberg's remarkable and comprehensive compilation of ancient stories and traditions connected to the Hebrew Bible, we read that the whole journey of the Ark during the year of the flood was conducted in darkness both by day and by night. All the time it lasted, the sun and the moon shed no light. However, just like the self-shining window of the Vara, the ark was illuminated by a precious stone, the light of which was more brilliant by night than by day, so enabling Noah to distinguish between day and night. Underground Cities 
Noah's Ark, as is well known, is said to have ended its journey on the slopes of Mount Ararat, the symbolic heartland of ancient Armenia, but now, as a result of wars in the early 20th century, located within the modern state of Turkey. Turkey, in turn, shares a border with Iran, ancient Persia, from which the accounts of Yimazvara come down to us. It is therefore intriguing that Turkey's Cappadocia region has a very large number of ancient underground structures hewn out of solid rock and usually, like the Vara, consisting of multiple levels stacked one above the other. These underground cities, as they're known, include the eerie and spectacular site of Derinkuyu, which I was able to visit in 2013. Lying beneath a modern town of the same name, Eight of its levels are presently open to the public, although further levels remain closed off below, and astonishingly, a subterranean tunnel several kilometers in length connects it to another similar hypogeum at Kaimakli. Entering Derinkuyu was like crossing some invisible barrier into an unexpected netherworld. One minute I was standing in bright sunshine, the next after I had ducked into the cool, dank, dimly lit system of tunnels and galleries, no self-shining windows now, only low wattage electric light, I felt I had been transported to a realm carved out by mythical dwarves at the dawn of time. In places the tunnels are low and narrow, so that one must stoop and walk in single file between walls, stained and blackened with ancient smoke, and overgrown here and there with green mould. At regular intervals, slid back into deep recesses, I passed hulking megalithic doors, shaped like millstones, five to six feet, 1.5 to 1.8 meters in diameter, and weighing close to half a ton. These were clearly designed to be rolled out to block access. Stairways and steep ramps led down from level to level, and although all the levels were interconnected, the rolling stone doors could be used to isolate them from one another when needed. I noticed a remarkable system of plunging, sheer-sided ventilation shafts connecting the deepest levels with the surface, and doing so to such good effect that the gusts of fresh air were still palpable 80 metres, 260 feet or more beneath the ground. In some places, the passageway I was following would debouch into a junction where tunnels branched off in several directions and more stairways led down to even lower levels. And here and there, now to one side of the passageway, now to the other, sometimes accessed by means of holes cut in the wall, sometimes through full-sized doorways, lay small, low-ceilinged grottos in which even a few people sitting together would have felt cramped. But sometimes those doors would lead into interconnected networks of chambers and passages, and sometimes they would open out suddenly into lofty halls and spacious rooms with barrel vault ceilings looming high overhead, supported on monolithic columns hewn from the living rock. The whole place, in short, is a complex and cunning labyrinth on an immense scale, a work of astonishing architectural complexity, that would be impressive if it had been built above ground, but that is utterly breathtaking when one considers that it all had to be mined, chiseled, hammered, cut and gouged out of the volcanic bedrock. Later studying a plan, I realized that this vast hypogeum, looking in cross-section like a gigantic rabbit warren and extending over an area of more than four square kilometers, lay underfoot wherever one went in the modern town of Derinkuyu, streets beneath streets, rooms beneath rooms, a secret antipodal city of unknown antiquity and of unknown purpose, but certainly the product of immense ingenuity, determination and skill. And Derinkuyu is just one of two hundred such subterranean complexes, each containing a minimum of two levels, with around forty containing three levels or more, that have been identified in Turkey in the area between Kayseri and Nevsahir. Moreover, new discoveries are constantly being made. Derinkuyu itself was found in 1963 after builders renovating the cellar of a modern home broke through to an ancient passageway below. And most recently, in 2014, workers preparing the ground for a new housing project at Nefsahir, an hour's drive north of Derinkuyu, stumbled upon yet another unsuspected hypogeum. Archaeologists were called in, 
and it was quickly realized that this one was bigger than any of the others so far known. As Hassan Unver, mayor of Nevsahir, put it, Derin Kuyu and Kaimakli are little more than kitchens when compared to the newly explored site. It is not a known underground city, added Mehmet Ergun Turan, head of Turkey's Housing Development Administration. Tunnel passages of seven kilometers are being discussed. Naturally, when the discovery was made, we stopped the construction we were planning to do in the area. Several commentators immediately speculated that the newly discovered site might be 5,000 years old. But there is no basis for this, or really for any date. All we can say for sure is that the earliest surviving historical mention of Turkey's underground cities is found in the Anabapsis of the Greek historian Xenophon, written in the 4th century BC. So they are older than that. But the question is, how much older? As the reader will recall from chapter 1, there's no objective way to date structures made entirely of rock. What archaeologists look for, therefore, are organic materials that can be carbon dated. To be useful, however, these organic materials must be excavated from locations under a megalith that has never been moved, for example, or in the original mortar in a joint between two stone blocks that allow reasonable deductions to be made about the date the associated structural elements were put in place. This is why the mysterious decision by the builders of Gobekli Tepe to bury the megalithic enclosures there has been so helpful to archaeology. Once buried, they stayed buried, and organic materials in the fill can thus be used to make valuable inferences about their age. In many other sites, by contrast, there is the possibility that the intrusion of later organic materials will give a falsely young date, and in some, the underground cities of Turkey being a prime example, no reliable dating can be done. This is because the sites were used, reused, and indeed repurposed many times down the ages by many different peoples, with organic materials being introduced on every occasion, thus making it impossible to draw any inferences about the epoch of their original construction. The general view of archaeologists is that the underground structures were originally developed in the 7th or 8th centuries BC by an Indo-European people called the Phrygians, who lived in Cappadocia at the time. The theory is that the Phrygians began the project by widening and deepening natural caves and tunnels that already existed in the volcanic rock, making use of the spaces they created for storage and possibly as places of refuge from attackers. By Roman times, with the Phrygians long gone, the inhabitants of the area were Greek-speaking Christians who further developed and expanded the underground caverns, rededicating some of the rooms as chapels and leaving inscriptions in Greek, some of which survive to this day. In the Byzantine era, from the 8th to the 12th centuries AD, the Eastern Roman Empire was locked in wars with newly Islamicized Arabs and the underground cities became places of refuge again, a function they continued to serve during the Mongol invasions of the 14th century AD. Later still, Greek Christians used the cities to escape persecution at the hands of Turkish Muslim rulers, and this practice continued into the 20th century, when the structures finally fell into disuse after the truce and population exchange between Greece and Turkey in 1923. With such a checkered history, it's easy to see why the underground cities cannot be dated using objective archaeological techniques. Moreover, the vast effort that went into their excavation out of solid rock and their sophisticated ventilation systems speak of powerful long-term motives, far beyond the limited and temporary need for shelter from attackers. With this in mind, let us consider a scenario in which the Phrygians favoured for no good reason by archaeologists as the first makers of the cities, were themselves just one of the many later cultures to make use of them. It is perfectly possible that this is the case, and if so, then it is also possible that these extraordinary underground structures might date back to a time long before the Phrygians, perhaps even as far back as the fatal winters of the younger Dryas that set in around 12,800 years ago. There is no proof of this, of course. Nonetheless, Turkish historian and archaeologist Omer Demir, author of Cappadocia, Cradle of History, is of the opinion that Derinkuyu does in fact date back to the Paleolithic. His argument is based partly on the notion that it already existed in Phrygian times, 
partly on stylistic differences between the upper, older levels and the lower, younger levels, and partly on the fact that marks of the implements used to cut the rock have worn completely away in the upper levels but are still visible in the lower levels. It is necessary for a long period of time to pass for the chisel marks to disappear. This means that there was quite a time difference between the years of construction of the first stories and the last stories. Demir also suggests that the huge quantities of rock excavated to make the underground city, which are nowhere in evidence in the vicinity today, were dumped into local streams and carried off. In one of these streams, the Sognali, at a distance of 26 kilometers, 16 miles from Derinkuyu, hand axes, rock chips, and other Paleolithic artifacts were found. The evidence is suggestive at best. I wouldn't want to bet my life or my reputation on it. Nonetheless, the scenario that sees Derinkuyu and the other underground cities constructed in the Upper Paleolithic around 12,800 years ago at the onset of the Younger Dryas has the great merit of no longer leaving us casting about for a motive commensurate with the huge effort involved. We're informed of that motive quite explicitly in the story of Yima. Stated simply, the cities are varas, cut down into the depths of the earth as places of refuge from the horrors of the younger Dryas, which were not limited to the vehement destroying frost, but as we know from the cosmic impacts ferules and melt glass found in sediment samples at nearby Abu Herrera, also included the terrifying threat of bombardment from the skies. Like a snake out of the sky. It is close to certain if our planet did indeed cross the path of a giant comet 12,800 years ago, as Firestone, Kennet, and West maintain, that the bombardment would not have been limited to the large fragments that came down during the first event. The comet's debris stream would have remained on an Earth-crossing orbit and would very likely have resulted in decades, perhaps even centuries, of subsequent bombardments, not on the same scale of intensity as the initial encounter, but nonetheless able to cause catastrophic damage and to spread enough fear and dismay of the mighty serpent lingering in the heavens to justify the construction of secure underground shelters. Indeed, as we will see, the Earth may still cross the debris stream of the giant Younger Dryas comet today, and large, deadly objects, blacker than coal, invisible to our telescopes, may still be orbiting in that stream today. I'm reminded again of the Ojibwa prophecy, reviewed in Chapter 3. The star with the long white tail is going to destroy the world someday, when it comes low again. That's the comet called Long-Tailed Heavenly Climbing Star. Is the Younger Dryas comet coming back? Could it be that it did not spend all its anger and destructive force with the fragments that hit the earth and caused the vehement destroying winter of the Younger Dryas 12,800 years ago? Curiously, the ancient Iranian traditions contain a prophecy also, for it is said that Yima will return and will walk again amongst men when... The signs foreshadowing the last of days appear. Of these the worst will be a winter more terrible than any the world has seen before, when it will rain and snow and hail for three long years. The fiery descent of more fragments of the comet could bring about such a winter, just as happened 12,800 years ago. And just as happened then, it would do so in part because the skies would be darkened by debris and smoke from the wildfires caused by airbursts and by the superheated ejector from the impacts on land. These are grave matters, and we will return to them in chapter 19. But first we must consider the story of Noah, the Hebrew counterpart of Yima, carried by the waters of the flood, so we are told, to the slopes of Mount Ararat, just a few days' walk from Gobekli Tepe, the Noah story also contains a prophecy, which is made manifest in the New Testament, 2 Peter 3, verses 3 to 7. By water, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Or as the old song has it, God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water. The fire next time.
Chapter 8 The Antediluvians The biblical story of the deluge is too familiar to require extensive repetition here. The essential elements can be summarized as follows. A life-destroying global flood sent by God to punish human wickedness. A man, Noah, selected by God and given advance warning of the coming cataclysm so that he can build a survival ship, the ark. The preservation in the ark of the seeds or breeding pairs of all forms of life, with a particular emphasis on human life. Noah and his wife, together with their sons and their wives, and animal life, of fowls after their kind, as we saw in the last chapter, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. The ark rides out the flood until the waters subside. The ark comes to rest on the mountains of Ararat. When the waters have dried up from the earth, God instructs Noah to leave the ark with his family and to bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. Noah builds an altar on which he sacrifices some of the animals and birds that he has just saved from the flood. The smell of the burnt offerings is pleasing to God. The surviving humans and animals go forth and multiply and fill the earth, as they have been commanded. Mount Ararat rises to 5,137 meters, 16,853 feet, and geologists assure us, on the basis of excellent science, that no part of it has ever been covered by oceanic floodwaters since it began to take shape as a mountain near the end of the early Miocene, some 16 million years ago. The presence of anatomically modern humans in the world, as we saw in the last chapter, cannot be traced back further than 200,000 years, and even the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee, a creature that was very far from being in any sense human, takes us back barely six million years. So the notion of a boat with humans on board being washed up on Mount Ararat is a chronological impossibility. Nonetheless, it is intriguing that the story of the deluge as given in the Old Testament makes specific and deliberate mention of the mountains of Ararat. The mount does in fact have twin peaks, which in biblical times were understood as being part of the kingdom of Ararat, the historic land of Urartu, conquered by the Assyrian king Shalmaneser in the late 2nd millennium BC. Due to the limited archaeology that has been undertaken in the region, historians confess that the origins of Urartu must remain obscure, but the earliest known settlements and the beginnings of agriculture in the region have been traced back to approximately 10,000 to 9,000 BC, in other words, to the period of Gobekli Tepe. Moreover, this whole area, Mount Ararat and Gobekli Tepe very much included, formed the heartland of historic Armenia, the direct descendant of the biblical kingdom of Ararat, whose inhabitants saw and still today see themselves as the peoples of Ararat. Written in the 5th century AD, Moses Korinatsi's influential History of the Armenians attributed the founding of the nation to the patriarch Haik, who it was said was the great-great-great-grandson of Noah himself, and thus in the close lineage of the flood survivors who emerged from the ark. Indeed, it is because of Haik that even in the 21st century Armenians still refer to themselves as Hai and to their land as Hayastan. They see it simply as a tragedy of history that so much of this land, again including Gobekli Tepe and Mount Ararat, is now in the possession of the Republic of Turkey following the Armenian genocide of 1915 to 1923, in which more than one million ethnic Armenians are believed to have been killed by Turkish forces. Nationalistic feelings still run high in the communities of the Armenian diaspora scattered around the world and in the tiny rump of historic Armenia that forms the Armenian Republic today. These tensions have not left Gobekli Tepe untouched, and many Armenians are outraged that Turkey claims this uniquely important site as its own heritage, as though the ancient Armenian connection did not even exist. A few minutes' search on the Internet using the key word Portasar, the former Armenian name of Gobekli Tepe, will confirm this.
I'll give a single example here. A YouTube video entitled Turkey Presents Armenian Portasar as Turkish Gobekli Tepe. Amongst the comments, fairly typical of the remarks made by many viewers, we read, This is the way I look at Portasar, Gobekli Tepe. These people deliberately buried a sacred temple. They did this in the anticipation of having it discovered many years in the future. They believed in reincarnation. Those people who built Portasar, Gobekli Tepe, are here among the Armenians. Their spirits have transcended into the Armenian people of today. When you pass on something in your family, you want to make sure that it goes to only that family member and no one else. Portasar and those lands will be returned back to the Armenians in accordance with the laws of nature. In the same vein, though now entirely within the borders of Turkey, Mount Ararat remains a potent symbol of Armenian nationalism. A landscape of Mount Ararat, with the floodwaters receding and Noah's Ark at the summit, dominates the coat of arms of the Republic of Armenia, while the mountain itself, so near and yet so far, looms over the Armenian capital city Yerevan, a haunting and ever-present reminder that the past is never dead, it's not even past. Thus there are many ways in which the story of Noah and his ark, and of a world made anew after a terrible global cataclysm, is still a living force in the region of Gobekli Tepe, that mysterious sanctuary in the Taurus Mountains, where the great stone circles began to be put in place in 9600 BC, a date that marks the exact end of the long, fatal winter of the Younger Dryas. As Klaus Schmidt asked me rhetorically when I interviewed him at the site, see Chapter 1, how likely is it to be an accident that the monumental phase at Gobekli Tepe starts in 9600 BC, when the climate of the whole world has taken a sudden turn for the better, and there's an explosion in nature and in possibilities? There's something else about that date, too. Just as the beginning of the Younger Dryas in 10,800 BC was accompanied by huge global floods and an episode of rapidly rising sea levels as icy meltwater from the North American ice cap poured suddenly into the Atlantic Ocean, so too a second global flood occurred around 9,600 BC as the remnant ice caps in North America and Northern Europe collapsed simultaneously amidst worldwide global warming. The late Cesare Emiliani, professor in the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Miami, carried out isotopic analysis of deep-sea sediments that produced striking evidence of cataclysmic global flooding between 12,000 and 11,000 years ago. So although the floods at the end of the Ice Age could never have carried Noah and his ark thousands of feet above present sea level to the slopes of Mount Ararat, they were indeed global in their extent and would have had devastating consequences for humans living at that time. Mountainous regions such as the Ararat Range would have been natural places of refuge, natural places to bring the seeds of all life and to start again. Therefore, while the Noah story cannot be literally true in every detail, we must consider the possibility that it is true in its essence. In other words, that it does record the construction of an ark in which seeds of useful plants and breeding pairs of animals were perhaps preserved by people who already knew agriculture and who possessed architectural skills, who survived the flood, who migrated to the lands between Mount Ararat and Gobekli Tepe, and who subsequently disseminated agricultural and architectural knowledge to the indigenous hunter-gatherers of that region. The sudden and indeed completely unprecedented appearance of giant stone circles at Gobekli Tepe, which surely could only have been conceived and implemented by people with extensive prior experience of megalithic architecture, and the simultaneous invention of agriculture in the exact same locale, are, in my view, highly suggestive of this possibility. Then, too, there is the haunting sense that Gobekli Tepe itself constitutes a kind of ark, frozen and memorialized in stone, for its iconography is not only all about animals, but also in a number of intriguing reliefs that show women with exposed genitalia and males with erect penises about human fertility. Imagery of the latter sort, including a figure that Carl Lukert, professor of the history of religions at Missouri State University, interprets as a classic earth mother, 
calls to mind God's command to Moses and his family to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Meanwhile, where else but in Noah's Ark can we find a menagerie as eclectic as the one portrayed on the megaliths of Gobekli Tepe, a menagerie as we saw in chapter 1 that includes spiders, scorpions and snakes, every creeping thing of the earth, birds and cattle, fowls after their kind and cattle after their kind, and foxes, felines, goats, sheep, gazelles, boars, bears, etc., etc. In short, as Genesis 6 verse 20 has it, every kind of animal and every kind of creature. A final touch. Noah sacrificed some of the animals and birds that he had just saved from the flood as an offering to God. At Gobekli Tepe, archaeologists have found the butchered bones of many of the animal species depicted on the megalithic pillars. Cities from Before the Flood It has long been recognized by scholars that the biblical flood narrative is not original to the Old Testament, but was borrowed from a much earlier source. Indeed, a source dating back to the oldest true civilization so far acknowledged by archaeology, ancient Sumer, in Mesopotamia, which arose in the 5th millennium BC, flourished during the 4th and 3rd millennia BC, and survived into the 2nd millennium BC. The two earliest surviving written versions of this global flood myth can be seen today at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology and in the private Shoyan collection in Norway. Both are written in cuneiform characters in the Sumerian language, and both have come down to us as fragments rather than complete texts. Of the two, however, it is the University of Pennsylvania tablet found during excavations of the Sumerian city of Nippur located on the Euphrates 200 kilometers south of the modern city of Baghdad, that is the most complete, consisting of the lower third of what was once a six-column tablet of baked clay and dated to the 17th century BC. The Shoyan tablet, though less of it survives, is a little older, dated to the 19th to the 18th centuries BC, repeats some of the lines of the Pennsylvania fragment and adds a few new details not found elsewhere. What rare and precious things these little broken slabs of baked mud are, and what a tale they have to tell. When I first read that tale, I was instantly intrigued, because it contains explicit references to the existence of five antediluvian cities which, we are informed, were swallowed up by the waters of the flood. The first thirty-seven lines of the University of Pennsylvania tablet are missing, so we do not know how the story begins, but at the point where we enter it, the flood is still far in the future. We hear about the creation of human beings, animals and plants. Then another break of 37 lines occurs, after which we find that we have jumped forward in time to an epoch of high civilization. We learn that in this epoch, before the flood, kingship was lowered from heaven. Then comes the reference to the foundation of Sumer's antediluvian cities by an unnamed ruler or a god. After the lofty crown and the throne of kingship had been lowered from heaven, he perfected the rites and the exalted divine laws, founded the five cities in pure places, called their names, apportioned them as cult centers. The first of these cities, Eridu, the second, Bad Tibira, the third, Larak, the fourth, Sipar, the fifth, Shurapak. The Preserver of the Seed of Mankind When we rejoin the narrative after a third, thirty-seven-line lacuna, the scene has changed bewilderingly. Although the flood is still in the future, the foundation of the five antediluvian cities is now far in the past. It is apparent from the context that in the intervening period the city's inhabitants have behaved in such a way as to incur divine displeasure, and that a convocation of the gods has been called to punish mankind with the terrible instrument of an earth-destroying flood. At the moment where we pick up the story again, a few of the gods are dissenting from this decision and expressing their unhappiness and dissatisfaction with it. Without preamble, a man called Zisudra, is then introduced, the Sumerian archetype of the Bibliopatriarch Noah. The text describes him as a pious 
God-fearing king, and allows us to understand that one of the gods has taken pity on him. The name of this god has not survived in the University of Pennsylvania tablet, but the Shoyen fragment gives us a clue when it reveals that Zisudra was not only a king, but also a priest of the god Enki. This god, of whom we'll hear more later, tells Zisudra, Take my word, give ear to my instructions. A flood will sweep over the cult centers. To destroy the seed of mankind is the decision, the word of the assembly of gods. A text break of forty lines follows, which scholars deduce from the many later recensions of the same myth must have continued with detailed instructions to Zisudra to build a giant boat and thus save himself from destruction. When the story resumes, the cataclysm has already begun. All the windstorms, exceedingly powerful, attacked as one. At the same time, the flood swept over the cult centers. For seven days and seven nights the flood swept over the land, and the huge boat was tossed about by the windstorms on the great waters. Throughout the cataclysm the skies remain dark. Then on the eighth day the sun breaks through the clouds, and the rains and raging storms cease. Opening the window of his survival ship, Zisudra looks out over a world that has changed forever and sacrifices an ox and a sheep to the gods. An infuriating lacuna of thirty-nine lines follows, presumably telling us about the place where Zisudra makes landfall and the steps that he takes thereafter. When we pick up the story again, near the end of the text, we find him in the presence of the high gods of the Sumerian pantheon, Anu and Enlil who have repented of their earlier decision to wipe mankind entirely from the face of the earth, and are now so grateful to Zisudra for building his ark and surviving the flood, that they decide to make him immortal. Life like a god they gave him, breath eternal like a god they brought down for him. Zisudra the king, the preserver of the name of vegetation and of the seed of mankind. The final thirty-nine lines are missing. The Seven Sages The late Professor Samuel Noah Kramer, one of the great authorities on ancient Sumer, observed that there are tantalizing obscurities and uncertainties in this oldest surviving written version of the worldwide tradition of the Flood. What there can be no doubt about at all, however, is that the tablet speaks of an urban civilization that existed before the flood and provides us with the names of its sacred cities, Eridu, Bad Tibira, Larak, Sippar, Shurapak. These cities, we are told, quite specifically, were swallowed up in the deluge. Moreover, long after Sumer itself had ceased to exist, rich traditions concerning the five cities, the antediluvian epoch, and the flood survived in Mesopotamia and were repeated by the cultures of Akkad, Assyria, and Babylon that later rose to prominence, almost down to Christian times. Indeed, it is fair to say that the traditional history of this region, as it was told in antiquity, is very clearly divided into two different periods, before and after the flood, and that both periods were regarded by the peoples of the region as absolutely factual and real. We saw in chapter 1 how the Mesopotamian traditions not only preserve memories of antediluvian cities, but also of an antediluvian civilizing hero called Oannes, and the brotherhood of seven sages, the seven Apkalu, who are said to have supported his civilizing mission. As the reader will recall, these sages are often depicted in the surviving art of the region as bearded men, holding a peculiar kind of bag or bucket, but sometimes they are also shown as therianthropes, part bird and part human in form. As I dug deeper, going back and carefully re-reading the accounts of the Babylonian priest Berossos that I had first touched upon when I was researching fingerprints of the gods, I was reminded that Oannes and the Apkalu sages were also sometimes depicted in a different therianthropic form, in this case part fish, part human. Each of them was paired as a counsellor to an antediluvian king, 
and they were renowned for their wisdom in affairs of state and for their skills as architects, builders, and engineers. Berossos compiled his history from the temple archives of Babylon, reputed to have contained public records that had been preserved for over 150,000 years. He has passed on to us a description of Oannes as a monster or a creature. However, what Berossus has to say is surely more suggestive of a man wearing some sort of fish costume, in short, some sort of disguise. The monster, Berossus tells us, had the whole body of a fish, but underneath and attached to the head of the fish, there was another head, human, and joined to the tail of the fish, feet like those of a man, and it had a human voice. At the end of the day, this monster, Oannis, went back to the sea and spent the night. It was amphibious, able to live both on land and in the sea. Later, other monsters similar to Oannis appeared. Bearing in mind that the curious containers carried by Oannis and the Apkalu sages are also depicted on one of the megalithic pillars at Gobekli Tepe, and as we saw in Chapter 1, as far afield as ancient Mexico as well, what are we to make of all this? The mystery deepens when we follow the Mesopotamian traditions further. In summary, Oannis and the Brotherhood of Apkalu sages are depicted as tutoring mankind for many thousands of years. It is during this long passage of time that the five antediluvian cities arise, the centers of a great civilization, and that kingship is lowered from heaven. Prior to the first appearance of Oannis, Berossos says, the people of Mesopotamia lived in a lawless manner, like the beasts of the field. Berossus wrote his history sometime between 290 and 278 BC, but only fragments of it have come down to us, preserved as quotations and summaries in the works of other writers, such as Cincellus and Eusebius. However, scholars recognize that what has been transmitted to us in this way does accurately reflect much more ancient Mesopotamian traditions inscribed on cuneiform tablets going back to the very earliest times. For example, the name Oannis, which has perhaps been distorted by the writers who passed it on to us, turns out to be derived from Uan Adapa in cuneiform, often abbreviated simply to Adapa or to Uana with the Adapa element originally being a title meaning, appropriately for a sage, wise. It is said in the ancient Mesopotamian inscriptions that Uana accomplishes the plans of heaven and earth. Others of the group of antediluvian sages include Uanaduga, who is endowed with comprehensive understanding, and An Enlilada, described as the conjurer of the city of Eridu. This last point, that the seven antediluvian sages were conjurers, sorcerers, warlocks, magicians, is driven home repeatedly in the cuneiform texts. But at the same time, associated with their magical abilities are obviously practical, technological or even scientific skills. Thus they were masters of the chemical recipes. They were medical doctors. They were carpenters, stone cutters, metal workers and goldsmiths and they laid the foundations of cities. Indeed, in later times, all crafts used in royal building and renovation projects were attributed to knowledge that had originated with the antediluvian sages. As Amar Annas of the University of Tartu, Estonia, summarizes in a detailed study, the period before the deluge was one of revelation in the Mesopotamian mythology, when the basis of all later knowledge was laid down. The antediluvian sages were culture heroes who brought the arts of civilization to the land. During the time that follows this period, nothing new is invented. The original revelation is only transmitted and unfolded. Oannis and the other sages taught all the foundations of civilization to antediluvian humankind. The cuneiform tablets of ancient Mesopotamia also shed at least some light on the containers that the Apkalu sages are so often depicted as holding. They are referred to as bandudu, buckets, and are presumed to have held holy water. Very often, too, as the reader will recall from chapter 1, the sage holds in his other hand a cone-like object. 
These are referred to in the inscriptions as mulilu, meaning purifiers. In the same scenes, the sages frequently appear in conjunction with a stylized tree, or sometimes with the figure of a king, or sometimes both. No specific textual references to the tree have survived, but the general assumption of scholars is that it must be a sacred tree, while many believe it represents the tree of life and that it symbolizes both the divine world order and the king who functioned as its earthly administrator. The conclusion, therefore, is that we are looking at a magically protective rite, a, a benediction, an anointing. By sprinkling the tree with holy water, the sages imparted to it their own sanctity, upheld the cosmic harmony, and thus ensured the correct functioning of the plans of heaven and earth. The seven Apkalus were believed to have been created by Enki. Enki is his Sumerian name. The Akkadians called him Ea revealed in the Shoyan tablet as the Sudra's patron, the great god of the subterranean freshwater ocean known as the Abzu. Enki's particular attributes, in addition to his connection to this watery realm, were wisdom, magic, and the arts and crafts of civilization, so it is appropriate that the sages would be amongst his creatures, and that they would frequently be symbolized as fish. The form of the fish Apkalu, as one scholar notes, is linked with the secrets that dwell in the deep, and its never-closing, ever-watchful eyes lend it an omniscient sagacity. Thanks to the advice and teachings of these extraordinary sages, these magicians of the wisdom god Enki, we learn from the cuneiform texts that human civilization achieved rapid technological and scientific advances and entered a phase of exceptional splendor and plenty, the golden age before the flood. All seem to be for the best, in the best of all possible worlds. But as the millennia passed, mankind fell out of harmony with the universe and with the deities, and with one deity in particular, the great Enlil, described as the king, supreme lord, father and creator, and perhaps giving more sense of his personality, as a raging storm. Although the sky god Anu was technically ranked first in the Sumerian pantheon, he was usually a rather remote, impotent figure. Enlil was his second in command, but in fact responsible for most executive decisions. Enki, nominated in some texts as Enlil's younger brother, was ranked third. The Sumerian flood story, as we've seen, has many gaps, but other tablets, such as those containing the Epic of Gilgamesh, arguably the most famous of all surviving Mesopotamian texts, fill in the details, and leave us in no doubt of Enlil's role. In those days the world teemed, the people multiplied, the world bellowed like a wild bull, and the great god was aroused by the clamor. Enlil heard the clamor, and he said to the gods in council, The uproar of mankind is intolerable, and sleep is no longer possible by reason of the Babel. So the gods agreed to exterminate mankind. We know what happened next. The god Enki, in addition to the Shoyan tablet, other later texts also confirm it was he, intervened to warn Zisudra that the instrument of extermination, a great life-destroying flood, was about to be unleashed. Berosos, who calls Zisudra Zisuthros, gives us the next chapter of the story. Enki appeared to Zisuthros in a dream and revealed that mankind would be destroyed by a great flood. He then ordered him to bury together all the tablets, the first, the middle, and the last, and hide them in Sippar, the city of the sun. Then he was to build a boat and board it with his family and his best friends. He was to provision it with food and drink and also take on board wild animals and birds and all four-footed animals. Then, when all was prepared, he was to make ready to sail. He did not stop working until the ship was built. Its length was five stades, 3,000 feet or 914 meters, and its breadth was two stades, 1,200 feet or 366 meters. He boarded the finished ship, equipped for everything as he had been commanded, with his wife, children, and closest friends. The surviving fragments of Berossus do not tell us of the experience of the flood. But the Epic of Gilgamesh does, putting the words into the mouth of Zisudra Zisuthros himself. 
For six days and nights the wind blew. Torrent and tempest and flood overwhelmed the world. Tempest and flood raged together like warring hosts. When the seventh day dawned, the storm from the south subsided. The sea grew calm. The flood was stilled. I looked at the face of the world, and there was silence. The surface of the sea stretched as flat as a rooftop. All mankind had returned to clay. I opened a hatch, and light fell on my face. Then I bowed low. I sat down and I wept. The tears streamed down my face, for on every side was a waste of water. Fourteen leagues distant there appeared a mountain, and there the boat grounded. Barosos again. Then Zisuthros knew that the earth had once again appeared. He disembarked, accompanied by his wife and daughter together with the steersman. He prostrated himself in worship of the earth and set up an altar and sacrificed to the gods. After this, he disappeared, together with those who had left the ship with him. Those who had remained on the ship and had not gone out with Zisuthros searched for him and called out for him by name all about but Zisuthros from then on was seen no more, and the sound of a voice that came out of the air gave instruction that it was their duty to honour the gods, and that Zisuthros, because of the great honour he had shown the gods, had gone to the dwelling place of the gods, and that his wife and daughter and the steersman had enjoyed the same honour. The voice then instructed them to return to the city of Sippar, to dig up the tablets that were buried there, and to turn them over to mankind. The place where they had come to rest was in the land of Armenia. So, in summary, both the biblical and Mesopotamian accounts agree that Armenia was the place of refuge for the survivors of the flood. Berossos, however, adds some important details missing from the Old Testament story. These are first the reference to Sippar, which, as we've seen, was one of the five antediluvian cities remembered in Sumerian traditions. Secondly, the intriguing information that writings or archives from antediluvian times, all the tablets, the first, the middle, and the last, were buried at Sippar before the flood struck. And thirdly, that the survivors were to return to Sippar when the waters had receded in order to dig up the buried tablets and turn them over to mankind. What is envisaged here, therefore, is nothing less than a renewal of civilization after a global cataclysm a renewal in which antediluvian knowledge was to be recovered and repromulgated. The seven sages, however, would no longer have any part to play in the spread of that knowledge. The cuneiform texts tell us they had been sent back to the depths of the Abzu at the time of the flood and ordered never to return. Other sages of human descent, though in one case described as being two-thirds Apkalu, would take their place, some continuity would be maintained and civilization would rise again. In due course, later kings would speak of their link to the antediluvian world. In the late first millennium BC, Nebuchadnezzar I of Babylon described himself as a seed preserved from before the flood, while Ashurbanipal, who ruled the central Mesopotamian empire of Assyria in the 7th century BC, boasted, I learned the craft of Adapa the sage, which is secret knowledge. I am well acquainted with the signs of heaven and earth. I am enjoying the writings on stones from before the flood. It is a curious mystery, as we shall see in the next chapter, that the exact same notions of the seven sages as the bringers of civilization in the remotest antiquity and of the preservation and repromulgation of writings on stones from before the flood turn up in the supposedly completely distinct and unrelated culture of ancient Egypt. Part 4. Resurrection Chapter 9. Island of the Ka The banks of the Nile are lush, lined with palms and green fields, but they are narrow, one from the surrounding deserts thanks only to the gift of fertility bestowed upon them by the eternal river. It's the same story all the way from Cairo to Aswan, where the high dam has permanently changed the divine landscape of the pharaohs by creating Lake Nasser, 
one of the largest man-made bodies of water in the world, which continues south to cross the border with the Sudan. As the level of the lake rose during the 1960s, many ancient Egyptian sites, such as the fortress of Buhan, were submerged. Others, such as the world-famous Abu Simbel and the stunningly beautiful little temple of Isis at Philae, were rescued by being moved block by block and re-erected on higher ground. Others still were dismantled and shipped overseas. For example, the Temple of Dendur, now in New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Temple of Debod, now in the Parque del Oeste in Madrid, and the Temple of Tafe, now in the Rijksmuseum in Leiden in the Netherlands. By such means, the sacred realm of the gods that continuously remade and remanifested itself in Egypt over untold thousands of years in antiquity can be said still to undergo resurrection and rebirth in far-off lands even today. So it was, too, according to its own inscriptions, with the Temple of Horus at Edfu, known as Bedet in ancient times, hence its patron, the falcon god Horus, is often referred to as Horus the Bedetite, Edfu stands on the west bank of the Nile, 110 kilometers, 68 miles, north of Aswan, and was thus spared from flooding by Lake Nasser. The temple as we see it today, its golden sandstone blocks, radiant and graceful beneath the fierce sun of Upper Egypt, is relatively young, the whole complex having been completed during the Ptolemaic period in a series of stages between 237 BC and 57 BC. In every meaningful sense, however, what confronts us here is merely the latest incarnation of much older temples that previously occupied this site, dating at least to the Old Kingdom, 2575 to 2134 BC, and perhaps far beyond. Of the greatest interest, at any rate, is the temple's idea of itself, expressed in the acres of enigmatic inscriptions that cover its walls. These inscriptions, the so-called Edfu building texts, take us back to a very remote period called the early primeval age of the gods. And these gods, it transpires, were not originally Egyptian, but lived on a sacred island, the homeland of the primeval ones, in the midst of a great ocean. Then, at some unspecified time in the past, a terrible disaster, a true cataclysm of flood and fire, as we shall see, overtook this island, where the earliest mansions of the gods had been founded, destroying it utterly, inundating all its holy places, and killing most of its divine inhabitants. Some survived, however, and we are told that this remnant set sail in their ships, for the texts leave us in no doubt these gods of the early primeval age were navigators, to wander the world. Their purpose in doing so was nothing less than to recreate and revivify the essence of their lost homeland, to bring about, in short, the resurrection of the former world of the gods, the recreation of a destroyed world. The general tone, as Egyptologist Eve Anne Elizabeth Raymond confirms in her masterful study of the Edfu building texts, conveys the view that an ancient world, having been constituted, was destroyed, and as a dead world, it came to be the basis of a new period of creation, which at first was the recreation and resurrection of what once had existed in the past. Important in the evaluation of the texts is the realization that they were not composed in the historical temple. On the contrary, as Raymond informs us, the priests and scribes of Edfu merely copied what they regarded as the more important extracts from a vast archive of ancient documents that they had at their disposal. By the 5th century AD, the weight of Roman and Christian fanaticism had brought about the final collapse of ancient Egyptian civilization. Thereafter, with Islamic hatred of the past soon making things even worse, care ceased to be taken of the temples, which were used as storerooms, stables and homes by local people who no longer venerated the ancient gods. In 1837, the English explorer Howard Vyse visited Edfu and described the mess that he found inside. The temple itself, one of the most imposing in Egypt, affords a striking contrast to the miserable hovels, many of which are built upon it and others on vast mounds of rubbish with which it is surrounded. The interior, covered with painted hieroglyphics, 
has been divided by earthen walls to form a magazine for corn, and beneath it are enormous substructions which I entered by a hole from an Arab house. They were full of dirt and filth of every description, but had been built in the most solid manner. Fortunate for us, then, when Edfu still thrived, that priests and scribes who could read the mysterious texts in the temple's library committed themselves to the project of selecting extracts and carving them deeply into the solid and imposing walls of the temple itself. In so doing, whether by accident or design, they ensured that at least these fragments have survived to the present day, whereas the original source documents, looted, used as kindling, thrown into the Nile during the centuries of neglect and mistreatment, have long gone. Inevitably, since they lack their original context, the fragments are often confusing and deeply tantalizing. Even so, they give us a glimpse into wonders and secrets of our past that the source documents, if only we had them, might have revealed to us much more completely. Atlantis in Egypt the famed Greek philosopher Plato, who passed down to us the extraordinary story of Atlantis, destroyed in a terrible cataclysm of flood and fire 9,000 years before the time of Solon, in other words, in 9,600 BC in our calendar, is generally regarded by archaeologists as having made up the whole tale of the Lost Ice Age civilization. The fallback position amongst those grudgingly willing to admit some veracity to the information conveyed in the Timaeus and Critias is that Plato had perhaps based his account on a much more recent cataclysm, centred on the Mediterranean. For example, the eruption of Thera Santorini in the mid-second millennium BC, the notion of a global disaster more than 11,000 years ago, and particularly the heretical idea that it could have wiped out a high civilization of that epoch, is strenuously resisted and indeed ridiculed by the archaeological establishment because, of course, archaeologists claim to know that there was not, and never under any circumstances could have been, a high civilization at that time. They know this not because of any hard evidence which absolutely rules out the existence of an Atlantis-type civilization in the Upper Paleolithic, but rather on the general principle that the result of less than 200 years of scientific archaeology is an agreed timeline for civilization that sees our ancestors moving smoothly out of the Upper Paleolithic into the Neolithic, both by definition Stone Age cultures at around 9600 BC, and then onwards through the development and perfection of agriculture in the millennia that followed, a process that also witnessed the founding of some very large permanent settlements such as Çatalhöyük in Turkey around 7500 BC. By about 4000 BC, the increasing sophistication of economic and social structures and growing organizational abilities made possible the creation of the earliest megalithic sites, such as Gigantia on the Maltese island of Gozo, for example, while the first city-states emerged around 3500 BC in Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley, and soon afterwards in Egypt and on the other side of the world in Peru. The pyramids of Giza are megalithic monuments, so too the Great Sphinx, in the British Isles, Cullinish in the Outer Hebrides and Avebury in southwest England, both dated to around 3000 BC, are the oldest examples of true megalithic sites. The megalithic phase of Stonehenge is thought to have begun around 2400 BC and have continued to around 1800 BC. Within this well-worked-out and long-established chronology, there is simply no room for any prehistoric civilization such as Atlantis. Hence the wish of the mainstream to dismiss Plato's outlandish story by any and every possible means. These means include ridicule of the supposed Egyptian basis for the tale, specifically of the claim made in the Timaeus that priests of Sais in the Delta said Atlantis and its cruel fate were described in sacred records in their temple going back thousands of years before the established beginning of Egyptian civilization in the late 4th millennium BC. To those wedded to the orthodox chronology, the very idea that the priests of Sais might have given Solon a true account of such impossible records, which in due course reached Plato, seems preposterous, an obvious historical oxymoron which deserves only to be ignored. Furthermore, the claim is frequently made that there are no references to Atlantis 
anywhere in surviving ancient Egyptian papyri and inscriptions. Only one Egyptologist, the late Professor John Gwynne Griffiths of the University of Wales at Swansea, who passed away in 2004, had the courage to challenge the consensus. The challenge he presented, however, had nothing to do with the fundamental point of whether Atlantis existed and was destroyed in the 10th millennium BC, but rather with the lesser point of whether Plato, through his ancestor Solon, could indeed have been influenced by genuine ancient Egyptian traditions. Oddly enough, for so learned a man, Griffith seems to have known nothing of Edfu, with its tempting account of a sacred island inhabited by gods and destroyed by flood and fire in primeval times, an obvious prototype for Plato's Atlantis, as we shall see. The professor's focus instead was on a papyrus, catalogued as P. Leningrad 1115, and now kept in Moscow, which contains an intriguing prose story known as the tale of the shipwrecked sailor. In this fairy tale, dating to Egypt's Middle Kingdom between 2000 BC and 1700 BC, Griffiths, quite correctly in my view, did find convincing resemblances to Plato's account of Atlantis. The eponymous shipwrecked sailor in the papyrus tells us of a time when he made a voyage in a great ocean-going vessel that was struck by a giant wave. Then the ship died. Of those in it, not one remained. I was cast on an island by the sea. I spent three days alone, lying in the shelter of trees. I hugged the shade. Then I stretched my legs to discover what I might put in my mouth. I found figs and grapes there, all sorts of fine vegetables, sycamore figs and cucumbers that were as if tended. Fish there were, and fowl. There is nothing that was not there. I stuffed myself and put some down, because I had too much in my arms. The shipwrecked sailor cuts a fire drill, makes fire, and gives a burnt offering to the gods. Then I heard a thundering noise. Trees splintered, the ground trembled. Uncovering my face, I found it was a snake that was coming. He was of thirty cubits, fifteen meters or, or fifty feet. His body was overlaid with gold. His eyebrows were of real lapis lazuli. Then he took me in his mouth and carried me to the place where he lived and set me down unhurt. The serpent questions the sailor on how he came to be on the island, and on hearing his reply tells him not to be afraid. It is a god who has let you live and brought you to this island of the car. There is nothing that is not upon it. It is full of good things. The name Island of the Ka is curious, notes Miriam Lichtheim, the translator of the tale. She adds that the renowned Egyptologist Sir Alan Gardiner rendered it as Phantom Island. It's beyond the scope of this book to present a detailed treatise on the concept of the Ka, the double, the astral or spiritual essence of a person or thing. It existed with the human being during his or her mortal life, but was the superior power in the realms beyond the grave. Indeed, the term for death in the ancient Egyptian language meant going to one's car, or going to one's car in the sky. The gods were also believed to have their cars, and so too were the great monuments of Egypt. Of particular relevance here is that the high god Osiris, Lord of the celestial afterlife kingdom known as the Duat, was always referred to as the Ka of the Pyramids of Giza. The Ka entered eternity before its human host, having served its function by walking at the human side to urge kindness, quietude, honor, and compassion. Throughout the life of the human, the Ka was the conscience, the guardian, the guide. After death, however, the Ka became supreme. With this in mind, Gardner's suggestion that a phantom island is implicated in the tale of the shipwrecked sailor makes sense. The sailor has set out in a boat from the physical realm of Middle Kingdom Egypt, but he has been cast ashore on the island of the Ka, a ghost realm, a place that no longer exists in this world, except in the form of its spiritual essence. The same theme continues as the huge snake that rules the island tells the sailor his sad story. 
I was here with my brothers, and there were children with them. In all, we were seventy-five serpents, children and brothers, without mentioning a little daughter whom I had obtained through prayer. Then a star fell, and they went up in flames through it. It so happened that I was not with them in the fire. I was not among them. I could have died for their sake when I found them as one heap of corpses. In due course a ship passes by and the sailor is rescued. The snake king of the island sends him away with rich presents, myrrh, oils, laudanum, spices, perfume, eye paint, giraffe's tails, great lumps of incense, elephant's tusks, greyhounds, monkeys, baboons, and all kinds of precious things. The sailor, filled with gratitude, wants to return with gifts from Egypt, but before he boards the ship, the serpent takes him aside and tells him, When you have left this place, you will not see this island again. It will have become water. The comparisons with Plato's story of Atlantis that John Gwynne Griffith draws relate primarily to the rich variety of plant and animal life, including the elephants, said to be found on both islands. Here's Plato on Atlantis. There were a great number of elephants in the island, for as there was provision for all other sorts of animals, both for those which live in lakes and marshes and rivers, and also for those which live in mountains and on plains, so there was for the animal which is the largest and most voracious of all. Also, whatever fragrant things there now are in the earth, whether roots or herbage, or woods, or essences which distill from fruit and flower, grew and thrived in that land. Also the fruit which admits of cultivation, both the dry sort, which is given us for nourishment, and any other which we use for food. We call them all by the common name pulse. And the fruits having a hard rind, affording drinks and meats and ointments, all these that sacred island which then beheld the light of the sun brought forth fair and wondrous and in infinite abundance. With such blessings, the earth freely furnished them. In addition, there is the fact that Atlantis is a sacred island, and so too, of course, is the island of the car, to which the shipwrecked sailor has been brought by a god. The closest resemblance by far, however, is in the fate of Atlantis, which was swallowed up by the sea and vanished, just as the island of the car would never be seen again because it had become water. Taking such elements into account, Griffiths concludes that although Plato's story may not derive from Egypt in toto, it nonetheless most certainly owes a conceptual debt to Egypt. His argument is well made. But if he'd been familiar with the Edfu building texts, he might, I think, have stated his case more strongly. Bringing some threads together. We no longer have access to the sacred records once kept at the Temple of Sais in the Delta that Plato tells us contained the story of Atlantis. That temple, which Solon visited around 600 BC, was dedicated to the goddess Neith, and was extremely ancient, dating back at least as far as the First Dynasty, around 3200 BC. Unfortunately, it had been completely destroyed by A.D. 1400, leaving only rubbish heaps and a few scattered blocks on the site that is today occupied by the village of Sa al Hagar. At Edfu, on the other hand, although the original sacred records are also gone, the extracts preserved in the building texts do seem to tell essentially the same story that Solon heard and passed on to Plato and that Griffiths argues also reaches us, albeit in a more fragmented and literary form, in the tale of the shipwrecked sailor. We've already seen that the homeland of the primeval ones in the Edfu texts is described as a sacred island in the midst of a great ocean, so a comparison to the island of the Ka in the tale of the shipwrecked sailor is obvious at the level of the basic geographical setting. The resemblance goes deeper than this, however, since there are many passages in the building texts which make it clear that the first and original god who presided over the homeland of the primeval ones was a dead deity, the Ka. Indeed, we read that the island was also known as the home of the Ka, and that the Ka ruled therein, 
this car who dwelt amongst the reeds of the island. In other words, the homeland of the primeval ones in the Edfu texts is nothing more nor less than the island of the car, and to the extent that Griffiths is correct to see a prototype for Plato's Atlantis in the island of the car, then the homeland of the primeval ones is also a prototype. What helps to firm up the comparison are certain details given in the building texts that do not appear in the tale of the shipwrecked sailor. Of particular interest is a passage at Edfu in which we read of a circular, water-filled channel surrounding the original sacred domain that lay at the heart of the island of the primeval ones, a ring of water that was intended to fortify and protect that domain. In this there is, of course, a direct parallel to Atlantis, where the sacred domain on which stood the temple and the palace of the god, whom Plato names as Poseidon, was likewise surrounded by a ring of water, itself placed in the midst of further such concentric rings, separated by rings of land, again with the purpose of fortification and protection. Other details are found in all three stories. For example, the striking parallel between the inundation of the island of Atlantis, as Plato recounts it, and the inundation of the island of the car in the tale of the shipwrecked sailor, is eerily duplicated in the inundation of the homeland of the primeval ones, as described in the Edfu texts, where we read of an upheaval so violent that it destroyed the sacred land, the primeval water submerged the island, and the island became the tomb of the original divine inhabitants. The homeland ended in darkness beneath the primeval waters. Compare this with Plato, who tells us of earthquakes and floods of extraordinary violence, as a result of which, in a single terrible day and night, the island of Atlantis was swallowed up by the sea and vanished. Intriguingly, Plato also hints at the immediate cause of the earthquakes and floods that destroyed Atlantis. In the Timaeus, as a prelude to his account of the lost civilization and its demise, he reports that the Egyptian priests from whom Solon received the story began by speaking of a celestial cataclysm. There have been, and will be, many different calamities to destroy mankind the greatest of them being by fire and water, lesser ones by countless other means. Your own story of how Phaethon, child of the sun, harnessed his father's chariot, but was unable to guide it along his father's course, and so burnt up things on earth and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt, is a mythical version of the truth, that there is, at long intervals, a variation in the course of the heavenly bodies, and a consequent widespread destruction by fire of things on earth. In the tale of the shipwrecked sailor, too, we find that a celestial cataclysm plays a part. As the reader will recall, the serpent king speaks of the destruction of his race when a star fell, and they went up in flames through it. The same ominous agency turns up in the Edfu building texts, where a serpent is again invoked but with the significant twist that here it is not the sad and wise ruler of the island, but rather the fatal enemy of the island and its divine inhabitants. To place what the Edfu texts have to say about this in a wider context, let us revisit the Zoroastrian tradition of an evil spirit that sprang like a snake out of the sky down to the earth. He rushed in at noon, and thereby the sky was as shattered and frightened by him as a sheep by a wolf. He came onto the water, which was arranged below the earth, and then the middle of this earth was pierced and entered by him. He rushed out upon the whole creation, and he made the world quite as injured and dark at midday, as though it were dark night. To my mind, as I argued in chapter 7, what we have here is a mythical version of the truth, with the underlying truth being a cataclysmic encounter with a comet, now let's look at the relevant passages from the Edfu building texts, where a snake called Nipwer, the great leaping one, is described as the chief enemy of the god. It is his assault that causes the homeland of the primeval ones to be swallowed up by the sea, but first the feet of the deity of the island, the Ka, here explicitly described as the earth god, 
are pierced and the domain was split. This, as Raymond comments, is a clear picture of a disaster. It destroyed the sacred land with the result that its divine inhabitants died. This interpretation accords with other parts of the first Edfu record, which allude to the death of a company, a group of divine beings, and to the darkness that covered the primeval island. Multiple threads seem to come together here. Plato's variation in the course of heavenly bodies, leading to widespread destruction on earth, the murderous falling star in the tail of the shipwrecked sailor, the snake of Zoroastrian tradition that springs out of the sky, pierces the earth and makes the world dark, the great leaping serpent of the Edfu texts whose assault pierces the feet of the earth god, leads to death for the divine company and cloaks the primeval island in darkness. I'm reminded, too, of the Ojibwa myth reported in Chapter 3 of the star with the long white tail that came down here once thousands of years ago, a star specifically recognized as a comet that caused the first flooding of the earth. Comet and asteroid impacts not only cause floods, but can also impose huge stresses on the crust of the Earth, resulting in increased earthquake and volcanic activity. How likely, therefore, is it to be an accident that Plato, who was at pains to preface his story with the thunderbolts of Phaethon, implicated both earthquakes and floods in the demise of Atlantis, and carefully dated the whole episode to 9,000 years before the time of Solon, in other words, 9,600 B.C., I suggest there's a real possibility that all these traditions are pointing to the same horrific epoch of prehistory. This epoch, as I've argued in earlier chapters, is the Younger Dryas, which began cataclysmically 12,800 years ago and ended equally cataclysmically 11,600 years ago with large-scale floods, associated with the cascading collapse of the North American and Northern European ice caps occurring at both dates. The case for multiple impacts from a large fragmented comet initiating the Younger Dryas is, I believe, a very strong one. In the light of the mythological evidence, the possibility must also be considered that it was further encounters with the orbiting debris stream of the same giant comet that brought the Younger Dryas to an end. In the process... I suggest, as so many myths and traditions from all around the world maintain, an advanced civilization was lost to history. Mystery of the Sound Eye Archaeology is not wrong when it tells us that most of the world in the epoch of 12,800 to 11,600 years ago was populated by hunter-gatherers, locked in the Stone Age, and lacking even the beginnings of agriculture. But Plato, to the eternal frustration of archaeologists, leaves us in no doubt that Atlantis was very different. In brief, it was a great and wonderful empire, commanding a large navy of ocean-going ships that gave it the ability to project its power into Africa as far as Egypt, into Europe as far as Italy, and onto the mainland of what Plato calls the whole opposite continent, by which many believe he meant the Americas, which surrounds what can truly be called the ocean. Atlantis was a fully developed city-state, drawing its wealth from a mature and prosperous agricultural economy, and boasting advanced metallurgy and sophisticated architectural and engineering works, all enhanced by an immense wealth of natural resources. With such blessings, the earth freely furnished them. Meanwhile, they went on constructing their temples and palaces and harbors and docks, and they arranged the whole country in the following manner. First of all, they bridged over the zones of sea, which surrounded the ancient metropolis, making a road to and from the royal palace, which they continued to ornament in successive generations until they made the building a marvel to behold for size and for beauty. And beginning from the sea, they bored a canal of 300 feet in width and 100 feet in depth and 50 stadia in length, which they carried through to the outermost zone, making a passage from the sea up to this which became a harbour and leaving an opening sufficient to enable the largest vessels to find ingress. Moreover, they divided at the bridges the zones of land which parted the zones of sea, 
leaving room for a single trireme to pass out of one zone into another, and they covered over the channels so as to leave a way underneath for the ships, for the banks were raised considerably above the water. Now the largest of the zones into which a passage was cut from the sea was three stadia in breadth, and the zone of land which came next of equal breadth, but the next two zones, the one of water, the other of land, were two stadia, and the one which surrounded the central island was a stadium only in width. The island in which the palace was situated had a diameter of five stadia. All this, including the zones and the bridge, which was the sixth part of a stadium in width, they surrounded by a stone wall on every side, placing towers and gates on the bridges where the sea passed in. The stone which was used in the work they quarried from underneath the center island, and from underneath the zones on the outer wall as well as the inner side. One kind was white, another black, and a third red, and as they quarried they at the same time hollowed out double docks, having roofs formed out of the native rock. Some of their buildings were simple, but in others they put together different stones, varying the color to please the eye and to be a natural source of delight. The entire circuit of the wall, which went round the outermost zone, they covered with a coating of brass, and the circuit of the next wall they coated with tin, and the third, which encompassed the citadel, flashed with the red light of orichalcum. Nobody knows exactly what metal the fabled orichalcum of Atlantis was, since Plato tells us that it survived in his day only in name, but it adds to the aura of technological mastery that still surrounds the fabled lost civilization. Seagoing navigation, advanced agriculture, and large-scale architectural and engineering works are also amongst the notable characteristics of the homeland of the primeval ones described in the Edfu texts. We've already seen how the ring system of canals is prefigured there, but so too are the grand temples of Atlantis, we read, for example, of a chapel measuring 90 by 20 cubits, approximately 45 by 10 meters or 150 by 35 feet. At its front was erected a large forecourt of 90 by 90 cubits. Then a hyperstyle hall of 50 by 30 cubits was constructed. Then another hall of 20 by 30 cubits and two consecutive halls, each 45 by 20 cubits, were added at the front of the first hyperstyle hall. An enclosure is described, measuring 300 cubits, 150 meters or 500 feet from west to east, and 400 cubits from north to south. Within it is a temple, the mansion of the god, and within that a holy of holies, measuring 90 cubits from east to west. We also read of a third enclosure on the same grand scale of 300 by 400 cubits. It too contains an inner sanctuary measuring 90 cubits from west to east and 20 cubits from north to south, subdivided into three rooms, each of which was 30 cubits by 20 cubits. But the strongest hint of high technology in the homeland of the primeval ones is given in one of the Edfu extracts that describes the cataclysmic demise of the island, following the assault of the celestial snake called the Great Leaping One, that pierces the earth god and splits the domain. Then we read, and it is most mysterious, that the sound eye fell. The mention of the sound eye appears a little strange, admits Raymond. But she explains, though the texts are obscure on the point, that it seems to be the name of the center of the light which illumined the island. We are, in short, to envisage some artificial system of illumination which lights up the primeval island of the gods. Beyond that, all that can be said with due reserve is that it looks as though there is an allusion to a disaster which caused the fall of the sound eye with the result that complete darkness fell upon the domain of the Creator. The Gods Sailed What happened after the disaster that struck Atlantis? Were there survivors? If there were, what did they do with the advanced knowledge they possessed? Plato's Timaeus and Critias provide no answers to these questions, but the Edfu building texts do making it clear that there were survivors of the disaster that struck the homeland of the primeval ones, companies of gods who were already at sea when the sacred island was flooded. They sailed back to the former location of the island after the cataclysm, but saw 
only reeds on the surface of the water. There was a great deal of mud there also, a scene reminiscent of Plato's description of the vicinity of Atlantis after the flood. The sea in that area is impassable to navigation, which is hindered by mud just below the surface, the remains of the sunken island. In the case of the homeland of the primeval ones, it seems that enough of the sunken island remained close to the surface for the survivors to attempt to win some of it back from the sea, an endeavour referred to in the Edfu texts as the creation of the pay lands, where the term pay land clearly means lands reclaimed from the sea. Thus we read how the Sheptiwa recited sacred spells, the water gradually receded from the edge of the island, and the actual land of the pay land was brought out. The texts then describe a process of continuous creation by the emergence of a progressive series of plots of land. The creation of these sacred domains was, in fact, a resurrection and restoration of what had been in the past but had vanished. At the end there appeared further paylands, which brought to a new life the former homeland. Nonetheless, despite these efforts, the fact remained that the cataclysm had so utterly devastated the primeval island that no amount of reclamation could restore it to its former glory. The only solution for the survivors, therefore, was to attempt to recreate it elsewhere, in regions that had not been as badly affected by the catastrophe. The result saw the beginning of a great project of which the world we live in today is the result. What the Edfu texts say, explains Raymond, is that the gods left the original Paylands. They sailed to another part of the primeval world and journeyed through the lands of the primeval age. In any place in which they settled, they founded new, sacred domains. Their mission, in short, was to re-promulgate the lost civilization and the lost religion of the days before the flood. As Raymond puts it, this second era of the primeval age saw the development of the domains that survived in historical times. Begin again like children. The Edfu texts make allusion to the smud, wandering of the company of gods, who initiated the civilizing project. Their leader was the falcon Horus, after whom the temple at Edfu was much later dedicated but present also was Thoth, the god of wisdom. Accompanying Horus and Thoth were the Sheptua, a group of deities charged with a specific responsibility for creation, the builder gods, who accomplished the actual work of building, and the seven sages. This is a matter of interest in the light of the Mesopotamian traditions of the Apkalus, explored in chapter 8, and it seems that something more than coincidence is involved. The reader will recall that the Apkalus were often depicted as hybrid creatures, part bird of prey, part human in appearance. Similarly, the seven sages of the Edfu texts are described as primeval deities who were capable of assuming the form of falcons and resembling falcons. Also, exactly like the antediluvian Apkalus, the seven sages of the Edfu texts, who are not mentioned elsewhere in ancient Egyptian inscriptions, were the magicians amongst the gods. They were the seers who could foretell the future, and they could endue with power the substances of the earth, a process of creation by the word of the creators that Raymond notes has no equivalent. They were, in addition, believed to have the ability to magnify things, and thus to provide magical protection. On this point, the best sense Raymond is able to make of what she describes as an unusually obscure text is that the protection was constituted by means of symbols. The magical power of protecting was conferred by a giving of names. The Apkalus mingled their magic with practical skills, such as laying the foundations of cities and temples. Similarly, the seven sages of the Edfu texts also had their practical architectural side, and many passages testify to their involvement in the setting out and construction of buildings and in the laying of foundations. Moreover, the Egyptians believed that the ground plans of the historical temples were established according to what the sages of the primeval age revealed to Thoth. This hint of a special connection between the sages and Thoth is, of course, a further parallel, for as we've seen, the Apkalus were linked to Enki, 
the Mesopotamian god of wisdom. In the Mesopotamian inscriptions, however, Enki is clearly superior to the sages. Indeed, he is their maker. But in the Edfu texts, strangely, it appears that the knowledge of the sages is regarded as superior to that of the wisdom god Thoth. Indeed, it was the tradition at Edfu that the original records and archives from which the texts were extracted were nothing less than the words of the sages given as dictation to Thoth, who had then consigned them to writing. The texts further disclose that the sages of the mythical age were believed to be the only divine beings who knew how the temples and sacred places were created, and were themselves the very creators of knowledge, which thereafter could only be passed on, but not invented anew. This finds parallels in the Mesopotamian notion that since the time of the antediluvian Apkalus, nothing new had been invented, with the original revelation simply being retransmitted and unfolded in later epochs. Without laboring the point further, therefore, it seems to me that the idea conveyed so strongly in the cuneiform inscriptions of ancient Mesopotamia of a project to recover and repromulgate antediluvian knowledge after a global cataclysm is rather exactly the same project that is set out in the Edfu building texts, which in turn bear uncanny and troubling resemblances to Plato's report of the destroyed Ice Age civilization of Atlantis. More than that, the Edfu texts invite us to consider the possibility that the survivors of the lost civilization, thought of as gods but manifestly human, albeit with mysterious powers, set about wandering the world after the flood. By happenstance, it was only hunter-gatherer populations, the peoples of the mountains and the deserts, the unlettered and the uncultured, as Plato so eloquently put it in his Timaeus, who had been spared the scourge of the deluge. But the civilizers entertained the desperate hope, if their mission would succeed, that mankind might not have to begin again like children, in complete ignorance of what happened in early times. The evidence of the Mesopotamian inscriptions, and of Gobekli Tepe, to which we will return, is that the mountain lands of ancient Armenia and eastern Turkey were amongst the primal wildernesses to which the civilizers made their way after the flood. But the testimony of Edfu is that they also came to the Nile flowing in its fertile valley through the deserts of Egypt. Moreover, the building texts say very clearly which part of Egypt they came to first. And it was not Edfu, as we'll see in the next chapter. Chapter 10. Monastery of the Seven Sages In his Timaeus, we've seen how Plato speaks of events described in ancient Egyptian temple records that took place 9,000 years before the time of Solon, in other words, in 9,600 BC. Nor is the Timaeus the only place where Plato alludes to such vast antiquity. In his Laws, for example... He says of the ancient Egyptians, If you examine their art on the spot, you will find that ten thousand years ago, and I'm not speaking loosely, I mean literally ten thousand, paintings and reliefs were produced that are no better and no worse than those of today. It's interesting how the Greek philosopher makes a point of this ten thousand years ago, emphasizing that he's not speaking loosely, that he really means it. But we live, supposedly, in a more scientific age, with the benefit of objective dating techniques. So what are we to make of such a chronology? Plato was born around 428 BC, so his reference to 10,000 years ago translates to around 10,400 BC in our calendar, within a whisker of the date of 10,450 BC that I proposed in Fingerprints of the Gods for the remote epoch, Zeptepi, the first time, when the ancient Egyptians believed that the gods walked the earth and the civilization of the Nile Valley had its true beginnings. The date, based on findings that arose from research underlying the Orion mystery, my friend Robert Boval's groundbreaking 1994 study of the astronomical aspects of the world-famous pyramids of Giza in Egypt, was developed further by the two of us in 1996 in our co-authored book, Keeper of Genesis, titled The Message of the Sphinx in the U.S. 
In brief, the date arises from the extraordinarily precise layout of the principal monuments of the Giza Plateau and the relationship of these monuments to certain stars in the sky. For full details, I refer the reader to Fingerprints of the Gods and to Keeper of Genesis, where this issue is explored in depth. But the heart of the matter lies in the fact that the positions of the stars in the sky are not fixed and finite, but change very gradually over a great cycle, known to astronomers as the precessional cycle, that unfolds in a period of 25,920 years. The cycle is the result of a motion of the Earth itself, a slow, circular wobble of the planet's axis of rotation unfolding at the rate of one degree every 72 years. Since the Earth is the viewing platform from which we observe the stars, these changes in orientation inevitably affect the positions and rising times of all stars as viewed from Earth. Our pole star, for example, around which the remainder of the heavens appear to revolve, is simply the star at which the Earth's extended axis, passing through the geographical North Pole, points most directly. Presently, it is Polaris, Alpha Ursae Minoris, in the constellation of the Little Bear. But the effect of precession is to change the pole star over very long periods of time. Thus, around 3000 BC, just before the start of the Pyramid Age in Egypt, the pole star was Thuban, Alpha Draconis in the constellation of Draco. At the time of the Greeks, it was Beta Ursae Minoris. In AD 14,000, it will be Vega. Sometimes, in this long cyclical journey, the extended north pole of the Earth will point at empty space, and then there will be no useful pole star. The most dramatic, and indeed beautiful and aesthetically pleasing effects of precession, however, are those observed at the horizon on the March equinox, when night and day are of equal length, and when the sun rises perfectly due east, against the background of the twelve constellations of the zodiac. The rate of change is the same as at the pole, in other words, just one degree every 72 years, so it cannot easily be observed, let alone measured, in a single human lifetime. But if yours is a culture that keeps careful records over very long periods, it will be noted that the zodiacal constellation that houses the sun on that special day, marking the beginning of spring in the northern hemisphere, does indeed very slowly shift along the horizon until eventually the next constellation takes its place. Broadly speaking, the sun spends 2,160 years in each house of the zodiac. 30 degrees by 72 years, and since there are 12 zodiacal houses, the result is that the great year, the full precessional cycle, unfolds in 12 times 2,160 years, in other words, 25,920 years, at which point the cycle is back at its starting point, and a new great year begins. In the sun's annual path through the zodiac, spending approximately one month in each sign, as all of us who check our horoscopes are aware, Aquarius is followed by Pisces, which in turn is followed by Aries, which is followed by Taurus, then Gemini, then Cancer, then Leo, etc., etc. But the slow, majestic, processional course of the sun through the great year is a backwards motion, that unfolds in exactly the opposite direction, thus Leo, Cancer, Gemini, Taurus, Aries, Pisces, Aquarius, with each month being 2,160 years in length. So, to give some specific examples, it is not an accident that the early Christians used the fish as their symbol, since the constellation of Pisces housed the sun on the spring equinox from the very beginning of the Christian era until today. Nor is the famous song wrong to state that we live in the dawning of the age of Aquarius, for the early 21st century does indeed stand in the astrological no-man's land near the end of the age of Pisces and on the threshold of the new age of Aquarius. Going back before the age of Pisces, we come to the age of Aries, 2330 BC to 170 BC, when, in ancient Egypt, rams were the dominant symbolic motif for example, the ram-headed sphinxes at the temple of Karnak in Luxor, and before that to the age of Taurus, 
4490 BC to 2330 BC, when the cult of the Apis bull was initiated as early as the First Dynasty, or perhaps before. Different astrologers and astronomers might choose to move the constellation boundaries a few degrees, and thus a century or two, in one direction or another. But the general schema is well understood, and the dates given above stand as a good approximation to the facts. Moving back in time further, as it is easy to do with modern computer programs that simulate ancient skies, we come eventually to the age of Leo, when the constellation of Leo, the lion, housed the sun on the spring equinox. This astrological age spans the period between 10,970 B.C., and 8810 BC, although again, depending on where one sets the constellation boundaries, the dates might be pushed back or forward by a couple of centuries. What is clear, however, even with a little boundary juggling, is that the age of Leo pretty much perfectly encloses the younger Dryas, 10,800 to 9,600 BC, something that I was unaware of when I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods. And it was, of course, also the age of Leo that I signalled in fingerprints as the most likely candidate for the remote epoch that the ancient Egyptians called Zeptepi, the first time. Again, I refer readers to fingerprints and to Keeper of Genesis and to my later book Heaven's Mirror for more detailed discussions of the astronomical facts and of the ideas behind them. The essence of the argument, however, is that there was an ancient, globally distributed doctrine, as above, so below, that set out quite deliberately to create monuments on the ground that copied the patterns of certain significant constellations in the sky. Moreover, since the positions of all stars change slowly but continuously as a result of the procession, it is possible to use particular configurations of astronomically aligned monuments to deduce the dates that they represent, in other words, the dates when the stars were last in the positions depicted by the monuments on the ground. The Giza Plateau contains the world's most striking array of astronomically aligned monuments, and for purposes of clarity, let me emphasize that these alignments have nothing to do with compass directions. The north indicated by a compass is magnetic north, which can vary by 10 degrees or more from true north, and wanders constantly because of magnetic changes in the Earth's core. True north is the geographical north pole of the Earth, in other words, the pivot of our planet's axis of rotation. From it, true south, east and west are derived. It is therefore significant that the gaze of the Great Sphinx is perfectly targeted on true east, while the three great pyramids are aligned with uncanny precision to true north and south. Indeed, the error in the case of the Great Pyramid is just three sixtieths of a single degree. What this tells us is that all these monuments were set out using astronomy, for it is not possible to achieve such precision by any other means. In other words, even if there were no additional astronomical characteristics present, we would have to say, on grounds of accuracy of alignment alone, that astronomers had been at work here. But in fact, there are many other astronomical characteristics, not only in the monuments themselves, but also in ancient Egyptian scriptures such as the pyramid texts. And for these, since I wish to avoid unnecessary repetition, I again refer the reader to my earlier books. The heart of the matter, however, involves two constellations. The constellation of Leo, rising due east above the sun at dawn on the spring equinox in the epoch of 10,500 BC, and the constellation of Orion, which the ancient Egyptians visualized as the celestial figure of the god Osiris, the deceased god-king, who ruled over the afterlife kingdom known as the Duat. As we saw in chapter 9, Osiris was also believed in some way to be the Ka, the double or spiritual essence of the pyramids of Giza. I will not vex the reader with lengthy substantiations of the assertions that follow, since they are fully backed up, referenced and documented in my earlier books, but an uncanny sky-ground lock occurs at Giza in the epoch of 10,500 B.C. I had opted for a date fifty years later, 10,450 B.C. in fingerprints, but such minor details are not really significant, since the stellar changes are so slow 
even within a single astrological age, that the same general configuration holds good for many centuries. Indeed, it's true to say that the Giza sky ground lock stays in place throughout most, if not all, of the Younger Dryas, from 10,800 BC down to 9,600 BC. Effectively, therefore, the epoch of the first time, which I will continue for ease of reference to refer to as the epoch of 10,500 BC, is the epoch of the Younger Dryas, and while it was a time of freezing temperatures further north, particularly in North America and Northern Europe, indications are that the climate in Egypt would have been much more comfortable and conducive, and much wetter and more fertile than it is today. This is not to say that Egypt was entirely spared the cataclysms of the Younger Dryas. There were powerful and destructive Nile floods, as we shall see. But by comparison with many other parts of the world, it would have stood out as an inviting refuge. As above, so below. To return to the matter of the sky-ground lock at Giza in the epoch of 10,500 BC, let us consider first the lion-bodied, and very likely once lion-headed monument, oriented perfectly due east, that we call the Great Sphinx. It looks not only at the rising sun on the spring equinox, but also at the constellation that houses the sun on the equinox. Today, therefore, this monument gazes at the cusp between Pisces and Aquarius. At the time of the building of the Temple of Karnak, it gazed at the constellation of Aries, and in the Old Kingdom, when the Sphinx was supposedly built, it gazed at the constellation of Taurus the Bull, clearly not a perfect sky-ground match. Indeed, only in one epoch in the last 25,920 years has the lion-bodied Sphinx looked out at its own celestial counterpart, the constellation of Leo, in the pre-dawn on the spring equinox, and that was in the epoch of 10,500 B.C., but there is more. In that same epoch, at the exact moment that the sun bisected the horizon due east, the three belt stars of the constellation of Orion lay due south on the meridian, and they did so in a pattern that very precisely matches the pattern of the three great pyramids on the ground, thus making sublime sense of the image of Osiris Orion as the car or double of the pyramids. After Robert Boval presented the Orion correlation to a global readership in his 1994 book The Orion Mystery, and after the further work I did on the subject in Fingerprints of the Gods and that Robert and I did together in Keeper of Genesis, the hypothesis came in for a great deal of criticism from the mainstream archaeoastronomer Ed Krupp of the Griffiths Observatory in Los Angeles. Krupp claimed that the correlation was upside down, an argument of some sophistry, based on the apparent curvature of the sky, which means that the highest of the three stars of Orion's belt, matched in the Orion correlation by the southernmost of the three pyramids, is effectively the northernmost star. Refuting this, we were able to demonstrate that laying the pyramids out on the ground in the way that would satisfy Krupp might be technically correct in terms of modern astronomical conventions, but would not produce an immediately recognisable and visually pleasing similitude between what is seen in the sky and what is seen on the ground, if, on the other hand, one steers clear of 21st century astronomical conventions in which north is up and simply models on the ground, rather as an artist or a sculptor would, what would have been seen in the sky at dawn on the spring equinox in the epoch of 10,500 BC, then the result is indeed a very good match, as Robert Boval has always claimed, between the three great pyramids and the three stars of Orion's belt. Moreover, as noted above, the particularly striking feature of this match is its lock with the Sphinx Leo. The point is worth re-emphasizing. Looking east in the pre-dawn, about an hour before sunrise on the morning of the spring equinox, in the epoch of 10,500 B.C., we see the constellation of Leo lying with its belly on the horizon, directly in line with the gaze of the Sphinx. There is an unmissable sky-ground correlation here, for the constellation of Leo in profile, as seen at this moment, does very closely resemble the profile of the Leonine Sphinx. The earth turns, the stars and the sun rise, light floods the sky, and in due course, after about an hour, 
the solar disk bisects the horizon precisely due east, again exactly in line with the gaze of the Sphinx. At the precise moment it does so, the three stars of Orion's belt fall into place centred due south over the meridian. This is confirmed absolutely by modern astronomical software, and it would have been known absolutely by anyone with sophisticated knowledge of the motions of the heavens, should such a person have been present at Giza in the epoch of 10,500 BC. Indeed, one can almost feel the ponderous gears of the sky at work, like a huge clock. The hour hand is the Sphinx Leo correlation, and the minute hand is the pyramid's Orion's belt correlation, and both work together to point unmistakably to the epoch of 10,500 BC. This is the epoch that I long ago suggested was the mysterious ancient Egyptian first time, but that I now understand was significant for the world-changing cataclysm of the younger Dryas as well. Dating with Stars the use of combinations of stars in the sky and large-scale constructions on the ground to point symbolically to significant moments in history was a practice widely pursued in antiquity, as extensively documented in my 1998 book Heaven's Mirror. Indeed, examples of such sky-ground mirroring, once they are properly understood, frequently shed new light on archaeological inquiries. For example, in 2014, an ancient mound in the Republic of Macedonia was identified as man-made by archaeoacoustic analysis. The mound's dimensions are 85 meters by 45 meters. It is very precisely oriented north-south, and at its summit, placed within an oval ditch, a giant earthwork has been identified by researchers from the University of Trieste as a representation of the constellation of Cassiopeia, as it would have appeared from the site at dawn on 21 July 356 BC, the birthday of the famed Macedonian ruler Alexander the Great. Cassiopeia lies directly to the north, the researchers conclude, and stands vertically above the geoglyph in the sky's zenith, forming a perfect picture of the sky on the earth. Nor are such sky-ground endeavours confined to the ancient world. A relatively recent example is the Hoover Dam in the United States. There, at the base of the towering Monument of Dedication, with its black diorite pedestals supporting two colossal and imposing winged figures, themselves reminiscent of Mesopotamian and ancient Egyptian deities, the sculptor, Oscar Hansen, created a spectacular terrazzo floor with an inbuilt star chart. Here's how the U.S. Department of the Interior's Bureau of Reclamation describes the artwork and its purpose. The chart preserves, for future generations, the date on which President Franklin D. Roosevelt dedicated Hoover Dam, September 30th, 1935. In this celestial map, the bodies of the solar system are placed so exactly that those versed in astronomy could calculate the precession progressively earlier occurrence of the pole star for approximately the next 14,000 years. Conversely, future generations could look upon this monument and determine, if no other means were available, the exact date on which Hoover Dam was dedicated. Hansen, who explicitly compared the dam to the Great Pyramid as a monument to collective genius, exerting itself in community efforts around a common need or ideal, also incorporated the signs of the zodiac into his design. Such elements, he said, were all put there as clues and pointers, so that in remote ages to come, intelligent people would be able to discern the astronomical time of the dam's dedication. It so happens that the Hoover Dam and its monumental sculptures were completed in the same year, 1935, but it is, of course, possible to use symbolic architecture and astronomical alignments to make a permanent statement about significant moments in the past at any time. A parallel might be the great Gothic cathedrals of Europe, built in the 12th and 13th centuries of our era, but referring in every symbolic detail, and in the sacred astronomy built into their stones and stained glass, to much earlier periods, notably to the time of Christ and the time of the Old Testament patriarchs. From a purely astronomical point of view, what can be said about the huge effort and endeavour of the Giza monuments is that the ground plan of the pyramids and the Sphinx 
does speak clearly of the epoch of 10,500 BC. But as readers of my previous books will be aware, the monuments also include features such as the four narrow shafts angled up through the body of the Great Pyramid that target significant stars in the epoch of 2500 BC, when Egyptologists believe the pyramids were built. In other words, both epochs are symbolized, 2500 BC by the shafts and 10500 BC by the ground plan. Long-lived cult of the sages. The hypothesis I derive from this is that Giza was one of several sites around the world. Gobekli Tepe was another, where survivors of a great prehistoric civilization that had been all but destroyed in the global cataclysm at the onset of the Younger Dryas chose to settle, and where their sages set in motion a long-term plan to bring about the resurrection of the former world of the gods, the recreation of the destroyed world. Perhaps they felt that their own civilization had made some terrible error, some ghastly mistake, that had brought down the punishment of the universe upon them in the form of the younger Dryas comet, and that it would therefore be impious or unwise to seek to refashion the destroyed world all at once and straight away. Indeed, perhaps it proved impossible for them to do so, though its climate would have been attractive at a time when much of the world was in the midst of a sudden deep freeze. The Nile Valley, like so many other places, did suffer cataclysmic events both at the beginning and at the end of the Younger Dryas. These events included episodes of extreme river floods, the so-called Wild Nile, that recurred several times in the epoch of 10,500 BC, with calmer and more predictable conditions not being restored until about 9,000 BC. Located on higher ground, well above the valley floor, there's no evidence to suggest that Giza itself was ever scoured by those floods, and it would therefore have been an obvious choice in Egypt for the survivors to have established a base and begun work on an architectural project, perhaps focused around certain natural features of the plateau itself. Amongst these, I would draw particular attention to the rocky hill, more than 30 feet high, an excellent contender for the great primeval mound described in the Edfu texts, as we shall see, that would much later be incorporated into the core of the Great Pyramid. I suggest that a shaft was cut down into this hill, and deep into the bedrock beneath it, to create the rectangular cavity that is now nominated as the subterranean chamber, which can still only be accessed today through that same 300-foot-long shaft, now known as the Descending Corridor, that dives deeply into the bowels of the earth at an angle of 26 degrees. In my view, it is probably only one of several underground features that were created at that time, with others, far more extensive, still awaiting discovery. Likewise, these visitors to primeval Giza of the epoch of 10,500 BC would also have found a crest or ridge of rock. The technical term for such a feature is a yardang, protruding down slope that had perhaps already been sculpted by the prevailing winds into something resembling the head of a lion. It faced east and overlooked the Nile Valley, and it would in due course be extensively excavated and carved to form the Great Sphinx. It is likely that some substantial work was done in the epoch of 10,500 BC to free at least the front quarters of the core body of the Sphinx from its surrounding bedrock. But my view, unchanged since I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, is that the majority of the work on this project, as on the pyramids themselves, was done later and finally completed in the epoch of 2,500 BC when the original Leonine head of the Sphinx, perhaps heavily eroded, was recarved into the disproportionately small human head that it still has today. My hypothesis then and now is that the same sacred cult, housed in something perhaps like a monastery, with a very small, even negligible archaeological footprint, let us call it the Monastery of the Seven Sages, was involved in both major phases of the work, and in everything that happened at Giza in between. As I wrote in 1995, this hypothesis resolves the anomaly of the missing 8,000 years between the two epochs by supposing the star shafts, 
of the Great Pyramid to be merely the later work of the same long-lived cult that originally laid out the Giza ground plan in 10,450 BC. Naturally, the hypothesis also suggests that it was this same cult, towards the end of those 8,000 missing years, that provided the initiating spark for the sudden and fully formed emergence of the literate and accomplished historical civilization of dynastic Egypt. Dating with Light Since the publication of Fingerprints of the Gods, I've had many years to reflect on the mysteries of Giza. It remains my view that the role of the historical pharaohs of the fourth dynasty was to complete and finally fulfill a much more ancient plan, first brought to Egypt in the epoch of 10,500 BC. As noted above, however, the subterranean elements of the Giza Plateau and the earliest work on the Sphinx may actually date back to the epoch of 10,500 BC. By virtue of the distinctive weathering patterns on that monument's flanks and on sections of the trench that surrounds it, highlighted in the analysis of geology professor Robert Schock of Boston University, a proto-sphinx does appear to have existed when heavy rains fell across Egypt at the end of the Ice Age, perhaps even as early as the Wild Nile period. I have long been convinced by the geological evidence that the sphinx does in fact date back in some form to the epoch of 10,500 BC. But there's a grey area to do with events between 10,500 BC and 2,500 BC, and this concerns the megalithic temples of the plateau, particularly the Sphinx Temple, directly in front, in other words, to the east of the Sphinx itself, and the Vali Temple, which lies immediately southeast of the Sphinx, both of which are built for the most part of limestone blocks, excavated from around the core body of the Sphinx, although in many cases the limestone blocks are surfaced with a veneer of granite. The orthodox archaeological dating of these structures, both of their limestone and of their granite elements, is to the Old Kingdom, specifically to the Fourth Dynasty, approximately 2613 BC to 2494 BC, in other words, to the epoch of 2500 BC. When I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, however, I was open to the possibility that they might date back to the epoch of 10,500 BC. I remain so, but in the light of recent evidence, some careful consideration is required. This is the case because an advanced scientific technique known as surface luminescence dating, which measures light energy stored in stone, has been applied to these temples. This technique seems on the face of things to rule out rather conclusively any possibility that the temples were created in the form we see them now in the epoch of 10,500 BC. I say, on the face of things, because there are certain problems with the new technique, which mean that any conclusions drawn from it must be carefully thought through. Most significantly, as the researchers themselves admit, surface luminescence dating relies upon the assumption that the sample being tested has not been exposed to sunlight since it was set into place in the building of which it is a part. Should there have been exposure to sunlight, even if just minutes in duration, as would happen, for example, if any later reworking of the sampled area had been undertaken without cover of a roof, then the latent luminescence is released, setting the signal to zero or near zero, and thus yielding a date that reflects the most recent reworking rather than the original date at which the building was constructed. The Giza surface luminescence dating study was conducted by nuclear physicist Professor Ioannis Liritsis and his colleague Asiminia Vafiadu, both of the Laboratory of Archaeometry at the University of the Aegean. They reported their results in detail in 2015 in the Journal of Cultural Heritage. Conclusive indications that at least some of the structures they sampled had indeed been reworked, with their latent luminescence zeroed and the clock set ticking again at the time of the reworking, are provided by sample number 4, Vali Temple Limestone, and sample number 6, Sphinx Temple Granite. The former yielded a very young surface luminescence date of 1050 BC, plus or minus 540 years, while the latter yielded a surface luminescence date of 1190 BC, plus or minus 340 years. These are, effectively, 
dates from ancient Egypt's New Kingdom, 18th dynasty and later, and we have firm archaeological and epigraphic evidence that both the Sphinx Temple and the Vali Temple were already very ancient by New Kingdom times. Since this is so, the other dates yielded by the study must also be regarded with caution, and certainly cannot be taken as firm evidence of the date of construction of the temples, particularly in the case of sample number 3, Vali Temple Granite, and samples number 7 and 8, both Sphinx Temple Granite. These yielded surface luminescence dates, respectively of 3060 BC, plus or minus 470 years, 2740 BC, plus or minus 640 years, and 3100 BC, plus or minus 540 years. These dates are broadly compatible with the Old Kingdom, although with some reservations which we'll explore below but they do not, under any circumstance, rule out a much more ancient date of construction for the limestone core masonry of the temples, since it has always been Robert Schock's contention that the granite sheathing was added in the Old Kingdom to repair and restore the earlier, much earlier, Sphinx Age limestone temples. We are left, then, with only a single sample, sample number five, which was taken from the original limestone core masonry of the Sphinx Temple, it yielded a surface luminescence date of 2,220 plus or minus 220 years, but really nothing very conclusive can be said about it or deduced from it, since its location does not rule out the possibility, as Shock observed when I asked him to comment on these findings, that it may also have been exposed or reworked during repairs to the structure during the Old Kingdom. In summary... The new study does not provide any evidence to confirm beyond doubt that the original limestone megalithic elements of the Sphinx and Vali temples were built by the 4th dynasty pharaoh Khafre, as archaeologists maintain. On the contrary, the only thing the study seems to demonstrate for sure is that these temples were reworked during the New Kingdom. More alarming for the mainstream chronology, the surface luminescence dating raises the possibility that the granite sheathing on the temples, with the exception of sample number 6 with its New Kingdom date, was not added in the 4th dynasty at all, but many centuries earlier, indeed as early as 3380 BC at the extreme end of the dating range for sample number 7, as early as 3530 BC for sample number 3, and as early as 3640 BC for sample number 8. This potentially pushes what Robert Schock has always regarded as restoration work on the Sphinx Temple, the adding of a granite veneer on top of much older and extensively eroded megalithic limestone blocks, far back into the pre-dynastic period, in other words, long before any large-scale construction is supposed to have been undertaken in Egypt. And needless to say, if these temples were in need of such radical restoration in the pre-dynastic period, then their core masonry is likely to be very ancient indeed, perhaps even going back as far as the epoch of 10,500 BC. So much, then, for the Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple. But what of the enigmatic pyramids that loom over them?